book ten of the autobiography of goethe volume two from my life poetry and truth translated by john oxenford section one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of goethe volume two by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by john oxenford eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven book ten part one the german poets since they as members of a corporation no longer stood as one man did not enjoy the smallest advantages in the citizen world they had neither support standing nor respectability except in so far as their other position was favorable to them and therefore it was a matter of mere chance whether talent was born to honor or to disgrace a poor son of earth with the consciousness of mind and faculties was forced to crawl along painfully through life and from the pressure of momentary necessities to squander the gifts which perchance he had received from the muses occasional poems the first and most genuine of all kinds of poetry had become despicable to such a degree that the nation even now cannot attain a conception of their high value and a poet if he did not strike altogether into gunther's path appeared in the world in the most melancholy state of subserviency as a jester and parasite so that both on the theatre and in the stage of life he represented a character which any one and every one could abuse at pleasure if on the contrary the muse associated herself with men of respectability these received thereby a lustre which was reflected back to the donor noblemen well versed in life like hagedorn dignified citizens like brooks distinguished men of science like holler appeared among the first in the nation to be equal with the most eminent and the most prized those persons too were specially honored who together with this pleasing talent distinguished themselves as active faithful men of business in this way ouz rabner and weiss enjoyed a respect of quite a peculiar kind people had here to value when combined those most heterogeneous qualities which are seldom found united but now the time was to come when poetic genius should become aware of itself should create for itself its own relations and understand how to lay the foundation of an independent dignity everything necessary to found such an epoch was combined in klopstock considered both from the sensual and moral side he was a pure young man seriously and thoroughly educated he places from his youth upwards a great value upon himself and upon whatever he does and while considerately measuring out beforehand the steps of his life turns with a presentiment of the whole strength of his internal nature towards the loftiest and most grateful theme the messiah a name which betokens infinite attributes was to be glorified afresh by him the redeemer was to be the hero whom the poet thought to accompany through earthly lowliness and sorrows to the highest heavenly triumphs everything godlike angelic and human that lay in the young soul was here called into requisition brought up by the bible and nourished by its strength he now lives with patriarchs prophets and forerunners as if they were present yet all these were only evoked from ages to draw a brilliant halo round the one whose humiliation they behold with astonishment and in whose exaltation they are gloriously to bear a part for at last after gloomy and horrible hours the everlasting judge will uncloud his face again acknowledge his son and fellow god who on the other hand will again lead to him alienated men nay even a fallen spirit the living heavens shout with a thousand angel voices round the throne 
and a radiance of love gushes out over the universe which shortly before had fastened its looks upon a fearful place of sacrifice the heavenly peace which klopstock felt in the conception and execution of this poem communicates itself even now to every one who reads the first ten cantos without allowing certain requisitions to be brought forward which an advancing cultivation does not willingly abandon the dignity of the subject elevated in the poet the feeling of his own personality that he himself would enter hereafter into those choirs that the god-man would distinguish him nay give him face to face the reward for his labors which even here every feeling pious heart had fondly paid in many a pure tear these were such innocent childlike thoughts and hopes as only a well-constituted mind can conceive and cherish thus klopstock gained the perfect right to regard himself as a consecrated person and thus in his actions he studied the most scrupulous purity even in his old age it troubled him exceedingly that he had given his earliest love to a lady who by marrying another left him in uncertainty whether she had really loved him or been worthy of him the sentiments which bound him to meta their hearty tranquil affection their short sacred married life the aversion of the surviving husband from a second union all is of that kind which may well be remembered hereafter in the circle of the blessed this honourable conduct toward himself was still further enhanced by his being favourably received for a long time in well-minded denmark in the house of a great and humanly speaking excellent statesman here in a higher circle which was exclusive indeed but at the same time devoted to external manners and attention towards the world his tendency became still more decided a composed demeanour a measured speech and a laconism even when he spoke openly and decidedly gave him through his whole life a certain diplomatic ministerial consequence which seemed to be at variance with his tender natural feelings although both sprang from one source of all this his first works give a clear transcript and type and they thus could not but gain an incredible influence that however he personally assisted others who were struggling in life and poetry has scarcely been mentioned as one of his most decided characteristics but just as a furtherance of young people in literary action and pursuit a hopeful pleasure in bringing forward men not favored by fortune and making the way easy to them has rendered illustrious one german who in respect to the dignity which he gave himself may be named as the second but in regard to his living influence as the first it will escape no one that gleim is here meant in possession of an obscure indeed but lucrative office residing in a pleasantly situated spot not too large and enlivened by military civic and literary activity whence proceeded the revenues of a great and wealthy institution not without a part of them remaining behind for the advantage of the place he felt within himself also a lively productive impulse which however with all its strength was not quite enough for him and therefore he gave himself up to another perhaps stronger impulse namely that of making others produce something both these activities were intertwined incessantly during his whole long life he could as easily have lived without taking breath as without writing poetry and making presents and by helping needy talents of all kinds through earlier or later embarrassments contributing to the honour of literature he gained so many friends debtors and dependents that they willingly allowed his diffuse verse to pass since they could give him nothing in return for his rich benefits but endurance of his poetry now the high idea which these two men might well form of their own worth and by which others were induced also to think themselves somebody has produced very great and beautiful results both in public and private 
but this consciousness honourable as it is called a peculiar evil down for themselves for those around them and for their time if judging from their intellectual effects both these men may without hesitation be called great with respect to the world they remained but small and considered in comparison with a more striving life their external position was not the day is long and so is the night one cannot always be writing poetry or doing or giving their time could not be filled up like that of people of the world and men of rank and wealth they therefore set too high a value on their particular limited situations attached an importance to their daily affairs which they should only have allowed themselves amongst each other and took more than reasonable delight in their own jokes which though they made the moment agreeable could be of no consequence in the end they received praise and honour from others as they deserved they gave it back with measure indeed but always too profusely and because they felt that their friendship was worth much they were pleased to express it repeatedly and in this spared neither paper nor ink thus arose those correspondences at the deficiency of which in solid contents the modern world wonders nor can it be blamed when it hardly sees the possibility of eminent men delighting themselves in such an interchange of nothing or when it expresses the wish that such leaves might have remained unprinted but we may suffer these few volumes always to stand along with so many others upon our bookshelves if we have learned from them the fact that even the most eminent men lives only by the day and enjoys but a sorry entertainment when he throws himself too much back upon himself and neglects to grasp into the fullness of the external world where alone he can find nourishment for his growth and at the same time a standard for its measurement the activity of these men was in its finest bloom when we young folks began also to bestir ourselves in our own circle and with my younger friends if not with older persons too i was pretty much in the way of falling into this sort of mutual flattery forbearance raising and supporting in my immediate sphere whatever i produced could always be reckoned good ladies friends and patrons will not consider bad that which is undertaken and written out of affection for them from such obligations at last arises the expression of an empty satisfaction with each other in the phrases of which the character is easily lost if it is not from time to time steeled to higher excellence and thus i had the happiness to say that by means of an unexpected acquaintance all the self-complacency love of the looking-glass vanity pride and haughtiness that might have been resting or working within me were exposed to a very severe trial which was unique in its kind by no means in accordance with the time and therefore so much the more searching and more sorely felt for the most important event one that was to have the weightiest consequences for me was my acquaintance with herder and the nearer connection with him which sprung from it he accompanied the travels of the prince of holstein uten who was in a melancholy state of mind and had come with him to strasburg our society as soon as it knew of his arrival was seized with a great longing to approach him and this good fortune happened to me first quite unexpectedly and by chance i had gone to the ghost tavern to inquire after some distinguished stranger or other just at the bottom of the staircase i found a man who was on the point of ascending and whom i might have taken for a clergyman his powdered hair was put up in a key his black clothes likewise distinguished him but still more a long black silk mantle the skirts of which he had gathered up and stuck into his pocket this somewhat striking but yet on the whole polite and pleasing figure of which i had already been told left me not the least doubt that he was the celebrated newcomer and my address was to convince him at once that i knew him he asked my name 
which could be of no consequence to him but my frankness seemed to please him since he returned it with great friendliness and as we mounted the stairs showed himself immediately for animated communication i have forgotten whom we visited then it is sufficient to say that at parting i begged permission to wait on him at his own residence which he granted me kindly enough i did not neglect to avail myself repeatedly of this favor and was more and more attracted by him he had somewhat of softness in his manner which was very suitable and becoming without being exactly easy a round face an imposing forehead a somewhat puggish nose a mouth somewhat prominent but highly characteristic pleasing and amiable a pair of coal-black eyes under black eyebrows which did not fail of their effect although one of them used to be red and inflamed by various questions he tried to make himself acquainted with me and my situation and his power of attraction operated on me with growing strength i was generally speaking of a very confiding disposition and with him especially i had no secrets it was not long however before the repelling pulse of his nature began to appear and placed me in no small uneasiness i related to him many things of my youthful occupations and taste and among others of a collection of seals which i had principally gotten together through the assistance of our family friend who had an extensive correspondence i had arranged them according to the state calendar and in this means had become well acquainted with the whole of the potentates the greater and lesser mightinesses and powers even down to the nobility under them these heraldic insignia had often and in particular at the ceremonies of the coronation been of use to my memory i spoke of these things with some complacency but he was of another opinion and not only stripped the subject of all interest but also contrived to make it ridiculous and nearly disgusting from this his spirit of contradiction i had much to endure for he had resolved partly because he wished to separate from the prince partly on account of a complaint in his eye to remain in strasburg this complaint is one of the most inconvenient and unpleasant and the more troublesome since it can be cured only by a painful highly irritating and uncertain operation the tear bag is closed below so that the moisture contained in it cannot flow off to the nose and so much the less as the adjacent bone is deficient in the aperture by which this secretion should naturally take place the bottom of the tear bag must therefore be cut open and the bone bored through when a horsehair is drawn through the lacrimal point then down through the opened bag and the new canal is thus put into connection with it and this hair is moved backwards and forwards every day in order to restore the communication between the two parts all which cannot be done or attained if an incision is not first made externally in that place herder was now separated from the prince was moved into lodgings of his own and resolved to have himself operated upon by lobstein here those exercises by which i had sought to blunt my sensibility did me good service i was able to be present at the operation and to be serviceable and helpful in many ways to so worthy a man i found here every reason to admire his great firmness and endurance for neither during the numerous surgical operations nor at the oft-repeated painful dressings did he show himself in any degree irritable and of all of us he seemed to be the one who suffered least but in the intervals indeed we had to endure the changes of his temper in many ways i say we for besides myself a pleasant russian named peglo was mostly with him this man had been an early acquaintance of herders in riga and though no longer a youth was trying to perfect himself in surgery under lobstein's guidance herder could be charmingly prepossessing and brilliant but he could just as easily turn an ill-humoured side foremost all men indeed have this attraction and repulsion according to their nature some more some less some in longer some in shorter pulsations 
few can really control their peculiarities in this respect many in appearance as for herder the preponderance of his contradictory bitter biting humour was certainly derived from his disease and the sufferings arising from it this case often occurs in life one does not sufficiently take into consideration the moral effect of sickly conditions and one therefore judges many characters very unjustly because it is assumed that all men are healthy and required of them that they should conduct themselves accordingly during the whole time of this cure i visited herder morning and evening i even remained whole days with him and in a short time accustomed myself so much the more to his chiding and fault-finding as i daily learned to appreciate his beautiful and great qualities his extensive knowledge and his profound views the influence of this good-natured blusterer was great and important he was five years older than myself which in younger days makes a great difference to begin with and as i acknowledged him for what he was and tried to value that which he had already produced he necessarily gained a great superiority over me but the situation was not comfortable for older persons with whom i had associated hitherto had sought to form me with indulgence perhaps had even spoiled me by their lenity but from herder behave as one might one could never expect approval as now on the one side my great affection and reverence for him and on the other the discontent which he excited in me were continually at strife with each other there arose within me an inward struggle the first of its kind which i had experienced in my life since his conversations were at all times important whether he asked answered or communicated his opinions in any other manner he could not but advance me daily nay hourly to new views at leipzig i had accustomed myself to a narrow and circumscribed existence and my general knowledge of german literature could not be extended by my situation in frankfurt nay those mystico religio chemical occupations had led me into obscure regions and what had been passing for some years back in the wide literary world had for the most part remained unknown to me now i was at once made acquainted by herder with all the new aspiration and all the tendencies which it seemed to be taking he had already made himself sufficiently known and by his fragments his critische walder critical woods and other works had immediately placed himself by the side of the most eminent men who had for a long time drawn towards them the eyes of their country what an agitation there must have been in such a mind what a fermentation there must have been in such a nature can neither be conceived nor described but great was certainly the concealed effort as will be easily admitted when one reflects for how many years afterwards and how much he has done and produced we had not lived together long in this manner when he confided to me that he meant to be a competitor for the prize which was offered at berlin for the best treatise on the origin of language his work was already nearly completed and as he wrote a very neat hand he could soon communicate to me in parts a legible manuscript i had never reflected on such subjects for i was yet too deeply involved in the midst of things to have thought about their beginning and end the question too seemed to me in some measure an idle one for if god had created man as man language was just as innate in him as walking erect he must have just as well perceived that he could sing with his throat and modify the tones in various ways with tongue palate and lips as he must have remarked that he could walk and take hold of things if man was of divine origin so was also language itself and if man considered in the circle of nature was a natural being language was likewise natural these two things like soul and body i could never separate Silberschlag, with a realism crude yet somewhat fantastically devised, had declared himself for the divine origin, that is, that God had played the schoolmaster to the first men. Herder's treatise went to show that man, as man, could and must 
have attained to language by his own powers i read the treatise with much pleasure and it was of special aid in strengthening my mind only i did not stand high enough either in knowledge or thought to form a solid judgment upon it i therefore gave the author my applause adding only a few remarks which flowed from my way of viewing the subject but one was received just like the other there was scolding and blaming whether one agreed with him conditionally or unconditionally the fat surgeon had less patience than i he humorously declined the communication of this prize essay and affirmed that he was not prepared to meditate on such abstract topics he urged us in preference to a game of ombre which we commonly play together in the evening during so troublesome and painful a cure herder lost nothing of his vivacity but it became less and less amiable he could not write a note to ask for anything that would not be spiced with some scoff or other once for instance he wrote to me thus if those letters of brutus thou hast in thy cicero's letters thou whom consolers of schools decked out in magnificent bindings sooth from their well-planned shelves yet more by the outside than inside thou who from gods art descended or goths or from origin filthy gothy send them to me footnote the german word is koth and the whole object of the line is to introduce a play on the word goth goter gothen and koth translator end of footnote it was not polite indeed that he should allow himself this jest on my name for a man's name is not like a mantle which merely hangs about him and which perchance may be safely twitched and pulled but is a perfectly fitting garment which has grown over and over him like his very skin at which one cannot rake and scrape without wounding the man himself the first reproach on the contrary was better founded I had brought with me to Strasbourg the authors I had obtained by exchange from Langer, with various fine additions from my father's collection besides, and had set them up on a neat bookcase, with the best intentions of using them. But how should my time, which I split up into a hundred different activities, suffice for that? Herder, who was most attentive to books, since he had need of them every moment, perceived my fine collection at his first visit but soon saw too that i made no use of them he therefore as the greatest enemy of all false appearances and ostentation was accustomed on occasion to rally me upon the subject another sarcastic poem occurs to me which he had sent me one evening when i had been telling him a great deal about the dresden gallery i had indeed not penetrated into the higher meaning of the italian school but Domenico Fette, an excellent artist, although a humorist, and therefore not of the first rank, had interested me much. Scripture subjects had to be painted. He confined himself to the New Testament parables, and was fond of representing them with much originality, taste, and good humor. He brought them all together into everyday life, and the spirited and naive details of his compositions, recommended by a free pencil, had made a vivid impression upon me at this my childish enthusiasm for art heard her sneered in the following fashion from sympathy the master i like best of all dominico fetti they call a parable from scripture he is able neatly to turn into a crazy fable from sympathy thou crazy parable i could mention many jokes of the kind more or less clear or abstruse cheerful or bitter they did not vex me but made me feel uncomfortable yet since i knew how to value highly everything that contributed to my own cultivation and as i had often given up former opinions and inclinations i soon accustomed myself and only sought as far as it was possible for me from my point of view to distinguish just blame from unjust invectives and thus no day passed over that had not been in the most fruitful manner instructive to me 
i was made acquainted by him with poetry from quite a different side in another light than heretofore and one too which suited me well the poetic art of the hebrews which he treated ingeniously after his predecessor loth popular poetry the tradition of which in alsace he urged us to search after and the oldest records existing as poetry all bore witness that poetry in general was a gift to the world and to nations and not the private inheritance of a few refined cultivated men i swallowed all this and the more eager i was in receiving the more liberal he was in giving so that we spent the most interesting hours together the other natural studies which i had begun i endeavoured to continue and as one always has time enough if one will apply it well so amongst them all i succeeded in doing twice or thrice as much as usual as to the fullness of those few weeks during which we lived together i can well say that all which herder has gradually produced since was then announced in the germ and i thereby fell into the fortunate condition that i could completely attach to something higher and expand all that i had hitherto thought learned and made my own had herder been methodical i should have found the most precious guide for giving a durable tendency to my cultivation but he was more inclined to examine and stimulate than to lead and conduct thus he at first made me acquainted with Hamann's writings upon which he set a very great value but instead of instructing me as to these and making the bias and drift of his extraordinary mind intelligible to me it generally only served him for amusement when i behaved strangely enough in trying to get the meaning of such sibylline leaves however i could well feel that something in Hamann's writings appealed to me and to this i gave myself up without knowing whence it came or whither it was leading me after the cure had lasted longer than was reasonable lobstein had begun to hesitate and to repeat himself in his treatment so that the affair could not come to an end and peglo too had confided to me in private that a favourable issue was hardly to be expected the whole position became gloomy herder became impatient and out of temper he could not succeed in continuing his activity as heretofore and was obliged to restrain himself the more as they began to lay the blame of the surgical failure upon his too great mental exertion and his uninterrupted animated nay merry intercourse with us it is sufficient to say that after so much trouble and suffering the artificial tear channel would not form itself and the communication intended would not take place it was necessary to let the wound heal over in order that the disease should not become worse if now during the operation one could not admire herder's firmness under such pains his melancholy and even fierce resignation to the idea that he must bear such a blot about him all his life had about it something truly sublime by which he gained for ever the reverence of those who saw and loved him this disease which disfigured so expressive a countenance must have been so much the more afflicting to him as he had become acquainted with an excellent lady in darmstadt and had gained her affections it may have been for this cause principally that he submitted to the cure in order on his return to appear more free more cheerful and more handsome in the eyes of his half betrothed and to unite himself more certainly and indissolubly with her however he hastened away from strasburg as soon as possible and since his stay had hitherto been as expensive as it was unpleasant i borrowed a sum of money for him which he promised to refund by an appointed day the time passed without the arrival of the money my creditor indeed did not dun me but i was for several weeks in embarrassment at last the letter and the money came and even here he did not act unlike himself for instead of thanks or an apology his letter contained nothing but satirical things in doggerel verse which would have puzzled if not alienated another but it did not move me at all 
for i had conceived so great and powerful an idea of his worth that it absorbed everything of an opposite nature which could have injured it one should never speak publicly at least of one's own faults or those of others if one does not hope to effect some useful purpose by it on this account i will here insert certain remarks which forced themselves upon me gratitude and ingratitude belong to those events which appear every moment in the moral world and about which men can never agree among themselves i usually distinguish between non-thankfulness ingratitude and aversion from gratitude the first is innate with men nay created with them for it arises from a happy volatile forgetfulness of the repulsive as well as of the delightful by which alone the continuation of life is possible man needs such an infinite quantity of previous and concurrent assistances for a tolerable existence that if he could always pay to the sun and the earth to god and nature to ancestors and parents to friends and companions the thanks due to them he would have neither time nor feeling left to receive and enjoy new benefits but if the natural man suffers this volatility to get the control in and over him a cold indifference gains more and more the ascendancy and one at last regards one's benefactor as a stranger to whose injury perhaps anything may be undertaken provided it be advantageous to ourselves this alone can properly be called ingratitude which results from the rudeness into which the uncultivated nature must necessarily lose itself at last aversion from gratitude however the rewarding of a benefit by ill-natured and sullen conduct is very rare and occurs only in eminent men such as with great natural gifts and a presentiment of them being born in a lower rank of society or in a helpless condition must from their youth upwards force themselves along step by step and receive at every point aids and support which are often embittered and repulsive to them through the coarseness of their benefactors since that which they receive is earthly while that which on the other hand they give is of a higher kind so that what is strictly speaking a compensation is out of the question lessing with the fine knowledge of earthly things which fell to his share in the best years of his life has in one place bluntly but cheerfully expressed himself herder on the contrary constantly embittered his finest days both for himself and others because he knew not how to moderate by strength of mind in later years that ill humour which had necessarily seized him in youth one may well make this demand of oneself for to a man's capability of cultivation comes with friendly aid the light of nature which is always active in enlightening him about his condition and generally in many moral points of culture one should not construe the failings too severely nor look about after the most serious and remote means of correcting them for certain faults may be easily and even playfully removed thus for instance by mere habit we can excite gratitude in ourselves keep it alive and even make it necessary to us in a biographical attempt it is proper to speak of oneself i am by nature as little grateful as any man and on forgetting the benefit received the violent feeling of a momentary disagreement could very easily beguile me into ingratitude to obviate this i accustomed myself in the first place with everything that i possessed to call to mind with pleasure how i came by it from whom i received it whether it was by way of present exchange or purchase or in any other manner i have accustomed myself in showing my collections to mention the persons by whose means i obtained each article nay even to do justice to the occasion to the accident to the remotest cause and coincidence by which things which are dear and of value to me have become mine that which surrounds us thus receives a life 
we see in it a spiritual combination full of love reminding us of its origin and by thus making past circumstances present to us our momentary existence is elevated and enriched the originators of the gifts rise repeatedly before the imagination we connect with their image a pleasing remembrance ingratitude becomes impossible and a return on occasion becomes easy and desirable at the same time we are led to the consideration of that which is not a possession palpable to the senses and we love to recapitulate to whom our higher endowments are to be ascribed and whence they take their date before i turn my attention from that connection with herder which was so important and so rich in consequence for me i find yet another more to adduce nothing was more natural than that i should by degrees become more and more reserved towards herder in communicating those things which had hitherto contributed to my culture but especially such as still seriously occupied my attention at the moment he had destroyed my enjoyment of so much that i had loved before and had especially blamed me in the strongest manner for the pleasure i took in ovid's metamorphoses i might defend my favorite as i would i might say that for a youthful fancy nothing could be more delightful than to linger in those cheerful and glorious regions with gods and demigods to be a witness of their deeds and passions i might circumstantially quote that previously mentioned opinion of a sober-minded man and corroborate it by my own experience all this according to herder went for nothing there was no immediate truth properly so called to be found in these poems here was neither greece nor italy neither a primitive world nor a cultivated one everything was rather an imitation of what had already existed and a mannerized representation such as could be expected only from an over-cultivated man and if at last i would maintain that whatever an eminent individual produces is also nature and that always in all nations ancient and modern the poet alone has been the maker this was not allowed to pass and i had to endure much on this account nay i was almost disgusted with my ovid by it for there is no affection that it can hold out in the long run against the animate versions of eminent men in whom one places confidence something always cleaves to us and if one cannot love unconditionally love is already in a critical condition i most carefully concealed from him my interest in certain subjects which had rooted themselves within me and were little by little moulding themselves into poetic form these were goats von berlichingen and faust the biography of the former had seized my inmost heart the figure of a rude well-meaning self-helper in a wild anarchical time awakened my deepest sympathy the significant puppet show fable of the latter resounded and vibrated many toned within me i had also wandered about in all sorts of science and had early enough been led to see its vanity i had moreover tried all sorts of ways in real life and had always returned more unsatisfied and troubled now these things as well as many others i carried about with me and delighted myself with them during my solitary hours but without writing anything down but most of all i concealed from herder my mystical cabalistical chemistry and everything relating to it although at the same time i was still very fond of secretly busying myself in working it out more consistently than it had been communicated to me of my poetic labors i believe i laid before him die mischuldigen but i did not recollect that on this account i received either correction or encouragement on his part yet with all this he remained what he was whatever proceeded from him had an important if not a cheering effect and even his handwriting exercised a magic power over me 
i did not remember having ever torn up or thrown away any one of his letters or even a mere envelope from his hand yet with my various changes of place and time not one document of those strange foreboding and happy days is left that herder's power of attraction operated upon others as well as upon me i should scarcely mention had i not remarked that it extended itself particularly to young commonly called stilling the true honest striving of this man could not but deeply interest everybody who had any feeling and his susceptibility must have charmed into candor every one who was in a condition to impart anything even herder behaved towards him with more forbearance than towards the rest of us for his counteraction always seemed to stand in relation with the action exerted upon him young's narrowness was accompanied by so much good will his urgency with so much softness and earnestness that a man of intelligence could certainly not be severe against him and a benevolent man could not scoff at him or turn him into ridicule young was also exhilarated to such a degree by herder that he felt himself strengthened and advanced in all he did even his affection for me seemed to lose ground in the same ratio yet we always remained good companions made allowances for each other from first to last and mutually rendered the most friendly services End of section one. Section two, book ten, part two of the Autobiography of Goethe, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, volume two. From my life, poetry and truth by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Don Oxford, eighteen twelve, eighteen seventy seven, book ten, part two. Let us now, however, withdraw ourselves from the sick chamber of friendship and from the general considerations which refer rather to disorder than to health of mind. Let us betake ourselves into the open air to the lofty and broad gallery of the minster as if the time was still present when we young fellows often appointed an evening meeting to greet the departing sun with brimming goblets here all conversation was lost in the contemplation of the country here sharpness of eyesight was put to the proof and every one strove to perceive nay plainly to distinguish the most distant objects good telescopes were employed to assist us and one friend after another exactly pointed out the spot which had become the most dear and precious to him and i also did not lack such a little spot which although it did not come out with importance in the landscape nevertheless more than all the rest attracted me with an amiable magic on these occasions the imagination was excited by relating our adventures and several little jaunts were concerted nay often undertaken on the spur of the moment of which i will circumstantially relate only one instead of a number since in many respects it was of consequence to me with two worthy friends and fellow boarders engelbach and Weiland, both natives of Lower Alsace, I repaired on horseback to Sabern, where in the fine weather the friendly little place smiled pleasantly upon us. The sight of the bishop's castle awakened our admiration. The extent, height, and splendour of a new set of stables bore witness to the other comforts of the owner. The gorgeousness of the staircase surprised us the chambers and saloons we trode with reverence only the person of the cardinal a little wreck of a man whom we saw at table made a contrast the view of the garden is splendid and a canal three-quarters of a league long which leads straight up to the middle of the castle gives a high idea of the taste and resources of the former possessors 
we rambled up and down there and enjoyed many parts of this beautifully situated hole which lies on the outskirts of the magnificent plain of alsace at the foot of the vosges after we had enjoyed ourselves at this clerical outpost of a royal power and had made ourselves comfortable in its region we arrived early next morning at a public work which most nobly opens the entrance into a mighty kingdom illumined by the beams of the rising sun the famous sabern stairs a work of incredible labour rose before us a road built serpentine wise over the most fearful crags and wide enough for three wagons abreast leads uphill so gently that the ascent is scarcely perceptible the hardness and smoothness of the way the flat topped elevations on both sides for the foot passengers the stone channels to lead off the mountain water all are executed as neatly as artistically and durably so that they afford a satisfactory view thus one gradually arrives at Pfalzburg, a modern fortification it lies on a moderate hill the works are elegantly built on blackish rocks and of the same kind of stone and the joinings being pointed out with white mortar show exactly the size of the square stones and give a striking proof of neat workmanship we found the place itself as is proper for a fortress regular built of stone and the church in good taste when we wandered through the streets it was nine o'clock on a sunday morning we heard music they were already waltzing in the tavern to their heart's content and as the inhabitants did not suffer themselves to be disturbed in their pleasures by the great scarcity nay by the threatened famine so also our youthful cheerfulness was not at all troubled when the baker on the road refused us some bread and directed us to the tavern where perhaps we might procure provisions at the usual place we now very willingly rode down the tzabern stairs again to gaze at this architectural wonder a second time and to enjoy once more the refreshing prospect over alsace we soon reached buchsweiler where friend weiland had prepared for us a good reception to a fresh youthful mind the condition of a small town is well suited family connections are closer and more perceptible domestic life which with moderate activity moves hither and thither between light official duties town business agriculture and gardening invites us to a friendly participation sociableness is necessary and the stranger finds himself very pleasantly situated in the limited circles if the disputes of the inhabitants which in such places are more palpable do not everywhere come in contact with him this little town was the chief place of the county of hanau lichtenberg belonging to the landgrave of darmstadt under french sovereignty a regency and board of officers established here made the place an important centre-point of a very beautiful and desirable principality we easily forgot the unequal streets and the irregular architecture of the place when we went out to look at the old castle and the gardens which are excellently laid out on a hill numerous little pleasure woods are preserved for tame and wild pheasants and the relics of many similar arrangements showed how pleasant this little residence must formerly have been yet all these views were surpassed by the prospect which met the eye when from the neighbouring barschberg one looked over the perfectly paradisical region this height wholly heaped together out of different kinds of shells 
attracted my attention for the first time to such documents of antiquity. I had never before seen them together in so great a mass. Yet the curious eye soon turned itself exclusively to the landscape. You stand on the last landward mountain point, American note, that is, towards Germany. Germany is the land by preeminence. Towards the north lies a fruitful plain interspersed with little forests and bounded by a stern row of mountains that stretches itself westward toward Sabea, where the Episcopal Palace and the Abbey of St. John, lying a league beyond it, may be plainly recognized. Thence the eye follows the more and more vanishing chain of the Vosges towards the south. If you turn to the north-east, you see the castle of Lichtenberg upon a rock, and towards the south-east, the eye has the boundless plain of Alsace to scrutinize, which, afar off, withdraws itself from the sight in the more and more misty landscape, until at last the Swabian mountains melt away like shadows into the horizon. Already in my limited wanderings through the world I had remarked how important it is in travelling to inquire after the course of the waters, and even to ask, with respect to the smallest brook, whither in reality it runs. One thus acquires a general survey of every stream region in which one happens to be, a conception of the heights and depths which bear relation to each other, and by these leading lines, which assist the contemplation as well as the memory, extricates oneself in the surest manner from the geological and political labyrinth. With these observations, I took a solemn farewell of my beloved Alsace, as the next morning we meant to turn our steps towards Lorraine. The evening passed away in familiar conversation, in which we tried to cheer ourselves up, under a joyless present, by remembrances of a better past. Here, as in the whole of this small country, the name of the last Count Reinhard von Hanau, was blessed above all others. His great understanding and aptitude had appeared in all his actions, and many a beautiful memorial of his existence yet remained. Such men have the advantage of being double benefactors, once to the present, which they make happy, and then to the future, the feeling of which and courage they nourish and sustain. Now, as we turned ourselves northwestward into the mountains, passed by Lützelstein, an old mountain tower in very hilly country, and descended into the region of the Tsar and the Moselle, the heavens began to lower, as if they would render yet more sensible to us the condition of the more rugged western country. The valley of the Tsar, where we first found Bockenheim, a small place, and saw opposite to it Neu-Zawerden, which is well built, with a pleasure castle, is bordered on both sides by mountains which might be called melancholy, if at their foot an endless succession of meadows and fields called the Hünau did not extend as far as Saar Albe and beyond it, further than the eye can reach. Great buildings belonging to the former stables of the Duke of Lorraine here attract the eye. They are at present used as a dairy, for which purpose, indeed, they are very well situated. We passed through Zagmun to Zabruck, and this little residence was a bright point in a land so rocky and woody. The town, small and hilly, but well adorned by the last prince, makes at once a pleasing impression, as the houses are all painted a greyish-white, and the different elevation of them affords a variegated view. In the middle of a beautiful square surrounded with handsome buildings stands the Lutheran church, on a small scale, but in proportion with the whole. The front of the castle lies on the same level with the town. 
the back, on the contrary, on the declivity of a steep rock. This has not only been worked out terrace fashion to afford easy access to the valley, but an oblong garden plot has also been obtained below by turning off the stream on one side and cutting away the rock on the other, after which this whole space was first filled up with earth and planted. The time of this undertaking fell in the epoch when they used to consult the architect about laying out gardens, just as at present they call in the aid of the landscape painter's eye. The whole arrangement of the castle, the costly and the agreeable, the rich and the ornamental, betokened a life-enjoying owner such as the deceased prince had been. The present sovereign was not at home. President von Güderode received us in the most obliging manner, and entertained us for three days better than we had a right to expect. I made use of the various acquaintance which we formed to instruct myself in many respects. The life of the former prince, rich in pleasure, gave material enough for conversation as well as the various expedients which he hit upon to make use of the advantages supplied by the nature of his land. Here I was now properly initiated into the interest for mountain countries, and the love for those economical and technical investigations which have busied me a great part of my life was first awakened within me. We heard of the rich coal pits at Dutweil, of the iron and alum works, and even of a burning mountain, and we prepared ourselves to see these wonders close. We now rode through the woody mountains, which must seem wild and dreary to him who comes out of a magnificent fertile land, and which can attract us only by the internal contents of its bosom. We were made acquainted with one simple and one complicated piece of machinery within a short distance of each other, namely a scythe smithy and a wire drawing factory. If one is pleased at the first because it supplies the place of common hands, one cannot sufficiently admire the other for it works in a higher organic sense from which understanding and consciousness are scarcely to be separated. In the alum works we made accurate inquiries after the production and purifying of this so necessary material, and when we saw great heaps of a white, greasy, loose, earthy matter and asked the use of it, the labourers answered, smiling, that it was the scum thrown up in boiling the alum and that Herr Stauff had it collected, as he hoped, perchance, to turn it to some profit. "'Is Herr Stauff alive yet?' exclaimed my companion in surprise. They answered in the affirmative, and assured us that, according to the plan of our journey, we should not pass far from his lonely dwelling. Our road now led up along the channels by which the alum water is conducted down, and the principal horizontal works, Stollen, which they call the Landgrube, and from which the famous Dutweil coals are procured. These, when they are dry, have the blue colour of darkly tarnished steel, and the most beautiful succession of rainbow tints plays over the surface with every movement. The deep abysses of the coal pits, however, attracted us so much the less, as their contents lay richly poured out around us. We now reached the open mine in which the roasted alum scales are steeped in lye, and soon after a strange occurrence surprised us, although we had been prepared, we entered into a chasm and found ourselves in the region of the burning mountain. A strong smell of sulphur surrounded us. One side of the cavity was almost red-hot, covered with reddish stone burnt white. Thick fumes arose from the crevices, 
and we felt the heat of the ground through our strong boot soles an event so accidental for it is not known how this place became ignited affords a great advantage for the manufacture of alum since the alum scales of which the surface of the mountain consists lie there perfectly roasted and may be steeped in a short time and very well the whole chasm had arisen by the calcined scales being gradually removed and used up we clambered up out of this depth and were on the top of the mountain a pleasant beech grove encircled the spot which followed up to the chasm and extended itself on both sides of it many trees stood already dried up some were withering near others which as yet quite fresh felt no forebodings of that fierce heat which was approaching and threatening their roots also upon this space different openings were steaming others had already done smoking and this fire had thus smouldered for ten years already through old broken up pits and horizontal shafts with which the mountain is undermined it may too have penetrated to the clefts through new coal beds for some hundred paces further into the wood they had contemplated following up manifest indications of an abundance of coal but they had not excavated far before a strong smoke burst out against the labourers and dispersed them the opening was filled up again yet we found the place still smoking as we went on our way past it to the residence of our hermit-like chemist this lies amid mountains and woods the valleys there take very various and pleasing windings the soil round about is black and of the coal kind and strata of it frequently come in sight a coal philosopher philosophus per ignem as they said formerly could scarcely have settled himself more suitably we came before a small house not inconvenient for a dwelling and found herr staff who immediately recognized my friend and received him with lamentations about the new government indeed we could see from what he said that the alum works as well as many other well-meant establishments on account of external and perhaps internal circumstances also did not pay their expenses with much else of the sort he belonged to the chemists of that time who with a hearty feeling for all that could be done with the products of nature took delight in abstruse investigations of trifles and secondary matters and with their insufficient knowledge were not dexterous enough to do that from which properly economical and mercantile profit is to be derived thus the use which he promised himself from that scum lay very far in the distance thus he had nothing to show but a cake of salamoniac with which the burning mountain had supplied him ready and glad to communicate his complaints to a human ear the lean decrepit little man with a shoe on one foot and a slipper on the other and with stockings hanging down and repeatedly pulled up in vain dragged himself up the mountain to where the resin house stands which he himself had erected and now with great grief sees falling to ruins here was found a connected row of furnaces where coal was to be cleansed of sulphur and made fit for use in ironworks but at the same time they wished also to turn the oil and resin to account nay they would not even lose the soot and thus all failed together on account of the many ends in view during the lifetime of the former prince the business had been carried on in the spirit of an amateur and in hope now they asked for the immediate use which was not to be shown after we left our adept to his solitude we hastened for it was now late 
to the glass-house in Friedrich Thal, where we became acquainted on our way with one of the most important and most wonderful operations of human ingenuity. Nevertheless, some pleasant adventures and a surprising firework at nightfall, not far from Neukirch, interested us young fellows almost more than these important experiences. For, as a few nights before on the banks of the Tsar, shining clouds of glow-worms hovered around us betwixt rock and thicket, so now the spark-spitting forges played their sprightly firework towards us. We passed in the depth of night the smelting houses situated in the bottom of the valley, and were delighted with the strange half gloom of these dens of plank, which are but dimly lighted by a little opening in the glowing furnace. The noise of the water and of the bellows driven by it, the fearful whizzing and shrieking of the blast of air which, raging into the smelted ore, stuns the ears and confuses the senses, drove us away at last to turn into Neukirch, which is built up against the mountain. But notwithstanding all the variety and fatigue of the day, I could find no rest here. I left my friend to a happy sleep and sought the hunting seat, which lay still further up. It looks out far over mountain and wood, the outlines of which were only to be recognised against the clear night sky, but the sides and depths of which were impenetrable to my sight. This well-preserved building stood as empty as it was lonely. No castellan, no huntsman was to be found. I sat before the great glass doors upon the steps which run round the whole terrace. Here, surrounded by mountains, over a forest-grown, dark soil, which seemed yet darker in contrast with the clear horizon of a summer night, with the glowing starry vault above me, I sat for a long time by myself on the deserted spot, and thought I had never felt such a solitude. How sweetly, then, was I surprised by the distant sound of a couple of French horns, which at once like the fragrance of balsam, enlivened the peaceful atmosphere. Then there awakened within me the image of a lovely being, which had retired into the background before the motley objects of these travelling days, but which now unveiled itself more and more, and drove me from the spot back to my quarters, where I made preparations to set off with the earliest. The return was not used like the journey out. Thus we hurried through Zweibrücken, de Pont, which, as a beautiful and notable residence, might well have deserved our attention. We cast a glance upon the great simple castle on the extensive esplanades, regularly planted with linden trees, and very well adapted for the training of racehorses and on the large stables and the citizens' houses, which the prince had built to be raffled for. All this, as well as the costume and manners of the inhabitants, especially of the matrons and maids, had reference to a distant connection, and made plainly visible the relation with Paris, from which for a long time nothing trans Renane had been able to withdraw itself, we visited also the ducal wine cellars situated before the city, which are extensive and furnished with large, well-made tuns. We went on further, and at last found the country like that in the neighbourhood of Zabrut. Between wild and savage mountains are a few villages. One here gets rid of the habit of looking about for corn. We mounted up by the side of the Hornbach to Bitch, which lies on the important spot where the waters divide and fall, a part into the Tsar, a part into the Rhine. These last were soon to attract us towards them, 
yet we could not refuse our attention to the little city of beach which very picturesquely winds around the mountain nor to the fortress which lies above this is partly built on rocks and partly hewn out of them the subterraneous chambers are particularly worthy of remark here is not only space sufficient for the abode of a number of men and cattle but one even lights upon large vaults for the drilling of troops a mill a chapel and whatever else could be required underground provided the surface were in a state of disturbance we now followed the down rushing brooks through berenthal the thick forests on both the heights remain unused by the hand of man here trunks of trees lie rotting on each other by thousands and young scions sprout up without number from their half-moulded progenitors here in conversation with some companions on foot the name von dieterich again struck our ears which we had often heard honourably mentioned already in these woody regions the activity and cleverness of this man his wealth and the use and applications of it all seemed in proportion he could with justice take delight in the acquisitions which he increased and enjoy the profits he secured the more i saw of the world the more pleasure i took not only in the universally famous names but in those also especially which were mentioned in particular regions with reverence and love and thus i easily learned here by a few questions that von dieterich earlier than others had known how to make successful use of the mountain treasures iron coal and wood and had worked his way to an ever-growing opulence niederbrunn where we now arrived was a new proof of this he had purchased this little place from the count of leinigen and other part owners to erect important ironworks in the place here in these baths already founded by the romans floated around me the spirit of antiquity venerable relics of which in fragments of bas-reliefs and inscriptions capitals and shafts shone out strangely towards me from farmhouses amid household lumber and furniture as we were ascending the adjacent Vasenburg, also i paid my respects to a well-preserved inscription which discharged a thankful vow to mercury and is situated upon the great mass of rock which forms the base of the hill on one side the fortress itself lies on the last mountain looking from beach towards germany it is the ruin of a german castle built upon roman remains from the tower the whole of alsace was once more surveyed and the conspicuous minster spire pointed out the situation of strasbourg first of all however the great forest of hagenau extended itself and the towers of this town peered plainly from behind i was attracted thither we rode through reichshof where von dietrich built an imposing castle and after we had contemplated from the hills near niedermoder the pleasing course of the little river moder by the forest of hagenau i left my friend on her ridiculous coal-mine visitation which at dutweil might have been a somewhat more serious business and i then rode through hagenau on the direct road already indicated by my affection to my beloved Zesenheim. For all these views into a wild mountain region, and then again into a cheerful, fruitful, joyous land, could not rivet my mind's eye, which was directed to an amiable, attractive object. This time also the hither way seemed to me more charming than its opposite, 
as it brought me again into the neighbourhood of a lady to whom I was heartily devoted, and who deserved as much respect as love. But before I lead my friends to her rural abode, let me be permitted to mention a circumstance which contributed very much to enliven and enhance my affection and the satisfaction which it afforded me. End of section two. Book ten of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume two, from My Life, Poetry and Truth, translated by John Oxenford, Section three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume two, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford. 1812 to 1877 book 10 from my life poetry and truth how far i must have been behindhand in modern literature may be gathered from the mode of life which i led at frankfurt and from the studies to which i had devoted myself nor could my residence in strasbourg have furthered me in this respect now herder came and together with his great knowledge brought many other aids and the later publications besides among these he announced to us the vicar of wakefield as an excellent work with the german translation of which he would make us acquainted by reading it aloud to us himself his method of reading was quite peculiar whoever has heard him preach will be able to form a notion of it he delivered everything this romance included in a serious and simple style perfectly removed from all dramatically imitative representation he even avoided that variety which is not only permitted but even required in an epical delivery a slight change of tone when different persons speak by which what every one says is brought into relief and the actor is distinguished from the narrator without being monotonous herder let everything go on in the same tone just as if nothing was present before him but all was merely historical as if the shadows of this poetic creation did not act livingly before him but only glided gently by yet this manner of delivery from his mouth had an infinite charm for as he felt all most deeply and knew how to estimate the variety of such a work so the whole merit of a production appeared purely and the more clearly as one was not disturbed by details sharply spoken out nor interrupted in the feeling which the whole was meant to produce a protestant country clergyman is perhaps the most beautiful subject for a modern idyll he appears like melchizedek as priest and king in one person to the most innocent situation which can be imagined on earth to that of a husbandman he is for the most part united by similarity of occupation as well as by equality in family relationships he is a father a master of a family an agriculturist and thus perfectly a member of the community on this pure beautiful earthly foundation rests his higher calling to him is it given to guide men through life to take care of their spiritual education to bless them at all the leading epochs of their existence to instruct to strengthen to console them and if consolation is not sufficient for the present to call up and guarantee the hope of a happier future imagine such a man with pure human sentiments strong enough not to deviate from them under any circumstances and by this already elevated above the multitude of whom one cannot expect purity and firmness give him the learning necessary for his office as well as a cheerful equable activity which is even passionate as it neglects no moment to do good and you will have him well endowed but at the same time add the necessary limitation so that he must not only pause in a small circle but may also perchance pass over to a smaller 
grant him good nature placability resolution and everything else praiseworthy that springs from a decided character and over all this a cheerful spirit of compliance and a smiling toleration of his own failings and those of others then you will have put together pretty well the image of our excellent wakefield the delineation of this character on his course of life through joys and sorrows the ever-increasing interest of the story by the combination of the entirely natural with the strange and the singular make this novel one of the best which has ever been written besides this it has the great advantage that it is quite moral nay in a pure sense christian represents the reward of a good will and perseverance in the right strengthens an unconditional confidence in god and attests the final triumph of good over evil and all this without a trace of cant or pedantry the author was preserved from both of these by an elevation of mind that shows itself throughout in the form of irony by which this little work must appear to us as wise as it is amiable the author dr goldsmith has without question great insight into the moral world into its strength and its infirmities but at the same time he can thankfully acknowledge that he is an englishman and reckon highly the advantages which his country and his nation afford him the family with the delineation of which he occupies himself stands upon one of the last steps of citizen comfort and yet comes in contact with the highest its narrow circle which becomes still more contracted touches upon the great world through the natural and civil course of things this little skiff floats on the agitated waves of english life and in weal or woe it has to expect injury or help from the vast fleet which sails around it i may suppose that my readers know this work and have it in memory whoever hears it named for the first time here as well as he who is induced to read it again will thank me for the former i would merely make the cursory remark that the vicar's wife is of that good busy sort who allows herself and her own to want for nothing but who is also somewhat vain of herself and her own there are two daughters olivia handsome and more devoted to the external and sophia charming and more given to the internal nor will i omit to mention an industrious son moses who is somewhat blunt and emulous of his father if herder could be accused of any fault in his reading aloud it was impatience he did not wait until the hearer had heard and comprehended a certain part of the progress so as to be able to feel and think correctly about it hurrying on he would see their effect at once and yet he was displeased even with this when it manifested itself he blamed the excess of feeling which overflowed from me more and more at every step i felt like a man like a young man everything was living true and present before me he considering only the intrinsic contents and form saw clearly indeed that i was overpowered by the subject matter and this he would not allow then peglow's reflections which were not of the most refined were still worse received but he was especially angry at our want of keenness in not seeing beforehand the contrasts of which the author often makes use and in suffering ourselves to be moved and carried away by them without remarking the oft-returning artifice he would not pardon us for not seeing at once or at least suspecting at the very beginning where Burchell is on the point of discovering himself by passing over in his narration from the third to the first person that he himself is the lord of whom he is speaking and when finally we rejoiced like children at the discovery and the transformation of the poor needy wanderer into a rich powerful lord he immediately recalled the passage which according to the author's plan we had overlooked and read us a powerful lecture on our stupidity it will be seen from this that he regarded the work merely as a production of art and required the same of us 
who were yet wandering in that state where it is very allowable to let works of art affect us like productions of nature i did not suffer myself to be at all perplexed by herder's invectives for young people have the happiness or unhappiness that when once anything has produced an effect on them this effect must be wrought out within themselves from which much good as well as much mischief arises the above work had left with me a great impression for which i could not account but properly speaking i felt myself in harmony with that ironical tone of mind which elevates itself above every object above fortune and misfortune good and evil death and life and thus attains to the possession of a truly poetical world i could not indeed become conscious of this until later it was enough that it gave me much to do at the moment but i could by no means have expected to be so soon transposed from this fictitious world into a similar real one my fellow boarder wayland who enlivened his quiet laborious life by visiting from time to time his friends and relations in the country for he was a native of alsace did me many services on my little excursions by introducing me to different localities and families sometimes in person sometimes by recommendations he had often spoken to me about a country clergyman who lived near drusenheim six leagues from strasbourg in possession of a good benefice with an intelligent wife and a pair of amiable daughters the hospitality and agreeableness of this family were always highly extolled it scarcely needed so much to draw thither a young knight who had already accustomed himself to spend all his leisure days and hours on horseback and in the open air we decided therefore upon this trip and my friend had to promise that on introducing me he would say neither good nor ill of me but would treat me with general indifference and would allow me to make my appearance clad if not meanly yet somewhat poorly and negligently he consented to this and promised himself some sport from it it is a pardonable whim in men of consequence to place their exterior advantages in concealment now and then so as to allow their own internal human nature to operate with the greater purity for this reason the incognito of princes and the adventures resulting therefrom are always highly pleasing these appear disguised divinities who can reckon at double its value all the good offices shown to them as individuals and are in such a position that they can either make light of the disagreeable or avoid it that jupiter should be well pleased in his incognito with philemon and baucis and henry the fourth with his peasants after a hunting party is quite conformable to nature and we like it well but that a young man without importance or name should take it into his head to derive some pleasure from an incognito might be construed by many as an unpardonable piece of arrogance yet since the question here is not of such views and actions so far as they are praiseworthy or blamable but so far as they can manifest themselves and actually occur we will on this occasion for the sake of our own amusement pardon the youngster his self-conceit and the more so as i must here allege that from youth upwards a love for disguising myself had been excited in me even by my stern father this time too partly by some cast-off clothes of my own partly by some borrowed garments and by the manner of combing my hair i had if not disfigured myself yet at least decked myself out so oddly that my friend could not help laughing on the way especially as i knew how to imitate perfectly the bearing and gestures of such figures when they sit on horseback and which are called latin riders the fine road the most splendid weather and the neighbourhood of the rhine put us in the best humour at drusenheim we stopped a moment he to make himself spruce and i to rehearse my part out of which i was afraid i should now and then fall the country here has the characteristics of all the open level alsace we rode on a pleasant footpath over the meadows soon reached sesenheim left our horses at the tavern and walked leisurely towards the parsonage do not be put out said wayland showing me the house from a distance because it looks like an old miserable farmhouse it is so much the younger inside 
we stepped into the courtyard. The whole pleased me well, for it had exactly that which is called picturesque, and which had so magically interested me in Dutch art. The effect which time produces on all human work was strongly perceptible. House, barn, and stable were just at that point of dilapidation where, indecisive and doubtful between preserving and rebuilding, one often neglects the one without being able to accomplish the other. As in the village, so in the courtyard, all was quiet and deserted. We found the father, a little man, wrapped up within himself, but friendly notwithstanding, quite alone, for the family were in the fields. He bade us welcome, and offered us some refreshment which we declined. My friend hurried away to look after the ladies, and I remained alone with our host. "'You are perhaps surprised,' said he, "'to find me so miserably quartered in a wealthy village, and with a lucrative benefice.' but he continued this proceeds from irresolution long since it has been promised me by the parish and even by those in higher places that the house shall be rebuilt many plans have been already drawn examined and altered none of them altogether rejected and none carried into execution this has lasted so many years that i scarcely know how to command my impatience i made him an answer such as i thought likely to cherish his hopes and to encourage him to pursue the affair more vigorously. Upon this he proceeded to describe familiarly the personages on whom such matters depended, and although he was no great delineator of character, I could nevertheless easily comprehend how the whole business must have been delayed. The confidential tone of the man was something peculiar. He talked to me as if he had known me for ten years, while there was nothing in his look from which I could have suspected that he was directing any attention to me. At last my friend came in with the mother. She seemed to look at me with quite different eyes. Her countenance was regular, and the expression of it intelligent. She must have been beautiful in her youth. Her figure was tall and spare, but not more so than became her years, and when seen from behind she had yet quite a youthful and pleasing appearance. The elder daughter then came bouncing in briskly. She inquired after Frederica, just as both the others had also done. The father assured them that he had not seen her since all three had gone out together. The daughter again went out at the door to look for her sister. The mother brought us some refreshment, and Wayland, with the old couple, continued the conversation which referred to nothing but known persons and circumstances, as indeed it is usually the case when acquaintances meet after some length of time that they make inquiries and mutually give each other information about the members of a large circle. I listened and now learned how much I had to promise myself from this circle. The elder daughter again came hastily back into the room, uneasy at not having found her sister. They were anxious about her, and blamed her for this or that bad habit. Only the father said, very composedly, Let her alone. She has already come back. At this instant she really entered the door, and then truly a most charming star arose in this rural heaven. Both daughters still wore nothing but German, as they used to call it, and this almost obsolete national costume became Frederica particularly well. A short, white, full skirt, with a fur below, not so long but that the neatest little feet were visible up to the ankle, a tight white bodice, and a black taffeta apron. Thus she stood on the boundary between country girl and city girl. Slender and light, she tripped along as if she had nothing to carry, and her neck seemed almost too delicate for the large fair braids on her elegant little head. From cheerful blue eyes she looked very plainly round and her pretty turned-up nose peered as freely into the air as if there could be no care in the world. Her straw hat hung on her arm, and thus at the first glance I had the delight of seeing her and acknowledging her at once in all her grace and loveliness. I now began to act my character with moderation, half ashamed to play a joke on such good people whom I had time enough to observe for the girls continued the previous conversation, and that with passion and some display of temper. All the neighbors and connections were again brought forward, and there seemed to my imagination such a swarm of uncles and aunts, relations, cousins, comers, goers, 
gossips and guests that i thought myself lodged in the liveliest world possible all the members of the family had spoken some words with me the mother looked at me every time she came in or went out but frederica first entered into conversation with me and as i took up and glanced through some music that was lying around she asked me if i played also when i answered in the affirmative she requested me to perform something but the father would not allow this for he maintained that it was proper to serve the guest first with some piece of music or a song she played several things with some readiness in the style which one usually hears in the country and on a harpsichord too that the schoolmaster should have tuned long since if he had only had time she was now to sing a song also a certain tender melancholy affair but she did not succeed in it she rose up and said smiling or with that touch of serene joy which ever reposed on her countenance if i sing badly i cannot lay the blame on the harpsichord or the schoolmaster but let us go out of doors then you shall hear my alsatian and swiss songs they sound much better during supper a notion which had already struck me occupied me to such a degree that i became meditative and silent although the liveliness of the elder sister and the gracefulness of the younger shook me often enough out of my contemplations my astonishment at finding myself so actually in the wakefield family was beyond all expression the father indeed could not be compared with that excellent man but where will you find his like on the other hand all the dignity which is peculiar to that husband here appeared in the wife one could not see her without at the same time reverencing and fearing her in her were remarked the fruits of a good education her demeanour was quiet easy cheerful and inviting if the elder daughter had not the celebrated beauty of olivia yet she was well made lively and rather impetuous she everywhere showed herself active and lent a helping hand to her mother in all things to put frederica in the place of primrose's sophia was not difficult for little is said of the latter it is only taken for granted that she is amiable and this girl was amiable indeed now as the same occupation and the same situation wherever they may occur produce similar if not the same effects so here too many things were talked about many things happened which had already taken place in the wakefield family but when at last a younger son long announced and impatiently expected by the father at last sprang into the room and boldly sat himself down by us taking but little notice of the guests i could scarcely help exclaiming moses are you here too the conversation at table extended my insight into this country and family circle since the discourse was about various droll incidents which had happened now here now there frederica who sat by me thence took occasion to describe to me different localities which it was worth while to visit as one little story always calls forth another i was able to mingle so much the better in the conversation and to relate similar incidents and as besides this a good country wine was by no means spared i stood in danger of slipping out of my character for which reason my more prudent friend took advantage of the beautiful moonlight and proposed a walk which was approved at once he gave his arm to the elder i to the younger and thus we went through the wide field paying more attention to the heavens above us than to the earth which lost itself in extension around us there was however nothing of moonshine in frederica's discourse by the clearness with which she spoke she turned night into day and there was nothing in it which would have indicated or excited any feeling except that her expressions related more than hitherto to me since she represented to me her own situation as well as the neighbourhood and her acquaintances just as far as i should be acquainted with them for she hoped she added i would make no exception and would visit them again as all strangers had willingly done who had once stopped with them it was very pleasant to me to listen silently to the description which she gave of the little world in which she moved and of the persons whom she particularly valued she thereby imparted to me a clear and at the same time such an amiable idea of her situation that it had a very strange effect on me 
for i felt at once a deep regret that i had not lived with her sooner and at the same time a truly painful envious feeling towards all who had hitherto had the good fortune to surround her i at once watched closely as if i had a right to do so all her descriptions of men whether they appeared under the names of neighbours cousins or gossips and my conjectures inclined now this way now that but how could i have discovered anything in my complete ignorance of all the circumstances she at last became more and more talkative and i more and more silent it was so pleasant to listen to her and as i heard only her voice while the form of her countenance as well as the rest of the world floated dimly in the twilight it seemed to me as if i could see into her heart which i could not but find very pure since it unbosomed itself to me in such unembarrassed loquacity when my companion retired with me into the guest chamber which was prepared for us he at once with self-complacency broke out into pleasant jesting and took great credit to himself for having surprised me so much with the similarity to the primrose family i chimed in with him by showing myself thankful truly cried he the story is quite complete this family may very well be compared to that and the gentleman in disguise here may assume the honour of passing for mr burchill moreover since scoundrels are not so necessary in common life as in novels i will for this time undertake the role of the nephew and behave myself better than he did however i immediately changed this conversation pleasant as it might be to me and asked him before all things on his conscience if he had not really betrayed me he answered me no and i could believe him they had rather inquired said he after the merry table companion who boarded at the same house with him in strasbourg and of whom they had been told all sorts of preposterous stuff i now went to other questions had she ever been in love was she now in love was she engaged he replied to all in the negative in truth replied i such a cheerfulness by nature is inconceivable to me had she loved and lost and again recovered herself or had she been betrothed in both these cases i could account for it thus we chatted together far into the night and i was awake again at the dawn my desire to see her once more seemed unconquerable but while i dressed myself i was horrified at the accursed wardrobe i had so wantonly selected the further i advanced in putting on my clothes the meaner i seemed in my own eyes for everything had been calculated for just this effect my hair i might perchance have set to rights but when at last i forced myself into the borrowed worn-out grey coat and the short sleeves gave me the most absurd appearance i fell the more decidedly into despair as i could see myself only piecemeal in a little looking-glass since one part always looked more ridiculous than the other during this toilet my friend awoke and with the satisfaction of a good conscience and in the feeling of pleasurable hope for the day looked out at me from the quilted silk coverlet i had for a long time already envied him his fine clothes as they hung over the chair and had he been of my size i would have carried them off before his eyes changed my dress outside and hurrying into the garden left my cursed husk for him he would have had good humour enough to put himself into my clothes and the tale would have found a merry ending early in the morning but that was not now to be thought of no more was any other feasible accommodation to appear again before frederica in the figure in which my friend could give me out as a laborious and accomplished but poor student of theology before frederica who the evening before had spoken so friendly to my disguised self that was altogether impossible there i stood vexed and thoughtful and summoned all my power of invention but it deserted me but now when he comfortably stretched out after fixing his eyes upon me for a while all at once burst out with a loud laugh and exclaimed no it is true you do look most cursedly i replied impetuously and i know what i will do good-bye and make my excuses are you mad cried he springing out of bed and trying to detain me but i was already out of the door down the stairs out of the house and yard off to the tavern 
in an instant my horse was saddled and i hurried away in mad vexation galloping towards drusenheim then through that place and still further on as i now thought myself in safety i rode more slowly and now first felt how infinitely against my will i was going away but i resigned myself to my fate made present to my mind the promenade of yesterday evening with the greatest calmness and cherished the secret hope of seeing her soon again but this quiet feeling soon changed itself again into impatience and i now determined to ride rapidly into the city change my dress take a good fresh horse since then as my passion made me believe i could at all events return before dinner or as was more probable to the dessert or towards evening and beg my forgiveness end of book ten part three Section 4, Book 10, Part 4 of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. From My Life, Poetry and Truth by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford, eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven, Book Ten, Part Four. I was just about to put spurs to my horse to execute this plan when another, and as seemed to me a very happy thought, passed through my mind. In the tavern at Drusenheim the day before, I had noticed the son of the landlord, very nicely dressed who, early this morning, being busied about his rural arrangements, had saluted me from his courtyard. He was of my figure, and had for the moment reminded me of myself. No sooner thought than done. My horse was hardly turned round when I found myself in Drusenheim. I brought him into the stable, and in a few words made the fellow my proposal. Namely, that he should lend me his clothes, as I had something merry on foot at Sessenheim. I had no need to talk long. He agreed to the proposition with joy, and praised me for wishing to make some sport for the Mamsells. They were, he said, such capital people, especially Mamsell Riken, and the parents, too, liked to see everything go on merrily and pleasantly. Footnote, Mamsell Riken, abbreviation for frederica translator and footnote he considered me attentively and as from my appearance he might have taken me for a poor starveling he said if you wish to insinuate yourself this is the right way in the meanwhile we had already proceeded far in our toilette and properly speaking he should not have trusted me with his holiday clothes on the strength of mine but he was honest-hearted and moreover had my horse in his stable i soon stood there smart enough gave myself a consequential air and my friend seemed to regard his counterpart with complacency talk my brother he said giving me his hand, which I grasped heartily, don't come too near my girl, she might make a mistake. Footnote. Top. The exclamation used on striking a bargain. It is, we believe, employed by some trades in England. Translator. End footnote. My hair, which had now its full growth again, I could part at top, much like this and as I looked at him repeatedly, I found it comical moderately to imitate his thicker eyebrows with a burnt cork, and to bring mine nearer together in the middle, so that with my enigmatical intentions I might make myself an external riddle likewise. Now have you not, said I, as he handed me his red-ribboned hat, something or other to be done at the parsonage, that I might announce myself there in a natural manner? good replied he but then you must wait two hours yet there is a woman confined at our house i will offer to take the cake to the parson's wife and you may carry it over footnote the general custom of the country villages in protestant germany on such interesting occasions american note and footnote 
pride must pay its penalty and so must a joke i resolved to wait but these two hours were infinitely long and i was dying of impatience when the third hour passed before the cake came out of the oven at last i got it quite hot and hastened away with my credentials in the most beautiful sunshine accompanied for a distance by my counterpart who promised to come after me in the evening and bring me my clothes this however i briskly declined and stipulated that i should deliver up to him his own i had not skipped far with my present which i carried in a neat tied-up napkin when in the distance i saw my friend coming towards me with the two ladies my heart was uneasy which was certainly unsuitable under this jacket i stood still took breath and tried to consider how i should begin and now i first remarked that the nature of the ground was very much in my favour for they were walking on the other side of the brook which together with the strips of meadow through which it ran kept the two footpaths pretty far apart when they were just opposite to me frederica who had already perceived me long before cried george what are you bringing there i was clever enough to cover my face with my hat which i took off while i held up the loaded napkin high in the air a christening cake cried she at that how is your sister well said i for i tried to talk in a strange dialect if not exactly in the alsatian footnote um well in the original his answer is gate for gut translator end of footnote carry it to the house said the elder and if you do not find my mother give it to the maid but wait for us we shall soon be back do you hear i hastened along my path in the joyous feeling of the best hope that as the beginning was so lucky all would go off well and i had soon reached the parsonage i found nobody either in the house or in the kitchen i did not wish to disturb the old gentleman whom i might suppose busy in the study i therefore sat down on the bench before the door with the cake beside me and pressed my head upon my face i cannot easily recall a pleasanter sensation to sit again on this threshold over which a short time before i had blundered out in despair to have seen her already again to have already heard again her dear voice so soon after my chagrin had pictured to me a long separation every moment to be expecting herself and a discovery at which my heart throbbed and yet in this ambiguous case a discovery without shame for at the very beginning it was a merrier prank than any of those they had laughed at so much yesterday love and necessity are the best masters they both acted together here and their pupil was not unworthy of them but the maid came stepping out of the barn now did the cakes turn out well cried she to me how is your sister all right said i and pointed to the cakes without looking up she took up the napkin and muttered now what's the matter with you to-day again has barbkin been looking again at somebody else footnote for barbkin diminutive of barbara translator End footnote don't let us suffer for that you will make a happy couple if you carry on so as she spoke pretty loud the pastor came to the window and asked what was the matter she showed him to me i stood up and turned myself towards him but still kept the hat over my face when he had spoken somewhat friendly to me and had asked me to remain i went towards the garden and was just going in when the pastor's wife who was entering the courtyard gate called to me as the sun shone right in my face i once more availed myself of the advantage which my hat afforded me and greeted her by scraping a leg but she went into the house after she had bidden me not to go away without eating something i now walked up and down in the garden everything had hitherto had the best success yet i breathed hard when i reflected that the young people now would soon return but the mother unexpectedly stepped up to me and was just going to ask me a question when she looked me in the face so that i could not conceal myself any longer and the word stuck in her throat i am looking for george said she after a pause and whom do i find is it you young sir how many forms have you then in the earnest only one replied i 
in sport as many as you like which sport i will not spoil smiled she go out behind the garden into the meadow until it strikes twelve then come back and i shall already have contrived a joke i did so and when i was beyond the hedges of the village gardens and was going along the meadows towards me some country people came by the footpath and put me in some embarrassment i therefore turned aside into a little wood which crowned an elevation quite near in order to conceal myself there till the appointed time yet how strangely did i feel when i entered it for there appeared before me a neat place with benches from every one of which was a pretty view of the country here was a village on the steeple here drusenheim and behind it the woody islands of the rhine in the opposite direction was the volskian mountain range and at last the minister of strasburg these different heaven-bright pictures were set in bushy frames so that one could see nothing more joyous and pleasing i sat down upon one of the benches and noticed on the largest tree an oblong little board with the inscription frederica's repose it never occurred to me that i might have come to disturb this repose for a budding passion has this beauty about it that as it is unconscious of its origin neither can it have any thought of an end nor while it feels itself glad and cheerful have any presentiment that it may also create mischief i had scarcely had time to look about me and was losing myself in sweet reveries when i heard somebody coming it was frederica herself george what are you doing here she cried from a distance not george cried i running towards her but one who craves forgiveness for you a thousand times she looked at me with astonishment but soon collected herself and said after fetching her breath more deeply you abominable man how you frighten me the first disguise has led me into the second exclaimed i the former would have been unpardonable if i had only known in any degree to whom i was going but this one you will certainly forgive for it is the shape of persons whom you treat so kindly her pale cheeks had colored up with the most beautiful red rose you shall not be worse off than george at any rate but let us sit down i confess the fright has gone into my limbs i sat down beside her exceedingly agitated we know everything already up to this morning from your friend said she now do you tell me the rest i did not let her say that twice but described to her my horror at my yesterday's figure and my rushing out of the house so comically that she laughed heartily and graciously then i went on to what followed with all modesty indeed yet passionately enough so that it might have passed for a declaration of love in historical form at last i solemnized my pleasure at finding her again by a kiss upon her hand which she suffered to remain in mine if she had taken upon herself the expense of the conversation during yesterday evening's moonlight walk i now on my part richly repaid the debt the pleasures of seeing her again and being able to say to her everything that i had yesterday kept back was so great that in my eloquence i did not remark how meditative and silent she was once more she deeply fetched her breath and over and over again i begged her forgiveness for the fright which i had caused her how long we may have sat i know not but at once we heard some one call it was the voice of her sister that will be a pretty story said the dear girl restored to her perfect cheerfulness she is coming hither on my side she added bending so as to conceal me turn yourself away so that you may not be recognized at once the sister entered the place but not alone valand was with her and both when they saw us stood still as if petrified if we should all at once see a flame burst out violently from a quiet roof or should meet a monster whose deformity was at the same time revolting and fearful we should not be struck with such a fierce horror as that which seizes us when unexpectedly we see with our own eyes what we have believed morally impossible what is this cried the elder with the rapidity of one who is frightened 
what is this you with george hand in hand how am i to understand this dear sister replied frederica very doubtfully the poor fellow he is begging something of me he has something to beg of you too but you must forgive him beforehand i do not understand i do not comprehend said her sister shaking her head and looking at Violent, who in his quiet way stood by in perfect tranquillity and contemplated the scene without any kind of expression frederica rose and drew me after her no hesitating cried she pardon begged and granted now do said i stepping pretty near the elder i have need of pardon she drew back gave a loud shriek and was covered with blushes she then threw herself down on the grass laughed immoderately and seemed as if she would never have done Violin smiled as if pleased and cried you are a rare youth then he shook my hand in his he was not usually liberal with his caresses but his shake of the hand had something hearty and enlivening about it yet he was sparing of this also after somewhat recovering and collecting ourselves we set out on our return to the village on the way i learned how this singular meeting had been occasioned frederica had at last parted from the promenaders to rest herself in her little nook for a moment before dinner and when the other two came back to the house the mother had sent them to call frederica with as great haste as possible because dinner was ready the elder sister manifested the most extravagant delight and when she learned that the mother had already discovered the secret she cried now we have still to deceive my father my brother the servant man and the maid when we were at the garden hedge frederica insisted upon going first into the house with my friend the maid was busy in the kitchen garden and olivia so let the elder sister be named here called out to her stop i have something to tell you she left me standing by the hedge and went to the maid i saw that they were speaking very earnestly olivia represented to her that george had quarrelled with barbara and seemed desirous of marrying her the lass was not displeased at this i was now called and was to confirm what had been said the pretty stout girl cast down her eyes and remained so until i stood quite near before her but when all at once she perceived the strange face she too gave a loud scream and ran away olivia bade me run after her and hold her fast so that she should not get into the house and make a noise while she herself wished to go and see how it was with her father on the way olivia met the servant boy who was in love with the maid i had in the meantime hurried after the maid and held her fast only think what good luck cried olivia it's all over with barbara and george marries lysa that i have thought for a long while said the good fellow and remained standing in an ill humour i had given the maid to understand that all we had to do was to deceive the father we went up to the lad who turned away and tried to withdraw but lysa brought him back and he too when he was undeceived made the most extraordinary gestures we went together to the house the table was covered and the father was already in the room olivia who kept me behind her stepped to the threshold and said father have you any objection to george dining with us to-day but you must let him keep his hat on with all my heart said the old man but why such an unusual thing has he hurt himself she led me forward as i stood with my hat on no said she leading me into the room but he has a bird cage under it and the birds might fly out and make a deuce of a fuss for there are nothing but wild ones the father was pleased with the joke without precisely knowing what it meant at this instant she took off my hat made a scrape and required me to do the same the old man looked at me and recognized me but was not put out by his priestly self-possession ay ay mr candidate exclaimed he raising a threatening finger at me you have changed saddles very quickly and in the night i have lost an assistant who yesterday promised me so faithfully that he would often mount my pulpit on weekdays he then laughed heartily bade me welcome and we sat down to table moses came in much later for as the youngest spoiled child he had accustomed himself not to hear the dinner bell 
besides he took very little notice of the company scarcely even when he contradicted them in order to be more sure of him they had placed me not between the sisters but at the end of the table where george often used to sit as he came in at the door behind me he slapped me smartly on the shoulder and said good dinner to you george many thanks squire replied i the strange voice and the strange face startled him what say you cried olivia does he not look very like his brother yes from behind replied moses who managed to recover his composure immediately like all folks he did not look at me again and merely busied himself with zealously devouring the dishes to make up for lost time then too he thought proper to rise on occasion and find something to do in the yard and the garden at the dessert the real george came in and made the whole scene still more lively they began to banter him for his jealousy and would not praise him for getting rid of a rival in me but he was modest and clever enough and in a half confused manner mixed up himself his sweetheart his counterpart and the mamzelles with each other to such a degree that at last nobody could tell about whom he was talking and they were but too glad to let him consume in peace a glass of wine and a bit of his own cake at table there was some talk about going to walk which however did not suit me very well in my peasant's clothes but the ladies early on that day already when they learned who had run away in such a desperate hurry had remembered that a fine hunting coat pakeshe of a cousin of theirs in which when there he used to go sporting was hanging in the clothes press i however declined it externally with all sorts of jokes but internally with a feeling of vanity not wishing as the cousin to disturb the good impression i had made as the peasant the father had gone to take his afternoon nap the mother as always was busy with her housewifery but my friend proposed that i should tell them some story to which i immediately agreed we went into a spacious arbor and i gave them a tale which i had since written out under the title of the new milusina footnote this is introduced in wilhelm meister's wanderjahre translator end of footnote it bears about the same relation to the new paris as the youth bears to the boy and i would insert it here were i not afraid of injuring by odd plays of fancy the rural reality and the simplicity which here agreeably surround us enough i succeeded in gaining the reward of the inventors and narrators of such productions namely in awakening curiosity in fixing the attention in provoking over hasty solutions of impenetrable riddles in deceiving expectations in confusing by the more wonderful which came into the place of the wonderful in arousing sympathy and fear in causing anxiety in moving and at last by the change of what was apparently earnest into an ingenious and cheerful jest in satisfying the mind and in leaving the imagination materials for new images and the understanding materials for further reflection should any one hereafter read this tale in print and doubt whether it could have produced such an effect let him remember that properly speaking man is only called upon to act in the present writing is an abuse of language reading silently to oneself is a pitiful substitute for speech man affects all he can upon man by his personality youth is most powerful upon youth and hence also arise the purest influences it is these which enliven the world and allow it neither morally nor physically to perish i had inherited from my father a certain didactic loquacity from my mother the faculty of representing clearly and forcibly everything that the imagination can produce or grasp of giving a freshness to known stories of inventing and relating others nay of inventing in the course of narration 
by my paternal endowment i was for the most part annoying to the company for who likes to listen to the opinions and sentiments of another especially a youth whose judgment from defective experience always seems insufficient my mother on the contrary had thoroughly qualified me for social conversation the emptiest tale has in itself a high charm for the imagination and the smallest quantity of solid matter is thankfully received by the understanding by such recitals which cost me nothing i made myself beloved by children excited and delighted youth and drew upon myself the attention of older persons but in society such as it commonly is i was soon obliged to stop these exercises and i have thereby lost but too much of the enjoyment of life and of free mental advancement nevertheless both these parental gifts accompanied me throughout my whole life, united with the third, namely the necessity of expressing myself figuratively and by comparisons. In consideration of these peculiarities, which the acute and ingenious Dr. Gall discovered in me according to his theory, he assured me that I was, properly speaking, born for a popular orator at this disclosure i was not a little alarmed for if it had been here well founded everything that i undertook would have proved a failure from the fact that with my nation there was nothing to harangue about end of section four section five book eleven part one of the autobiography of goethe volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. From My Life, Poetry and Truth, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford, 1812-1872. Book 11, Part 1 heading care is taken that trees do not grow into the sky after i had in that bower of sessenheim finished my tale in which the ordinary and the impossible were so agreeably alternated i perceived that my hearers who had already shown peculiar sympathy were now enchanted in the highest degree by my singular narrative they pressed me urgently to write down the tale that they might often repeat it by reading it among themselves and to others i promised this the more willingly as i thus hoped to gain a pretext for repeating my visit and for an opportunity of forming a closer connection the parties separated for a moment and all were inclined to feel that after a day spent in so lively a manner the evening might fall rather flat from this anxiety i was freed by my friend who asked permission to take leave at once in the name of us both because as an industrious academical citizen regular in his studies he wished to pass the night at drusenheim and to be early in the morning at strasburg we both reached our night quarters in silence i because i felt a grapple on my heart which drew me back he because he had something else on his mind which he told me as soon as we had arrived. It is strange, he began, that you should just hit upon this tale. Did not you remark that it made quite a peculiar impression? Nay, answered I, how could I help observing that the elder one laughed more than was consistent at certain passages, that the younger one shook her head, that all of you looked significantly at each other, and that you, yourself, were nearly put out of countenance? i do not deny that i almost felt embarrassed myself for it struck me that it was perhaps improper to tell the dear girls a parcel of stuff of which they had better been ignorant and to give them such a bad opinion of the male sex as they must naturally have formed from the character of the hero you have not hit it at all said he and indeed how should you these dear girls are not so unacquainted with such matters as you imagine for the great society around them gives occasion for many reflections 
and there happens to be on the other side of the rhine exactly such a married pair as you describe allowing a little for fancy and exaggeration the husband just as tall sturdy and heavy the wife so pretty and dainty that he could easily hold her in his hand their mutual position in other respects their history altogether so exactly accords with your tale that the girls seriously asked me whether you knew the persons and described them in jest i assured them that you did not and you will do well to let the tale remain unwritten with the assistance of delays and pretexts we may soon find an excuse i was much astonished for i had thought of no couple on this or the other side of the rhine nay i could not have stated how i came by the notion i thought i liked to sport with such pleasantries without any particular reference and i believed that if i narrated them it would be the same with others when i returned to my occupations in the city i felt them more than usually wearisome for a man born to activity forms plans too extensive for his capacity and overburdens himself with labor this goes on very well till some physical or moral impediment comes in the way and clearly shows the disproportion of the powers to the undertaking i pursued jurisprudence with as much diligence as required to take my degree with some credit medicine charmed me because it showed nature if it did not unfold it on every side and to this i was attached by intercourse and habit to society i was obliged to devote some time and attention for in many families much had turned out both honorably and agreeably all this might have been carried on had not that which herder had inculcated pressed upon me with an infinite weight he had torn down the curtain which concealed from me the poverty of german literature he had ruthlessly destroyed so many of my prejudices in the sky of my fatherland there were few stars of importance left when he had treated all the rest as so many transient candlesnuffs nay my own hopes and fancies respecting myself he had so spoiled that i began to doubt my own capabilities at the same time however he dragged me on to the noble broadway which he himself was inclined to tread drew my attention to his favorite authors at the head of whom stood swift and Hamann, and shook me up with more force than he had bound me down to this manifold confusion was now added an incipient passion which while it threatened to absorb me might indeed draw me from other relations but could scarcely elevate me above them then came besides a corporeal malady which made me feel after dinner as if my throat was closed up and of which i did not easily get rid till afterwards when i abstained from a certain red wine which i generally and very willingly drank in the boarding-house this intolerable inconvenience had quitted me at sesenheim so that i felt double pleasure in being there but when i came back to my town diet it returned to my great annoyance all this made me thoughtful and remorse and my outward appearance probably corresponded with my inward feelings being in a worse humor than ever because the malady was violent after dinner i attended the clinical lecture the great care and cheerfulness with which our respected instructor led us from bed to bed the minute observation of important symptoms the judgment of the cause of complaint in general the fine hippocratic mode of proceeding by which without theory and out of an individual experience the forms of knowledge revealed themselves the addresses with which he usually crowned his lectures all this attracted me towards him and made a strange department into which i only looked as through a crevice so much the more agreeable and fascinating my disgust at the invalids gradually decreased as i learned to change their various states into distinct conceptions by which recovery and the restoration of the human form and nature appeared possible he probably had his eye particularly upon me as a singular young man and pardoned the strange anomaly which took me to his lectures on this occasion he did not conclude his lecture as usual with a doctrine which might have reference to an illness that had been observed but he said cheerfully 
gentlemen there are some holidays before us make use of them to enliven your spirits studies must not only be pursued with seriousness and diligence but also with cheerfulness and freedom of mind give movement to your bodies and traverse the beautiful country on horse and foot he who is at home will take delight in that to which he has been accustomed while for the stranger there will be new impressions and pleasant reminiscences in future there were only two of us to whom this admonition could be directed may the recipe have been as obvious to the others as it was to me i thought i heard a voice from heaven and made all the haste i could to order a horse and dress myself out neatly i sent for violin but he was not to be found this did not delay my resolution but the preparations unfortunately went on slowly and i could not depart so soon as i had hoped fast as i rode i was overtaken by the night the way was not to be mistaken and the moon shed her light on my impassioned project the night was windy and awful and i dashed on that i might not have to wait till morning before i could see her it was already late when i put up my horse at sessenheim the landlord in answer to my question whether there was still light in the parsonage assured me that the ladies had only just gone home he thought he had heard they were still expecting a stranger this did not please me as i wished to have been the only one i hastened that late as i was i might at least appear the first i found the two sisters sitting at the door they did not seem much astonished but i was when frederica whispered into olivia's ear loud enough for me to hear did i not say so here he is they conducted me into a room where I found a little collation set out. The mother greeted me as an old acquaintance, and the elder sister, when she saw me in the light, broke out into loud laughter, for she had little command over herself. After this first and somewhat odd reception, the conversation came at once free and cheerful, and a circumstance which had remained concealed from me this evening I learned on the following day frederica had predicted that i should come and who does not feel some satisfaction at the fulfilment of a foreboding even if it be a mournful one all presentiments when confirmed by the event give man a higher opinion of himself whether it be that he thinks himself in possession of so fine a susceptibility as to feel a relation in the distance or acute enough to perceive necessary but still uncertain associations even olivia's laugh remained no secret she confessed that it seemed very comical to see me dressed and decked out on this occasion frederica on the other hand found it advantageous not to explain such a phenomenon as vanity but rather to discover in it a wish to please her early in the morning frederica asked me to take a walk her mother and sister were occupied in preparing everything for the reception of several guests by the side of this beloved girl i enjoyed the noble sunday morning in the country as the inestimable hebel had depicted it she described to me the party which was expected and asked me to remain by her that all the pleasure might if possible be common to us both and be enjoyed in a certain order generally she said people amuse themselves alone sport and play is very lightly tasted so that at last nothing is left but cards for one part and the excitement of dancing for the other we therefore sketched our plan as to what should be done after dinner taught each other some new social games and were united and happy when the bell summoned us to church where by her side i found a somewhat dry sermon of her father's not too long the presence of the beloved one always shortens time but this hour passed amid peculiar reflections i repeated to myself the good qualities which she had just unfolded so freely before me her circumspect cheerfulness her naivete combined with self-consciousness her hilarity with foresight qualities which seem incompatible but which nevertheless were found together in her and gave a pleasing character to her outward appearance 
but now i had to make more serious reflections upon myself which were somewhat prejudicial to a free state of cheerfulness since that impassioned girl had cursed and sanctified my lips for every consecration involves both i had superstitiously enough taken care not to kiss any girl because i feared that i might injure her in some unheard-of spiritual manner i therefore subdued every desire by which a youth feels impelled to win from a charming girl this favor which says much or little but even in the most decorous company a heavy trial awaited me those little games as they are called which are more or less ingenious and by which a joyous young circle is collected and combined depend in a great measure upon forfeits in the calling in of which kisses have no small value i had resolved once for all not to kiss and as every want or impediment stimulates us to an activity to which we should otherwise not feel inclined i exerted all the talent and humor i possessed to help myself through and thus to win rather than lose before the company and for the company when a verse was desired for the redemption of a forfeit the demand was usually directed to me now i was always prepared and on such occasions contrived to bring about something in praise of the hostess or of some lady who had conducted herself most agreeably towards us if it happened that a kiss was imposed upon me at all events i endeavoured to escape by some turn which was considered satisfactory and as i had time to reflect on the matter beforehand i was never in want of various elegant excuses although those made on the spur of the moment were always most successful when we reached home the guests who had arrived from several quarters were buzzing merrily one with another until frederica collected them together and invited and conducted them to a walk to that charming spot there they found an abundant collation and wished to fill up with social games the period before dinner here by agreement with frederica though she did not know my secret i contrived to get up and go through games without forfeits and redemptions of forfeits without kissing my skill and readiness were so much the more necessary as the company which was otherwise quite strange to me seemed to have suspected some connection between me and the dear girl and roguishly took the greatest pains to force upon me that which i secretly endeavoured to avoid for in such circles if people perceive a growing inclination between two young persons they try to make them confused or to bring them closer together just as afterwards when once a passion has been declared they take trouble on purpose to part them again thus to the man of society it is totally indifferent whether he confers a benefit or an injury provided only he is amused this morning i could observe with more attention the whole character of frederica so that for the whole time she always remained to me the same the friendly greetings of the peasants which were especially addressed to her gave me to understand that she was beneficent to them and created in them an agreeable feeling the elder sister remained at home with her mother nothing that demanded bodily exertion was required of frederica she was spared they said on account of her chest there are women who especially please us in a room others who look better in the open air frederica belonged to the latter her whole nature her form never appeared more charming than when she moved along with elevated footpath the grace of her deportment seemed to vie with the flowery earth and the indestructible cheerfulness of her countenance with the blue sky this refreshing atmosphere which surrounded her she carried home and it might soon be perceived that she understood how to reconcile difficulties and to obliterate with ease the impression made by little unpleasant contingencies the purest joy which we can feel with respect to a beloved person is to find that she pleases others federica's conduct in society was beneficent to all in walks she floated about an animated spirit and knew how to supply the gaps which might arise here and there the lightness of her movements we have already commended and she was most graceful when she ran as the deer seems just to fulfil its destination when it lightly flies over the sprouting corn 
so did her peculiar nature seem most plainly to express itself when she ran with light steps over mead and furrow to fetch something which had been forgotten to seek something which had been lost to summon a distant couple or to order something necessary on these occasions she was never out of breath and always kept her equilibrium hence the great anxiety of her parents with respect to her chest must to many have appeared excessive the father who often accompanied us through meadows and fields was not always provided with a suitable companion on this account i joined him and he did not fail to touch once more upon his favorite theme and circumstantially to tell me about the proposed building of the parsonage he particularly regretted that he could not again get the carefully finished sketches so as to meditate upon them and to consider this and that improvement i observed that the loss might be easily supplied and offered to prepare a ground plan upon which after all everything chiefly depended with this he was highly pleased and settled that we should have the assistance of the schoolmaster to stir up whom he at once hurried off that the yard and foot measure might be ready early on the morrow when he had gone frederica said you are right to humour my dear father on his weak side and not like others who get weary of this subject to avoid him or to break it off i must indeed confess to you that the rest of us do not desire this building it would be too expensive for the congregation and for us also a new house new furniture our guests would not feel more comfortable with us now they are once accustomed to the old building here we can treat them liberally there we would find ourselves straitened in a wider sphere thus the matter stands but do not you fail to be agreeable i thank you for it from my heart another lady who joined us asked about some novels whether frederica had read them she answered in the negative for she had read but little altogether she had grown up in a cheerful decorous enjoyment of life and was cultivated accordingly i had the vicar of wakefield on the tip of my tongue but i did not venture to propose it the similarity of the situations being too striking and too important i am very fond of reading novels she said one finds in them such nice people whom one would like to resemble the measurement of the house took place the following day it was somewhat slow proceeding as i was as little accustomed to such arts as the schoolmaster at last a tolerable project came to my aid the good father told me his views and was not displeased when i asked permission to prepare the plan more conveniently in the town frederica dismissed me with joy she was convinced of my affection and i of hers and the six leagues no longer appeared a distance it was so easy to travel to drusenheim in the diligence and by this vehicle as well as by messengers ordinary and extraordinary to keep up a connection george being entrusted with the dispatches when i had arrived in the town i occupied myself in the earliest hours for there was no notion of a long sleep with the plan which i drew up neatly as possible in the meanwhile i had sent frederica some books accompanied by a few kind words i received an answer at once and was charmed with her light pretty hearty hand contents and style were natural good amiable as if they came from within and thus the pleasing impression she had made upon me was ever kept up and renewed i but too readily recalled to myself the endowments of her beautiful nature and nurtured the hope that i should see her soon and for a longer time there was now no more any need of an address from our good instructor he had by those words spoken at the right time so completely cured me that i had no particular inclination to see him and his patients again the correspondence with frederica became more animated she invited me to a festival to which also some friends from the other side of the rhine would come i was to make arrangements for a longer time this i did by packing a stout portmanteau upon the diligence and in a few hours i was in her presence i found a large merry party took the father aside and handed him the plan at which he testified great delight 
I talked over with him what I had thought while completing it. He was quite beside himself with joy, and especially praised the neatness of the drawing. This I had practiced from my youth upwards, and had on this occasion taken especial pains with the finest paper. But this pleasure was very soon marred for our good host, when against my counsel, and in the joy of his heart, he laid the sketch before the company. Far from uttering the desired sympathy, some thought nothing at all of this precious work. Others, who thought they knew something of the matter, made it still worse, blaming the sketch as not artistical. And, when the old man looked off for a moment, handled the sheets as if they were only so much rough drafts, while one, with the hard strokes of a lead pencil, marked his plans of improvement on the fine paper in such a manner that a restoration of the primitive purity was not to be thought of i was scarcely able to console the extremely irritated man whose pleasures had been so outrageously destroyed much as i assured him that i myself looked upon them only as sketches which we would talk over and on which we would construct new drawings in spite of all this he went off in a very ill humour and frederica thanked me for my attention to her father as well as for my patience during the unmannerly conduct of the other guests but i could feel no pain nor ill-humour in her presence the party consisted of young and tolerably noisy friends whom nevertheless an old gentleman tried to outdo proposing even odder stuff than they practised already at breakfast the wine had not been spared at a very well furnished dinner table there was no want of any enjoyment and the feast was relished the more by everybody after the violent bodily exercise during the somewhat warm weather and if the official gentlemen went a little too far in the good things the young people were not left much behind him i was happy beyond all bounds at the side of frederica talkative merry ingenious forward and yet kept in moderation by feeling esteem and attachment she in a similar position was open cheerful sympathizing and communicative we all appeared to live for the company and yet lived only for each other after the meal they sought the shade social games were begun and the turn came to forfeits on redeeming the forfeits everything of every kind was carried to excess the gestures which were commanded, the acts which were to be done, the problems which were to be solved, all showed a mad joy which knew no limits. I myself heightened these wild jokes by many a comical choice, and Frederica shone by many a droll thought. She appeared to me more charming than ever. All hypochondriacal superstitious fancies had vanished and when the opportunity offered of heartily kissing one whom i loved so tenderly i did not miss it still less did i deny myself a repetition of this pleasure the hope of the party for music was at last satisfied it was heard and all hastened to the dance alamandes waltzing and turning were beginning middle and end all had given up to this national dance even i did honor enough to my private dancing mistress and frederica who danced as she walked sprang and ran was delighted to find in me a very expert partner we generally kept together but were soon obliged to leave off and she was advised on all sides not to go on any further in this wild manner we consoled ourselves by a solitary walk hand in hand and when we had reached that quiet spot by the warmest embrace and the most faithful assurance that we loved each other heartily older persons who had risen with us from the game took us with them at supper people did not return to their sober senses dancing went on far into the night and there was as little want of healths and other incitements to drinking as at noon I had scarcely for a few hours slept very profoundly when I was awakened by a heat and tumult in my blood. It is at such times and in such situations that care and repentance usually attack man who is stretched out defenseless. My imagination at once presented to me the liveliest forms. I saw Lucinda, 
how after the most ardent kiss she passionately receded from me and with glowing cheek and sparkling eyes uttered that curse by which she intended to menace her sister only but by which she also unconsciously menaced innocent persons who were unknown to her i saw frederica standing opposite to her paralyzed at the sight pale and feeling the consequences of the curse of which she knew nothing i found myself between them as little able to ward off the spiritual effects of the adventure as to avoid the evil boding kiss the delicate health of frederica seemed to hasten the threatened calamity and now her love to me wore a most unhappy aspect and i wished myself further but something still more painful to me which lay in the background i will not conceal a certain conceit kept that superstition alive in me my lips whether consecrated or cursed appeared to me more important than usual and with no little complacency was i aware of my self-denying conduct in renouncing many an innocent pleasure partly to preserve my magical advantage partly to avoid hurting a harmless being by giving it up and now all was lost and irrevocable i had returned into a mere common position and i thought that i had harmed irretrievably injured the dearest of beings thus far from my beloved freed from the curse it was flung back from my lips into my own heart all this together raged in my blood already excited by love and passion wine and dancing confused my thoughts and tortured my feelings so that especially as contrasted with the joys of the day before i felt myself in a state of despair which seemed unbounded fortunately daylight peered in upon me through a chink in the shutter and the sun stepped forth and vanquishing all the powers of night set me again upon my feet i was soon in the open air and refreshed if not restored superstition like many other fancies very easily loses in power when instead of flattering our vanity it stands in its way and would fain produce an evil hour to this delicate being we then see well enough that we can get rid of it when we choose we renounce it the more easily as all of which we deprive ourselves turns to our own advantage the sight of frederica the feeling of her love the cheerfulness of everything around me all reproved me that in the midst of the happiest days i could harbor such dismal night birds in my bosom the confiding conduct of the dear girl which became more and more intimate made me thoroughly rejoiced and i felt truly happy when at parting she openly gave a kiss to me as well as the other friends and relations in the city many occupations and dissipations awaited me from the midst of which i collected myself for the sake of my beloved by means of a correspondence which we regularly established even in her letters she always remained the same whether she related anything new or alluded to well-known occurrences lightly described or cursorily reflected it was always as if even with her pen she appeared going coming running bounding with a step as light as it was sure i also liked very much to write to her for the act of rendering present her good qualities increased my affection even during absence so that this intercourse was little inferior to a personal one nay afterwards became pleasanter and dearer to me for that superstition had been forced to give way altogether it was indeed based upon the impressions of earlier years but the spirit of the day the liveliness of youth the intercourse with cold sensible men all was unfavorable to it so that it would not have been easy to find among all who surrounded me a single person to whom a confession of my whims would not have been perfectly ridiculous but the worst of it was that the fancy while it fled left behind it a real contemplation of that state in which young people are placed whose early affections can promise themselves no lasting result 
so little was i assisted in getting free from air that understanding and reflection used me still worse in this instance my passion increased the more i learned to know the virtue of the excellent girl and the time approached when i was to lose perhaps forever so much that was dear and good we had quietly and pleasantly passed a long time together when friend violent had the waggery to bring with him to sessenheim the vicar of wakefield and when they were talking of reading aloud to hand it over to me unexpectedly as if nothing further was to be said i managed to collect myself and read with as much cheerfulness and freedom as i could even the faces of my hearers at once brightened and it did not seem unpleasant to them to be again forced to a comparison if they had found a comical counterparts to raymond and melusina they here saw themselves in a glass which by no means gave a distorted likeness they did not openly confess but they did not deny that they were moving among persons akin both by mind and feeling all men of a good disposition feel with increasing cultivation that they have a double part to play in the world a real one and an ideal one and in this feeling is the ground of everything noble to be sought the real part which has been assigned to us we experience but too plainly with respect to the second we seldom come to a clear understanding about it man may seek his higher destination on earth or in heaven in the present or in the future yet he remains on this account exposed to an eternal wavering to an influence from without which ever disturbs him until he once for all makes a resolution to declare that that is right which is suitable to himself among the most venial attempts to acquire something higher to place oneself on an equality with something higher may be classed the youthful impulse to compare oneself with the characters in novels this is highly innocent and whatever may be urged against it the very reverse of mischievous it amuses at times when we should necessarily die of ennui or grasp at the recreation of passion how often is repeated the litany about the mischief of novels and yet what misfortune is it if a pretty girl or a handsome young man put themselves in the place of a person who fares better or worse than themselves is a citizen life worth so much or do the necessities of the day so completely absorb the man that he must refuse every beautiful demand which is made upon him End of section five. Book 11, Part 2 of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2, From My Life, Poetry and Truth, translated by John Oxenford, Section 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2 by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven, Book Eleven, Part Two. The historico poetical Christian names which have intruded into the German Church, in the place of the sacred names, not unfrequently to the annoyance of the officiating clergyman are without a doubt to be regarded as small ramifications of the romantico-poetical pictures. This very impulse to honor one's child by a well-sounding name, even if the name has nothing further behind it, is praiseworthy, and this connection of an imaginary world with the real one diffuses an agreeable luster over the whole life of the person. A beautiful child whom with satisfaction we call Bertha, we should think we offended if we were to call it Ursel Blandin. With a cultivated man, not to say a lover, such a name would certainly falter on the lips. The cold world, which judges only from one side, 
is not to be blamed if it sets down as ridiculous and objectionable all that comes forward as imaginary. But the thinking connoisseur of mankind must know how to estimate it according to its worth. For the instruction of the lovers on the lovely bank of the Rhine, this comparison to which a wag had compelled them produced the most agreeable results. We do not think of ourselves when we look in a mirror, but we feel ourselves and allow ourselves to pass. Thus it is also with those moral imitations in which we recognize our manners and inclinations, our habits and peculiarities, as in a silhouette, and strive to grasp it and embrace it with brotherly affection. The habit of being together became more and more confirmed, and nothing else was known but that I belonged to this circle. The affair was allowed to take its course without the question being directly asked as to what was to be the result. And what parents are there who do not find themselves compelled to let daughters and sons continue for a while in such a wavering condition until accidentally something is confirmed for life better than it could have been produced by a long arranged plan? It was thought that perfect confidence could be placed both in Frederica's sentiments and in my rectitude, of which, on account of my forbearance, even from innocent caresses, a favorable opinion had been entertained. We were left unobserved, as was generally the custom, there and then, and it depended on ourselves to go over the country with a larger or smaller party, and to visit the friends in the neighborhood. On both sides of the Rhine, in Hagenau, Fort Louis, Philipsburg, the Ortenon, I found dispersed those persons whom I had seen united at Sessenheim, every one by himself, a friendly, hospitable host, throwing open kitchen and cellar just as willingly as gardens and vineyards, nay, the whole spot. The islands on the Rhine were often a goal to our water expeditions. There, without pity, we put the cool inhabitants of the clear Rhine into the kettle, on the spit, into the boiling fat, and would here perhaps, more than was reasonable, have settled ourselves in the snug fishermen's huts if the abominable Rhine gnats, Rhine schnacken, had not, after some hours, driven us away. At this intolerable interruption of one of our most charming parties of pleasure, when everything else was prosperous, when the affection of the lovers seemed to increase with the good success of the enterprise, and we had nevertheless come home too soon, unsuitably and inopportunely, I actually, in the presence of the good reverend father, broke out into blasphemous expressions and assured him that these gnats alone were sufficient to remove from me the thought that a good and wise deity had created the world. The pious old gentleman, by way of reply, solemnly called me to order and explained to me that these gnats and other vermin had not arisen until after the fall of our first parents, or that if there were any of them in paradise, they had only pleasantly hummed there and had not stung. I certainly felt myself calmed at once, for an angry man may easily be appeased if we can succeed in making him smile. But nevertheless I asserted that there was no need of the angel with the burning sword to drive the guilty pair out of the garden. My host, I said, must rather allow me to think that this was effected by means of great gnats on the Tigris and the Euphrates. And thus I again made him laugh, for the old man understood a joke, or at any rate let one pass. However, the enjoyment of the daytime and season in this noble country was more serious and more elevating to the heart. One had only to resign oneself to the present, to enjoy the clearness of the pure sky, the brilliancy of the rich earth, the mild evenings, the warm nights by the side of a beloved one or in her vicinity. 
For months together, we were favored with pure ethereal mornings when the sky displayed itself in all its magnificence. Having watered the earth with superfluous dew, and that this spectacle might not become too simple, clouds after clouds piled themselves over the distant mountains, now in this spot, now in that. They stood for days, nay, for weeks, without obscuring the pure sky, and even the transient storms refreshed the country and gave luster to the green, which again glistened in the sunshine before it could become dry. The double rainbow, the two colored borders of a dark gray and nearly black streak in the sky, were nobler, more highly colored, more decided, but also more transient than I had ever observed. In the midst of these objects, the desire of poeticizing, which I had not felt for a long time, again came forward. For Frederica I composed many songs to well-known melodies. They would have made a pretty little book. A few of them still remain, and will easily be found among my others. Since on account of my strange studies and other circumstances, I was often compelled to return to the town. There arose for our affection a new life, which preserved us from all that unpleasantness which usually attaches itself as an annoying consequence of such little love affairs. Though far from me, she yet labored for me, and thought of some new amusement against I should return. Though far from her, I employed myself for her, that by some new gift or new notion I myself might be again new to her. Painted ribbons had then just come into fashion. I painted at once for her a few pieces, and sent them on with a little poem, as on this occasion I was forced to stop away longer than I had anticipated, that I might fulfill and even go beyond my promise to the father of a new and elaborated plan, I persuaded a young adept in architecture to work instead of myself. He took as much pleasure in the task as he had kindness for me, and was still further animated by the hope of a good reception in so agreeable a family. He finished the ground plan, sketch, and section of the house. Courtyard and garden were not forgotten and a detailed but very moderate estimate was added to show the possibility of carrying out an extensive project. These testimonials of our friendly endeavors obtained for us the kindest reception, and since the good father saw that we had the best will to serve him, he came forward with one wish more. It was the wish to see his pretty but one-colored chair adorned with flowers and other ornaments we showed ourselves accommodating. Colors, pencils, and other requisites were fetched from the tradesmen and apothecaries of the nearest towns. But that we might not be wanting in a Wakefield mistake, we did not remark, until all had been most industriously and variously painted, that we had taken a false varnish which would not dry. Neither sunshine nor drought, neither fair nor wet weather were of any avail. In the meanwhile, we were obliged to make use of an old lumber room, and nothing was left us but to rub out the ornaments with more assiduity than we had painted them. The unpleasantness of this work was still increased when the girls entreated us, for heaven's sake, to proceed slowly and cautiously for the sake of sparing the ground, which, however, after this operation, was not again to be restored to its former brilliancy. By such little disagreeable contingencies, which happened at intervals, we were, however, just as little interrupted in our cheerful life as Dr. Primrose and his amiable family. For many an unexpected pleasure befell both ourselves and our friends and neighbors. Weddings and christenings, the erection of a building, an inheritance, a prize in the lottery, were reciprocally announced and enjoyed. We shared all joy together, like a common property, and wished to heighten it by mind and love. It was not the first nor the last time that I found myself in families and social circles at the very moment of their highest bloom, 
and if I may flatter myself that I contributed something toward the luster of such epochs, I must, on the other hand, be reproached for the fact that on this very account such times passed the more quickly and vanished the sooner. But now our love was to undergo a singular trial. I will call it a trial, prufung, although this is not the right word. The country family with which I was intimate was related to some families in the city of good note and respectability, and comfortably off as to circumstances. The young townspeople were often at Sessenheim, the older persons, the mothers and aunts, being less movable, heard so much of the life there, of the increasing charms of the daughters, and even of my influence, that they first wished to become acquainted with me, and after I had often visited them, and had been well received by them, desired also to see us once altogether, especially as they thought they owed the Sessenheim folks a friendly reception in return. There was much discussion on all sides. The mother could scarcely leave her household affairs. Olivia had a horror of the town for which she was not fitted, and Frederica had no inclination for it, and thus the affair was put off until it was at last brought to a decision by the fact that it happened to be impossible for me to come into the country, for it was better to see each other in the city and under some restraint than not to see each other at all. And thus I now found my fair friends, whom I had been only accustomed to see in a rural scene and whose image had only appeared to me hitherto before a background of waving bows, flowing brooks, nodding field flowers, and a horizon open for miles. I now saw them, I say, for the first time, in town rooms, which were indeed spacious, but yet narrow, if we take into consideration the carpets, glasses, clocks, and porcelain figures. The relation to that which one loves is so decided that the surrounding objects have little to do with it, but nevertheless the heart desires that these shall be the suitable, natural, and usual objects. With my lively feeling for everything present, I could not at once adopt myself to the contradiction of the moment. The respectable and calmly noble demeanor of the mother was perfectly adapted to the circle. She was not different from the other ladies. Olivia, on the other hand, showed herself as impatient as a fish out of water. As she had formerly called to me in the gardens, or beckoned me aside in the fields if she had anything particular to say to me, she also did the same here, when she drew me into the recess of a window. This she did awkwardly and with embarrassment, because she felt that it was not becoming, and did it notwithstanding. She had the most unimportant things in the world to say to me, nothing but what I already knew. For instance, that she wished herself by the Rhine, over the Rhine, or even in Turkey. Frederica, on the contrary, was highly remarkable in this situation. Properly speaking, she also did not suit it, but it bore witness to her character that, instead of finding herself adapted to this condition, she unconsciously molded the condition according to herself. She acted here as she had acted with the society in the country. She knew how to animate every moment. Without creating any disturbance, she put all in motion, and exactly by this pacified society, which really is only disturbed by ennui. She thus completely fulfilled the desire of her town aunts, who wished for once, on their sofas, to be witnesses of those rural games and amusements. If this was done to satisfaction, so also were the wardrobe, the ornaments, and whatever besides distinguished the town nieces, who were dressed in the French fashion, considered and admired without envy. With me also Frederica had no difficulty, since she treated me the same as ever. She seemed to give me no other preference but that of communicating her desires and wishes to me rather than to another, and thus recognizing me as her servant. To this service she confidently laid claim on one of the following days when she privately told me that the ladies wished to hear me read. The daughters of the house had spoken much on this subject, for at Sessenheim I had read what and when I was desired. I was ready at once 
but craved quiet and attention for several hours. This was conceded, and one evening I read through the whole of Hamlet without interruption, entering into the sense of the piece as well as I was able, and expressing myself with liveliness and passion, as is possible in youth. I earned great applause. Frederica drew her breath deeply from time to time, and a transient red had passed over her cheeks. These two symptoms of a tender heart internally moved, while cheerfulness and calmness were externally apparent, were not unknown to me, and were indeed the only reward which I had striven to obtain. She joyfully collected the thanks of the party for having caused me to read, and in her graceful manner did not deny herself the little pride of having shown in me, and through me. This town visit was not to have lasted long, but the departure was delayed. Frederica did her part for the social amusement, and I was not wanting, but the abundant sources which yield so much in the country now dried up in their turn, and the situation was the more painful, as the elder sister gradually lost all self-control. The two sisters were the only persons in the society who dressed themselves in the German fashion. Frederica had never thought of herself in any other way, and believed herself so right everywhere that she made no comparisons with anyone else. But Olivia found it quite insupportable to move about in a society of genteel appearance attired so like a maidservant. In the country she scarcely remarked the town costume of others, and did not desire it. But in the town she could not endure the country style. All this, together with the different lot of town ladies, and the thousand trifles of a series of circumstances totally opposed to her own notions, so worked for some days in her impassioned bosom, that I was forced to apply all my flattering attention to appease her, according to the wish of Frederica. I feared an impassioned scene. I looked forward to the moment when she would throw herself at my feet and implore me by all that was sacred to rescue her from this situation. She was good to a heavenly degree if she could conduct herself in her own way, but such a restraint at once made her uncomfortable and could at last drive her even to despair. I now sought to hasten that which was desired by the mother and Olivia and not repugnant to Frederica. I did not refrain from praising her as a contrast to her sister. I told her what pleasure it gave me to find her unaltered, and, even under the present circumstances, just as free as the bird among the branches. She was courteous enough to reply that I was there, and that she wished to go neither in nor out when I was with her. At last I saw them take their departure and it seemed as though a stone fell from my heart, for my own feelings had shared the condition of Frederica and Olivia. I was not passionately tormented like the former, but I felt by no means as comfortable as the latter. Since I had properly gone to Strasbourg to take my degree, it may be rightly reckoned among the irregularities of my life that I treated this material business as a mere collateral affair. All anxiety as to my examination I had put aside in a very easy fashion, but I had now to think of the disputation. Footnote. A polemic dissertation written on taking an university degree. Translator. End footnote. For on my departure from Frankfurt I had promised my father, and resolved within myself to write one. It is the fault of those who can do many things, nay, much, that they trust everything to themselves and youth must indeed be in this position, if anything is to be made of it. A survey of the science of jurisprudence and all its framework I had pretty well acquired. Single subjects of law sufficiently interested me, and as I had the good laser for my model, I thought I should get tolerably through with my own little common sense. Great movements were showing themselves in jurisprudence. Judgments were to be more according to equity, all rights by usage were daily seen to be compromised, and in the criminal department especially a great change was impending. As for myself, I felt well enough that I lacked an infinite deal to fill up the legal commonplace which I had proposed. The proper knowledge was wanting, and no inner tendency urged me to such subjects. Neither was there any impulse from without, nay, quite another faculty. Footnote. Medicine. Translator. 
end footnote, had completely carried me away. In general, if I was to take any interest in a thing, it was necessary for me to gain something from it, to perceive in it something that appeared fertile to me and gave me prospects. Thus I had once more noted down some materials, had afterwards made collections, had taken my books of extracts in hand, had considered the point which I wished to maintain, the scheme according to which I wished to arrange the single elements, but I was sharp enough soon to perceive that I could not get on, and that to treat the special matter, a special and long pursuing industry was requisite, nay, that such a special task cannot be successfully accomplished unless, upon the whole, one is at any rate an old hand, if not a master. The friends to whom I communicated my embarrassment deemed me ridiculous, because one can dispute upon theses as well, nay, even better, than upon a treatise, and in Strasbourg this was not uncommon. I allowed myself to be very well inclined to such an expedient, but my father, to whom I wrote on the subject, desired a regular work which, as he thought, I could very well prepare, if I only chose so to do and allowed myself proper time. I was now compelled to throw myself upon some general topic and to choose something which I should have at my fingers' ends. Ecclesiastical history was almost better known to me than the history of the world, and that conflict in which the church, the publicly recognized worship of God, finds itself, and always will find itself, in two different directions, had always highly interested me. For now it lies in an eternal conflict with the state, over which it will exalt itself, now with the individuals, all of whom it will gather to itself. The state, on its side, will not yield the superior authority to the church, and the individuals oppose its restraints. The state desires everything for public, universal ends. The individual for ends belonging to the home, heart, and feelings. From my childhood upwards, I had been a witness of such movements when the clergy now offended their authorities, now their congregations. I had therefore established it as a principle in my young mind that the state, the legislator, had the right to determine a worship according to which the clergy should teach and conduct themselves, and the laity, on the other hand, should direct themselves publicly and externally, while there should be no question about anyone's thoughts, feelings, or notions. Thus I perceived that I had at once got rid of all collisions. I therefore chose for my disputation the first half of this theme, namely that the legislator was not only authorized but bound to establish a certain worship from which neither the clergy nor the laity might free themselves. I carried out this theme partly historically, partly argumentatively, showing that all public religions had been introduced by leaders of armies, kings, and powerful men, that this had even been the case with Christianity. The example of Protestantism lay quite close at hand. I went to work at this task with so much the more boldness, as I really only wrote it to satisfy my father, and desired and hoped nothing more ardently than that it might not pass the censorship. I had imbibed from Bachish an unconquerable dislike to see anything of mine in print, and my intercourse with Herder had discovered to me but too plainly my own insufficiency, nay, a certain mistrust in myself, had through this means been perfectly matured. As I drew this work almost entirely out of myself, and wrote and spoke Latin with fluency, the time which I expended on the treatise passed very agreeably. The matter had at least some foundation. The style, naturally speaking, was not bad. The whole was pretty well rounded off. As soon as I had finished it, I went through it with a good Latin scholar, who, although he could not, on the whole, improve my style, yet easily removed all striking defects, so that something was produced that was fit to be shown. A fair copy was at once sent to my father, who disapproved of one thing, namely, that none of the subjects previously taken in hand had been worked out. But nevertheless, as a thorough Protestant, he was well pleased with the boldness of the plan. My singularities were tolerated, my exertions were praised, and he promised himself an important effect from the publication of the work. I now handed over my papers to the faculty, 
who fortunately behaved in a manner as prudent as it was polite. The dean, a lively, clever man, began with many laudations of my work, then went on to what was doubtful, which he contrived gradually to change into something dangerous, and concluded by saying that it might not be advisable to publish this work as an academical dissertation. The aspirant had shown himself to the faculty as a thinking young man of whom they might hope the best. They would willingly, not to delay the affair, allow me to dispute on theses. I could afterwards publish my treatise either in its present condition or more elaborated in Latin or in another language. This would everywhere be easy to me as a private man and a Protestant, and I should have the pleasure of an applause more pure and more general. I scarcely concealed from the good man what a stone his discourse rolled from my heart. At every new argument which he advanced that he might not trouble me, nor make me angry by his refusal, my mind grew more and more easy, and so did his own at last, when, quite unexpectedly, I offered no resistance to his reasons, but on the contrary found them extremely obvious, and promised to conduct myself according to his counsel and guidance. I therefore sat down again with my repentance. Theses were chosen and printed, and the disputation, with the opposition of my fellow boarders, went off with great merriment, and even with facility, for my old habit of turning over the corpus juris was very serviceable to me, and I could pass for a well-instructed man. A good feast, according to custom, concluded the solemnity. My father, however, was very dissatisfied that the little work had not been regularly printed as a disputation, because he had hoped that I should gain honor by it on my entrance into Frankfurt. He therefore wished to publish it especially, but I represented to him that the subject, which was only sketched, could be more completely carried out at some future time. He put up the manuscript carefully for this purpose, and many years afterwards I saw it among his papers. I took my degree on the 6th of August, 1771, and on the following day Schufflin died in the 75th year of his age. Even without closer contact, he had had an important influence upon me. For eminent contemporaries may be compared to the greater stars, towards which, so long as they merely stand above the horizon, our eye is turned and feels strengthened and cultivated if it is only allowed to take such perfections into itself. Bountiful nature had given Schupflin an advantageous exterior, a slender form, kindly eyes, a ready mouth, and a thoroughly agreeable presence. Neither had she been sparing in gifts of mind to her favorite, and his good fortune was the result of innate and carefully cultivated merits without any troublesome exertion. He was one of those happy men who are inclined to unite the past and the present, and understand how to connect historical knowledge with the interests of life. Born in the Baden territory, educated at Basel and Strasbourg, he quite properly belonged to the paradisiacal valley of the Rhine, as an extensive and well-situated fatherland. His mind being directed to historical and antiquarian objects, he readily seized upon them with a felicitous power of representation, and retained them by the most convenient memory. Desirous as he was both of learning and of teaching, he pursued a course of study and of life which equally advanced. He soon emerges and rises above the rest, without any kind of interruption, diffuses himself with ease through the literary and citizen world, for historical knowledge passes everywhere and affability attaches itself everywhere. He travels through Germany, Holland, France, Italy. He comes in contact with all the learned men of his time. He amuses princes, and it is only when, by his lively loquacity, the hours of the table or of audience are lengthened, that he is tedious to the people at court. On the other hand, he acquires the confidence of the statesmen, works out for them the most profound legal questions and thus finds everywhere a field for his talent. In many places they attempt to retain him, but he remains faithful to Strasbourg and the French court. His immovable German honesty is recognized even there. He is even protected against the powerful Praetor Klingling, who is secretly his enemy.
Sociable and talkative by nature, he extends his intercourse with the world, as well as his knowledge and occupations. And we should hardly be able to understand whence he got all his time, did we not know that a dislike to women accompanied him through his whole life, and that thus he gained many days and hours which are happily thrown away by those who are well disposed towards the ladies. For the rest, he belongs as an author to the ordinary sort of character, and as an orator to the multitude. His program, his speeches, and addresses are devoted to the particular day, to the approaching solemnity. Nay, his great work, Alsatia Illustrata, belongs to life, as he recalls the past, freshens up faded forms, reanimates the hewn and the formed stone, and brings obliterated broken inscriptions for a second time before the eyes and mind of his reader. In such a manner, his activity fills all Alsatia and the neighboring country. In Baden and the Palatinate, he preserves to an extreme old age an uninterrupted influence. At Mannheim, he founds the Academy of Sciences, and remains president of it till his death. I never approached this eminent man, excepting on one night when we gave him a torch serenade. Our pitch torches more filled with smoke than lighted the courtyard of the old chapter house, which was overarched by linden trees. When the noise of the music had ended, he came forward and stepped into the midst of us, and here also was in his right place. The slender, well-grown, cheerful old man stood with his light, free manners, venerably before us, and held us worthy the honor of a well-considered address, which he delivered to us in an amiable, paternal manner, without a trace of restraint or pedantry so that we really thought ourselves something for the moment. For indeed, he treated us like the kings and princes whom he had been so often called upon to address in public. We testified our satisfaction aloud, trumpets and drums repeatedly sounded, and the dear, hopeful, academical plebs then found its way home with hearty satisfaction. His scholars and companions in study, Kosh and Oberlin, were men in close connection with me, my taste for antiquarian remains was passionate. They often led me into the museum, which contained, in many ways, the voucher to his great work on Alsace. Even this work I had not known intimately until after that journey, when I had found antiquities on the spot, and now being perfectly advanced, I could, on longer or shorter expeditions, render present to myself the valley of the Rhine as a Roman possession, and finish coloring many a dream of times past. Scarcely had I made some progress in this than Oberlin directed me to the monuments of the Middle Ages, and made me acquainted with the ruins and remains, the seals and documents, which those times have left behind them, nay, sought to inspire me with an inclination for what we call the main singers, and heroic poets. To this good man, as well as to Herakosh, I have been greatly indebted, and if things had gone according to their wish, I should have had to thank them for the happiness of my life. The matter stood thus. Schupflin, for his whole lifetime, had moved in the higher sphere of political law, and well knew the great influence which such and kindred studies are likely to procure for a sound head, in courts and cabinets, felt an insuperable, nay, unjust aversion from the situation of a civilian, and had inspired his scholars with the like sentiments. The above-mentioned two men, friends of Salzman, had taken notice of me in a most friendly manner. My impassioned grasping at external objects, the manner in which I continued to bring forward their advantages and to communicate to them a particular interest they prized higher than I did myself. My slight, and I may say, my scanty occupation with the civil law had not remained unobserved by them. They were well enough acquainted with me to know how easily I was to be influenced. I had made no secret of my liking for an academical life, and they therefore thought to gain me over to history, political law, and rhetoric, at first for a time, but afterwards more decidedly. The prospect of the German chancery at Versailles, the precedent of Schupflin, whose merits indeed seemed to me unattainable, were to incite to emulation, if not to imitation and perhaps a similar talent was thus to be cultivated, which might be both profitable to him who could boast of it and useful to others who might choose to employ it on their own account. 
These, my patrons, and salesmen with them, went to great value on my memory and my capacity for apprehending the sense of languages, and chiefly by these sought to further their views and plans. End of Book 11, Part 2Section 7, Book 11, Part 3 of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2, From My Life, Poetry and Truth, by Owen Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, 1812-1877, Book 11, Part 3. I now intend to describe at length how all this came to nothing and how it happened that I again passed over from the French to the German side. Let me be allowed, as hitherto, some general reflections by way of transition. There are few biographies which can represent a pure, quiet, steady progress of the individual. Our life, as well as all in which we are contained, is, in an incomprehensible manner, composed of freedom and necessity. A will is prediction of what we shall do under all circumstances, but these circumstances lay hold on us in their own fashion. The what lies in us, the how seldom depends on us, after the wherefore we dare not ask, and on this account we are rightly referred to the queer. The French tongue I had liked from my youth upwards. I had learned to know the language through a bustling life, and a bustling life through the language. It had become my own, like a second mother tongue, without grammar and instruction, by mere intercourse and practice. I now wished to use it with still greater fluency, and again gave Strasbourg the preference as an university residence to other high schools but alas, it was just there that I had to experience the very reverse of my hopes, and to be turned rather from than to this language and these manners. The French, who generally aim at good behaviour, are indulgent towards foreigners who begin to speak their language. They will not laugh anyone out of countenance at a fault, or blame him in direct terms. However, since they cannot endure sins committed against their language, they have a manner of repeating, and as it were courteously confirming what has been said with another turn, at the same time making use of the expression which should properly have been employed, thus leading the intelligent and attentive to what is right and proper. Now, although if one is in earnest, if one has self-denial enough to profess oneself a pupil, one gains a great deal and is much advanced by this plan, one nevertheless always feels in some degree humiliated. And since one talks for the sake of the subject matter also, often too much interrupted or even distracted, so that one impatiently lets the conversation drop. This happened with me more than with others, as I always thought that I had to say something interesting, and on the other hand to hear something important, and did not wish to be always brought back merely to the expression, a case which often occurred with me as my French was just as motley as that of any other foreigner. I had observed the accent and idiom of footmen, valets, guards, young and old actors, theatrical lovers, peasants, and heroes. In this Babylonish idiom was rendered still more confused by another odd ingredient, as I liked to hear the French reformed clergy and visited their churches, the more willingly as a Sunday walk to Bockenheim was on this account not only permitted, but ordered. But even this was not enough for as in my youthful years I had always been chiefly directed to the German of the sixteenth century, I soon included the French also of that noble epoch among the objects of my inclination. Montaigne, Amiot, Rabelais, 
Marot were my friends and excited in me sympathy and delight. Now all these different elements moved in my discourse chaotically one with another, so that for the hearer the meaning was lost in the oddity of the expression. Nay, an educated Frenchman could no more courteously correct me, but had to censure me and tutor me in plain terms. It therefore happened with me here once more as it had happened in Leipzig, only on this occasion I could not appeal to the right of my native place to speak idiomatically as well as other provinces, but being on a foreign ground and soil was forced to adapt myself to traditional laws. Perhaps we might even have resigned ourselves to this if an evil genius had not whispered into our ears that all endeavours by a foreigner to speak French would remain unsuccessful, for a practised ear can perfectly well detect a German, Italian or Englishman under a French mask. One is tolerated, but never received into the bosom of the only language holy church. Only a few exceptions were granted. They named to us a Herr von Grimm. But even Schöpflin, it seemed, did not reach the summit. They allowed that he had early seen the necessity of expressing himself in French to perfection. They approved of his inclination to converse with every one, and especially to entertain the great and persons of rank. They praised him that, living in the place where he was, he had made the language of the country his own, and had endeavoured as much as possible to render himself a Frenchman of society and orator. But what does he gain by the denial of his mother tongue and his endeavours after a foreign one? He cannot make it right with anybody. In society they are pleased to deem him vain, as if any one would or could converse with others without some feeling for self and self-complacency. Then the refined connoisseurs of the world and of language assert that there is in him more of dissertation and dialogue than of conversation, properly so called. The former was generally recognised as the original and fundamental sin of the Germans, the latter as the cardinal virtue of the French. As a public orator he fares no better. If he prints a well-elaborated address to the king or the princes, the Jesuits, who are ill-disposed to him as a Protestant, lay wait for him, and show that his terms of expression are not French. Instead of consoling ourselves with this, and bearing as green wood that which has been laid upon the dry, we were annoyed at such pedantic injustice. We fall into despair, and by this striking example are the more convinced that it is a vain endeavour to try to satisfy the French by the matter itself, as they are too closely bound to the external conditions under which everything is to appear. We therefore embraced the opposite resolution of getting rid of the French language altogether, and of directing ourselves more than ever with might and earnestness to our own mother tongue. And for this we found opportunity and sympathy in actual life. Alsace had not been connected with France so long that an affection adherence to the old constitution, manners, language and costume did not still exist with young and old. If the conquered party loses half his existence by compulsion, he looks upon it as disgraceful voluntarily to part with the other half, he therefore holds fast to all that can recall to him the good old time, and foster in him the hope that a better epoch will return. Very many inhabitants of Strasbourg formed little circles, separate indeed, but nevertheless united in spirit, which were always increased and recruited by the numerous subjects of German princes who held considerable lands under French sovereignty since fathers and sons, either for the sake of study or business, resided for a longer or shorter time at Strasbourg. At our table nothing but German was spoken. 
Zaldsman expressed himself in French with much fluency and elegance, but with respect to his endeavours and acts was a perfect German. Lasser might have been set up as a pattern of a German youth. Meyer of Lindau liked to get on with good German too well to shine in good French, and if among the rest many were inclined to the Gallic speech and manners, they yet, while they were with us, allowed the general tone to prevail with them. From the language we turned to political affairs. We had not indeed much to say in praise of our own imperial constitution. We granted that it consisted of mere legal contradictions, but exalted ourselves so much the more above the present French constitution, which lost itself in mere lawless abuses while the government only showed its energy in the wrong place, and was forced to admit that a complete change in affairs was already publicly prophesied, with black forebodings. If, on the other hand, we looked towards the north, we were shone upon by Frederick, the polar star, who seemed to turn about himself Germany, Europe, nay, the whole world. His preponderance in everything was most strongly manifested when the Prussian exercise and even the Prussian stick was introduced into the French army. As for the rest, we forgave him his predilection for a foreign language, since we felt satisfaction that his French poets, philosophers and literateurs continued to annoy him, and often declared that he was to be considered and treated only as an intruder. But what more than all forcibly alienated us from the French was the unpolite opinion repeatedly maintained that the Germans in general, as well as the king, who was striving after French cultivation, were deficient in taste. With respect to this kind of talk, which followed every judgment like a burden, we endeavoured to solace ourselves with contempt but we could so much the less come to a clear understanding about it, as we were assured that Maynarche had already said that the French writers possessed everything but taste, and had also learned from the then living Paris that all the authors were wanting in taste, and that Voltaire himself could not escape this severest of reproaches. Having been before and often directed to nature, we would allow of nothing but truth and uprightness of feeling, and the quick, blunt expression of it. Friendship, love, and brotherhood of themselves are understood, was the watchword and cry of battle by which the members of our little academical horde used to know and enliven each other. This maxim lay at the foundation of all our social banquets, on the occasions of which we did not fail to pay many an evening visit to cousin Michel in his well-known Germanhood. Footnote. Michel is exactly to the Germans what John Bull is to the English translator. If in what has hitherto been described only external contingent causes and personal peculiarities are found, the French literature had in itself certain qualities which were rather repulsive than attractive to an aspiring youth. It was advanced in years and genteel, and by neither of these qualities can youth, which looks about for enjoyment of life and for freedom, be delighted. Since the sixteenth century, the course of French literature had never been seen to be completely interrupted. Nay, the internal and religious disturbances, as well as the external wars, had accelerated its progress, but, as we heard generally maintained, it was a hundred years ago that it had existed in its full bloom. Through favourable circumstances, they said, an abundant harvest had at once ripened and had been happily gathered in, so that the great talents of the eighteenth century had to be moderately contented with mere gleanings. In the meantime, however, much had become antiquated. First of all, comedy, which had to be freshened up to adapt itself, less perfectly indeed, but still with new interest, to
to actual life and manners of the tragedies many had vanished from the stage and voltaire did not let slip the important opportunity which offered of editing corneille's works that he might show how defective his predecessor had been whom according to the general voice he had not equalled and even this very voltaire the wonder of his time had grown old like the literature which for nearly a century he had animated and governed by his side still existed and vegetated many literateurs in a more or less active and happy old age who one by one disappeared the influence of society upon authors increased more and more for the best society consisting of persons of birth rank and property chose for one of their chief recreations literature which thus became quite social and genteel persons of rank and literateurs mutually cultivated and necessarily perverted each other for the genteel has always something excluding in its nature and excluding also was the french criticism being negative detracting and fault-finding the higher class made use of such judgments against the authors the authors with somewhat less decorum proceeded in the same manner against each other nay against their patrons if the public was not to be awed they endeavoured to take it by surprise or gain it by humility and thus apart from the movements which shook church and state to their inmost core there arose such a literary ferment that voltaire himself stood in need of his full activity and his whole preponderance to keep himself above the torrent of general disesteem already he was openly called an old capricious child his endeavours carried on indefatigably were regarded as the vain efforts of a decrepit age certain principles on which he had stood during his whole life and to the spread of which he had devoted his days were no more held in esteem and honour nay his deity by acknowledging whom he continued to declare himself free from atheism was not conceded him and thus he himself the grand sire and patriarch was forced like his youngest competitor to watch the present moment to catch at new power to do his friends too much good and his enemies too much harm and under the appearance of a passionate striving for the love of truth to act deceitfully and falsely was it worth the trouble to have led such a great act of life if it was to end in greater dependence than it had begun how insupportable such a position was did not escape his high mind his delicate sensibility he often relieved himself by leaps and thrusts gave the reins to his humour and carried a few of his sword cuts too far at which friends and enemies for the most part showed themselves indignant for every one thought he could play the superior to him though no one could equal him a public which only hears the judgment of old men becomes over wise too soon and nothing is more unsatisfactory than a mature judgment adopted by an immature mind to us youths before whom with our german love of truth and nature honesty towards both ourselves and others hovered as the best guide both in life and learning the factious dishonesty of voltaire and the perversion of so many worthy subjects became more and more annoying and we daily strengthened ourselves in our aversion from him he could never have done with degrading religion and the sacred books for the sake of injuring priestcraft as they called it and had thus produced to me many an unpleasant sensation Footnote. um den sogenannten pfaffen zu schaden as we have not the word for a priest which exactly expresses the contempt involved in pfaffer the word priestcraft has been introduced translator 
but when I now learned that to weaken the tradition of a deluge he had denied all petrified shells and only admitted them as lusus naturae he entirely lost my confidence for my own eyes had on the Bashberg plainly enough shown me that I stood on the bottom of an old dried up sea among the exuvia of its original inhabitants these mountains had certainly been once covered with waves whether before or during the deluge did not concern me it was enough that the valley of the rhine had been a monstrous lake a bay extending beyond the reach of the eyesight out of this i was not to be talked i thought much more of advancing in the knowledge of lands and mountains let what would be the result french literature then had grown old and genteel in itself and through voltaire let us devote some further consideration to this remarkable man from his youth upwards voltaire's wishes and endeavours have been directed to an active and social life to politics to gain on a large scale to a connection with the heads of the earth and a profitable use of this connection that he himself might be one of the heads of the earth also no one has easily made himself so dependent for the sake of being independent he even succeeded in subjugating minds the nation became his own in vain did his opponents unfold their moderate talents and their monstrous hate nothing succeeded in injuring him the court he could never reconcile to himself but by way of compensation foreign kings were his tributaries catherine and frederick the great gustavus of sweden christian of denmark poniatowski of poland henry of prussia charles of brunswick acknowledged themselves his vassals even popes thought they must coax him by some acts of indulgence that joseph the second had kept aloof from him did not at all redound to the honour of this prince for it would have done no harm to him and his undertakings if with such a fine intellect and with such noble views he had been somewhat more practically clever and a better appreciator of the mind footnote practically clever is put as a kind of equivalent for the difficult word geistreich translator what i have here stated in a compressed form and in some connection sounded at that time as a cry of the moment as a perpetual discord unconnected and uninstructive in our ears nothing was heard but the praise of those who had gone before something good and new was required but the newest was never liked scarcely had a patriot exhibited on the long inanimate stage national french heart inspiring subjects scarcely had the siege of calais gained enthusiastic applause than the peace together with all its national comrades was considered empty and in every sense objectionable the delineations of manners by Destouches, which had so often delighted me when a boy were called weak the name of this honest man had passed away and how many authors could i not point out for the sake of whom i had to endure the reproach that i judged like a provincial if i showed any sympathy for such men in their works in opposition to any one who was carried along by the newest literary torrent thus to our other german comrades we became more and more annoying according to our view according to the peculiarity of our own nature we had to retain the impressions of objects to consume them but slowly and if it was to be so to let them go as late as possible we were convinced that by faithful observation by continued occupation something might be gained from all things and that by persevering zeal we must at last arrive at a point where the ground of the judgment may be expressed at the same time with the judgment itself neither did we fail to perceive that the great and noble french world offered us many an advantage and much profit for rousseau 
had really touched our sympathies but if we considered his life and his fate he was nevertheless compelled to find the great reward for all he did in this that he could live unacknowledged and forgotten at paris if we heard the encyclopedists mentioned or opened a volume of their monstrous work we felt as if we were going between the innumerable moving spools and looms in a great factory where what with the mere creaking and rattling what with all the mechanism embarrassing both eyes and noses what with the mere incomprehensibility of an arrangement the parts of which work into each other in the most manifold way what with the contemplation of all that is necessary to prepare a piece of cloth we feel disgusted with the very coat which we wear upon our backs diderot was sufficiently akin to us as indeed in everything for which the french blame him he is a true german but even his point of view was too high his circle of vision was too extended for us to range ourselves with him and place ourselves at his side nevertheless his children of nature whom he continued to bring forward and dignify with great rhetorical art pleased us very much his brave poachers and smugglers enchanted us and this rabble afterwards throve but too well upon the german parnassus it was he also who like rousseau diffused a disgust of social life a quiet introduction to those monstrous changes of the world in which everything permanent appeared to sink however we ought now to put aside these considerations and to remark what influence these two men have had upon art even here they pointed even from here they urged us towards nature the highest problem of any art is to produce by appearance the illusion of a higher reality but it is a false endeavour to realise the appearance until at last only something commonly real remains as an ideal locality the stage by the application of the laws of perspective to coulisses ranged one behind the other had attained the greatest advantage and this very gain they now wished wantonly to abandon by shutting up the sides of the theatre and forming real room walls with such an arrangement of the stage the piece itself the actor's mode of playing in a word everything was to coincide and thus an entirely new theatre was to arise the french actors had in comedy attained the summit of the true in art their residence at paris their observations of the externals of the court the connection of the actors and actresses with the highest classes by means of love affairs all contributed to transplant to the stage the greatest realness and seemliness of social life and on this point the friends of nature found but little to blame however they thought they made a great advance if they chose for their pieces earnest and tragical subjects in which the citizen life should not be wanting used pure verse for the higher mode of expression and thus banished unnatural verse together with unnatural declamation and gesticulation it is extremely remarkable and has not been generally noticed that at this time even the old severe rhythmical artistical tragedy was threatened with a revolution which could only be averted by great talents and the power of tradition in opposition to the actor le Quin, who played his heroes with a special theatrical decorum with deliberation elevation and force and kept himself aloof from the natural and ordinary came forward a man named Alfred, who declared war against everything unnatural and in his tragic acting sought to express the highest truth this mode might not have accorded with that of the other parisian actors he stood alone while they kept together and adhering to his views obstinately enough he chose to leave paris rather than alter them and came through strasbourg there we saw him playing the part of augustus in sinner that of mithridates and others of the sort 
with the truest and most natural dignity he appeared as a tall handsome man more slender than strong not properly speaking with an imposing but nevertheless with a noble pleasing demeanour his acting was well considered and quiet without being cold and forcible enough where force was required he was a very well practised actor and one of the few who know how to turn the artificial completely into nature and nature completely into the artificial it is really those few whose misunderstood good qualities always originate the doctrine of false naturalness and thus will i also make mention of a work which is indeed small but which made an epoch in a remarkable manner i mean rousseau's pygmalion a great deal could be said upon it for this strange production floats between nature and art with the full endeavour of resolving the latter into the former we see an artist who has produced what is most perfect and yet does not find any satisfaction in having according to art represented his idea externally to himself and given it to a higher life no it must also be drawn down to him into the earthly life he will destroy the highest thing that mind and deed have produced by the commonest act of sensuality all this and much else right and foolish true and half true operating upon us as it did still more perplexed our notions we were driven astray through many byways and roundabout ways and thus on many sides was prepared that german literary revolution of which we were witnesses and to which consciously or unconsciously willingly or unwillingly we unceasingly contributed we had neither impulse nor tendency to be illumined and advanced in a philosophical manner on religious subjects we thought we had sufficiently enlightened ourselves and therefore the violent contest of the french philosophers with the priesthood was tolerably indifferent to us prohibited books condemned to the flames which then made a great noise produced no effect upon us i mention as an instance to serve for all the systeme de la nature which we took in hand out of curiosity we did not understand how such a book could be dangerous it appeared to us so dark so cimmerian so death-like that we found it a trouble to endure its presence and shuddered at it as at a spectre the author fancies he gives his book a peculiar recommendation when he declares in his preface that as a decrepit old man just sinking into the grave he wishes to announce the truth to his cotemporaries and to posterity we laughed him out for we thought we had observed that by old people nothing in the world that is lovable and good is in fact appreciated old churches have dark windows to know how cherries and berries taste we must ask children and sparrows these were our jibes and maxims and thus that book as the very quintessence of senility appeared to us as unsavoury nay absurd all was to be of necessity so said the book and therefore there was no god but could there not be a god by necessity too asked we we indeed confessed at the same time that we could not withdraw ourselves from the necessities of day and night the seasons the influence of climate physical and animal conditions but nevertheless we felt within us something that appeared like perfect freedom of will and again something which sought to counterbalance this freedom the hope of becoming more and more rational of making ourselves more and more independent of external things nay of ourselves we could not give up the word freedom sounds so beautiful that we cannot do without it even though it designates an error 
none of us had read the book through for we found ourselves deceived in the expectations with which we had opened it a system of nature was announced and therefore we hoped to learn really something of nature our idol physics and chemistry descriptions of heaven and earth natural history and anatomy with much else had now for years and up to the last day constantly directed us to the great adorned world and we would willingly have heard both particulars and generals about suns and stars planets and moons mountains valleys rivers and seas with all that live and move in them that in the course of this much must occur which would appear to the common man as injurious to the clergy as dangerous and to the state as inadmissible we had no doubt and we hoped that the little book had not unworthily stood the fiery ordeal but how hollow and empty did we feel in this melancholy atheistical half-night in which earth vanished with all its images heaven with all its stars there was to be a matter in motion from all eternity and by this motion right and left and in every direction without anything further it was to produce the infinite phenomena of existence even all this we should have allowed to pass if the author out of his moved matter had really built up the world before our eyes but he seemed to know as little about nature as we did for having set up some general ideas he quits them at once for the sake of changing that which appears as higher than nature or as a higher nature within nature into material heavy nature which is moved indeed but without directional form and thus he fancies he has gained a great deal if after all this book did us any mischief it was this that we took a hearty dislike to all philosophy and especially metaphysics and remained in that dislike while on the other hand we threw ourselves into living knowledge experience action and poetizing with all the more liveliness and passion thus on the very borders of france we had at once got rid and clear of everything french about us the french way of life we found too defined and genteel their poetry cold their criticism annihilating their philosophy abstruse and yet insufficient so that we were on the point of resigning ourselves to rude nature at least by way of experiment if another influence had not for a long time prepared us for higher and freer views of the world and intellectual enjoyments as true as they were poetical and swayed us first moderately and secretly but afterwards with more and more openness and force end of section seven Section 8, Book 11, Part 4 of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Marcos. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2, From My Life, Poetry and Truth, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford, 1812-1877, to Book 11, Part 4 I need scarcely say that Shakespeare is intended, and having once said this, no more need be added. Shakespeare has been acknowledged by the Germans, more by them than by other nations, perhaps even more than by his own. We have richly bestowed on him all that justice, fairness and forbearance which we refuse to ourselves. Eminent men have occupied themselves in showing his talents in the most favourable light, and I have always readily subscribed to what has been said to his honour, in his favour or even by way of excuse for him. The influence of this extraordinary mind upon me has already been shown. An attempt has been made with respect to his works which has received approbation, 
and therefore this general statement may suffice for the present, until I am in a position to communicate to such friends as like to hear me a gleaning of reflections on his great deserts, such as I was tempted to insert in this very place. At present I will only show more clearly the manner in which I became acquainted with him. It happened pretty soon at Leipzig, through Dodd's Beauties of Shakespeare. Whatever may be said against such collections, which give authors in a fragmentary form, they nevertheless produce many good effects. We are not always so collected and so ready that we can take in a whole work according to its merits. Do we not, in a book, mark passages which have an immediate reference to ourselves? Young people especially, who are wanting in a thorough cultivation, are laudably excited by brilliant passages, and thus I myself remember, as one of the most beautiful epochs of my life, that which is characterised by the above-mentioned work. Those noble peculiarities, those great sayings, those happy descriptions, those humorous traits, all struck me singly and powerfully. Wieland's translation now made its appearance. It was devoured, communicated, and recommended to friends and acquaintances. We Germans had the advantage that many important works of foreign nations were first brought over to us in an easy and cheerful fashion. Shakespeare, translated in prose, first by Wieland, afterwards by Eschenberg, was able as a kind of reading universally intelligible and suitable to any reader to diffuse itself speedily and to produce a great effect. I revere the rhythm as well as the rhyme by which poetry first becomes poetry, but that which is really deeply and fundamentally effective, that which is really permanent and furthering, is that which remains of the poet when he is translated into prose. Then remains the pure, perfect substance, of which, when absent, a dazzling exterior often contrives to make a false show, and which, when present, such an exterior contrives to conceal. I therefore consider prose translations more advantageous than poetical for the beginning of youthful culture, for it may be remarked that boys, to whom everything must serve as a jest, delight themselves with the sound of words and the fall of syllables, and by a sort of paradistical wantonness destroy the deep contents of the noblest work. Hence I would have it considered whether a prose translation of Homer should not be next undertaken, though this, indeed, must be worthy of the degree at which German literature stands at present. I leave this, and what has been already said, to the consideration of our worthy pedagogues, to whom an extensive experience on this matter is most at command. I will only, in favour of my proposition, mention Luther's translation of the Bible, for the circumstance that this excellent man handed down a work composed in the most different styles, and gave us its poetical, historical, commanding didactic tone in our mother tongue, as if all were cast in one mould, has done more to advance religion than if he had attempted to imitate, in detail, the peculiarities of the original. In vain has been subsequent endeavour to make Job, the Psalms, and the other lyrical books capable of affording enjoyment in their poetical form. For the multitude, upon whom the effect is to be produced, a plain translation always remains the best. Those critical translations which vie with the original really only seem to amuse the learned among themselves. And thus in our Strasbourg society did Shakespeare, translated and in the original, by fragments and as a whole, by passages and by extracts, influence us in such a manner that as there are Bible-firm, Bibelfest men, so did we gradually make ourselves firm in Shakespeare, imitated in our conversations those virtues and defects of his time with which he had made us so well acquainted, took the greatest delight in his quibbles. Footnote. This English word is used in the original. Trans. End footnote. And by translating them, nay, with original recklessness, sought to emulate him. To this... The fact that I had seized upon him above all, with great enthusiasm, did not a little contribute. A happy confession that something higher waved over me was infectious for my friends, who all resigned themselves to this mode of thought. We did not deny the possibility of knowing such merits more closely, 
of comprehending them, of judging them with penetration, but this we reserved for later epochs. At present we only wish to sympathise gladly, and to imitate with spirit, and while we had so much enjoyment, we did not wish to inquire and haggle about the man who afforded it, but unconditionally to revere him. If any one would learn immediately what was thought, talked about, and discussed in this lively society, let him read Herder's essay on Shakespeare, in the part of his works upon the German manner and art, Über deutsche Art und Kunst, and also Lenz's remarks on the theatre, Anmerkungen Uber's Theatre, to which a translation of Love's Labours Lost was added. Footnote. A complete edition of Lenz's works was published by Tieck in 1828. In that will be found the essay and play in question, to the last of which he gives the name Amor Ninsit Omnia. Trans. End footnote. Herder penetrates into the deepest interior of Shakespeare's nature and exhibits it nobly. Lenz conducts himself more like an iconoclast against the traditions of the theatre, and will have everything everywhere treated in Shakespeare's manner. Since I have had occasion to mention this clever and eccentric man here, it is the place to say something about him by way of experiment. I did not become acquainted with him till towards the end of my residence at Strasbourg. We saw each other seldom, his company was not mine, but we sought an opportunity of meeting, and willingly communicated with each other, because, as contemporary youths, we harboured similar views. He had a small but neat figure, a charming little head, to the elegant form of which his delicate but somewhat flat features perfectly corresponded, blue eyes, blonde hair, in short, a person such as I have from time to time met among northern youths, a soft and as it were cautious step, a pleasant but not quite flowing speech, and a conduct which, fluctuating between reserve and shyness, well became a young man. Small poems, especially his own, he read very well aloud. For his turn of mind, I only know the English word whimsical, which, as the dictionary shows, comprises very many singularities under one notion. No one, perhaps, was more capable than he to feel and imitate the extravagances and excrescences of Shakespeare's genius. To this the translation above mentioned bears witness. He treated his author with great freedom, was not in the least close and faithful, but he knew how to put on the armour, or rather the motley jacket of his predecessor so very well, to adapt himself with such humour to his gestures, that he was certain to obtain applause from those who were interested in such matters. The absurdities of the clowns especially constituted our whole happiness, and we praised Lenz as a favoured man when he succeeded in rendering as follows the epitaph on the deer shot by the princess. Die schöne Prinzessin schoss und traf eines jungen Hirschleins Leben, es fiel dahin in schweren Schlaf und wird ein Prattlein geben. Der Jagdhund Bull, ein El zu Hirsch, so wird es denn ein Hirschel, doch ses ein Romisch El zu Hirsch, so macht es funzig Hirschel. Ich mache hundert Hirsche draus, Schreibe Hirschel mit zwei Jelen. Footnote. The lines in Shakespeare, which the above are intended to imitate, are the following. The praiseful princess pierred and pricked a pretty pleasing pricket. Some say a saw, but not a saw till now made saw with shooting. The dogs did yell, put L to saw, then sorrel jumps from thicket or pricket. Saw, or else sorrel, the people fall a-hooting. If saw be saw, then L to saw makes fifty saws, O saw L. Of one saw I an hundred make, by adding but one more L. Lenz's words, which cannot be rendered intelligibly into English, furnish an instance of Goethe's meaning, when he commends Lenz as happily catching the spirit of the original, without the slightest pretense to accuracy. Trans. End footnote. The tendency towards the absurd, which displays itself free and unfettered in youth, but afterwards recedes more into the background, without being on that account utterly lost, was in full bloom among us, 
and we sought even by original jest to celebrate our great master. We were very proud when we could lay before the company something of the kind, which was in any degree approved, as for instance the following on a riding master, who had been hurt on a wild horse. A rider in this house you'll find, a master too is he, the two into a nosegay bind twill riding master be. If master of the ride I was, full well he bears the name, but if the ride the master is, on him and his be shame. Footnote. The above doggerel is pretty faithful, but it is as well to give the original. Ein Ritter wohnt in Dysum House, ein Meister auch den Neben, macht man davon einen Blumenstrauß, so wird's ein Rittmeister geben. Ist er nun Meister von dem Ritt, führt er mit Recht den Namen, doch nimmt der Ritt den Meister mit, wer ichen und seinem Samen. Trans. End footnote. About such things serious discussions were held as to whether they were worthy of the clown or not, whether they flowed from the genuine pure full spring, and whether sense and understanding had at all mingled in an unfitting and inadmissible manner. Altogether our singular views were diffused with the greater ardour, and more persons were in a position to sympathise with them, as Lessing, in whom great confidence was placed, had, properly speaking, given the first signal in his dramaturgy. In a society so attuned and excited, I managed to take many a pleasant excursion into Upper Alsace, whence, however, on this very account, I brought back no particular instruction. The number of little verses which flowed from us on that occasion, and which might serve to adorn a lively description of a journey, are lost. In the crossway of Molsheim Abbey we admired the painted windows, in the fertile spot between Kolmauer and Schlettstadt resounded some comic hymns to sailors, the consumption of so many fruits being circumstantially set forth and extolled, and the important question as to the free or restricted trade in them being very merrily taken up. At Entersheim we saw the monstrous aerolites hanging up in the church, and in accordance with the scepticism of the time, ridiculed the credulity of man, never suspecting that such airborne beings, if they were not to fall into our cornfields, were at any rate to be preserved in our cabinets. Of a pilgrimage to the Ottilienberg, accomplished with an hundred, nay a thousand of the faithful, I still love to think. Here, where the foundation wall of a Roman castle still remained, a count's beautiful daughter, of a pious disposition, was said to have dwelt among ruins and stony crevices. Near the chapel where the wanderers edify themselves, her well is shown, and much that is beautiful is narrated. The image which I formed of her, and her name, made a deep impression upon me. I carried both about with me for a long time, until at last I endowed with them one of my later, but not less beloved, daughters. Footnote. By this daughter he means Ottilie, in the elective affinities, trans, end footnote who was so favourably received by pure and pious hearts. On this eminence also is repeated to the eye the majestic Alsace, always the same and always new. Just as in an amphitheatre, let one take one's place where one will, one surveys the whole people, but sees one's neighbours the plainest. So it is here, with bushes, rocks, hills, woods, fields, meadows, and districts near and in the distance. They wished to show us even Basil in the horizon. That we saw it I will not swear, but the remote blue of the Swiss mountains even here exercised its rights over us, by summoning us to itself, and since we could not follow the impulse by leaving a painful feeling. To such distractions and cheerful recreations I abandoned myself the more readily, and even with a degree of intoxication, because my passionate connection with Frederica now began to trouble me. Such a youthful affection cherished at random may be compared to a bombshell thrown at night, which rises with a soft, brilliant light, mingles with the stars, nay, for a moment, seems to pause among them, then in descending describes the same path in the reverse direction, and at last brings destruction to the place where it has terminated its course. 
Frederica always remained equal to herself. She seemed not to think, nor to wish to think, that the connection would so soon terminate. Olivia, on the contrary, who indeed also missed me with regret, but nevertheless did not lose so much as the other, had more foresight, or was more open. She often spoke to me about my probable departure, and sought to console herself both on her own and her sister's account. A girl who renounces a man to whom she has not denied her affections is far from being in that painful situation in which a youth finds himself who has gone so far in his declarations to a lady. He always plays a pitiful part, since a certain survey of his situation is expected of him as a growing man, and a decided levity does not suit him. The reasons of a girl who draws back always seem sufficient, those of a man never. But how should a flattering passion allow us to foresee whither it may lead us? For even when we have quite sensibly renounced it, we cannot get rid of it. We take pleasure in the charming habit, even if this is to be in an altered manner. Thus it was with me. Although the presence of Frederica pained me, I knew of nothing more pleasant than to think of her while absent, and to converse with her. I went to see her less frequently, but our correspondence became so much the more animated. She knew how to bring before me her situation with cheerfulness, her feelings with grace, and I called her merits to mind with fervour and with passion. Alsace made me free, and my whole affection first truly bloomed by this communication in the distance. At such moments I could quite blind myself as to the future, and was sufficiently distracted by the progress of time and of pressing business. I had hitherto made it possible to do the most various things by always taking a lively interest in what was present and belonged to the immediate moment, but towards the end all became too much crowded together, as is always the case when one is to free oneself from a place. One more event, which happened in an interval, took from me the last days. I found myself in a respectable society at a country house, whence there was a noble view of the front of the minster, and the tower which rises over it. It is a pity, said someone, that the whole was not finished, and that we have only one tower. It is just as unpleasant to me, answered I, to see this one tower not quite completed, for the four volutes leave off much too bluntly, there should have been upon them four light spires, with a higher one in the middle where the clumsy cross is standing. When I had expressed this strong opinion with my accustomed animation, a little lively man addressed me, and asked, Who told you so? The tower itself, I replied. I have observed it so long and so attentively, and have shown it so much affection, that it at last resolved to make me this open confession. It has not misinformed you, answered he. I am the best judge of that, for I am the person officially placed over the public edifices. We still have among our archives the original sketches, which say the same thing, and which I can show to you. On account of my speedy departure, I pressed him to show me this kindness as speedily as possible. He let me see the precious rolls. I soon, with the help of oiled paper, drew the spires, which were wanting in the building as executed, and regretted that I had not been sooner informed of this treasure. But this was always to be the case with me, that by looking at things and considering them, I should first attain a conception which perhaps would not have been so striking and so fruitful if it had been given ready-made. Amid all this pressure and confusion, I could not fail to see Frederica once more. Those were painful days, the memory of which has not remained with me. When I reached her, my hand from my horse, the tears stood in her eyes, and I felt very uneasy. I now rode along the footpath towards Drissenheim, and here one of the most singular forebodings took possession of me. I saw, not with the eyes of the body, but with those of the mind, my own figure coming towards me, on horseback, and on the same road, attired in a dress which I had never worn. It was pike grey, hecht grau, with somewhat of gold. As soon as I shook myself out of this dream, the figure had entirely disappeared. It is strange, however, that eight years afterwards, I found myself on the very road to pay one more visit to Frederica, in the dress of which I had dreamed, 
and which I wore, not from choice, but by accident. However it may be with matters of this kind generally, this strange illusion in some measure calmed me at the moment of parting. The pain of quitting for ever the noble Alsace, with all that I had gained in it, was softened, and having at last escaped the excitement of a farewell, I found myself on a peaceful and quiet journey, pretty well recovered. Arrived at Mannheim, I hastened with great eagerness to see the Hall of Antiquities, of which a great boast was made. Even at Leipzig, on the occasion of Winkelmann's and Lessing's writings, I had heard much said of those important works of art, but so much the less had I seen them, for except Laocoon, the father, and the fawn with the Crotola, there were no casts in the academy, and whatever Ursa chose to say to us on the subject of those works was enigmatical enough. How can a conception of the end of art be given to beginners? Director Verschaffel's reception was kind. I was conducted to the saloon by one of his associates, who, after he had opened it for me, left me to my own inclinations and reflections. Here I now stood, open to the most wonderful impressions, in a spacious, four-cornered, and with its extraordinary height, almost cubical saloon, in a space well lighted from above by the windows under the cornice, with the noblest statues of antiquity not only ranged along the walls, but also set up one with another over the whole area, a forest of statues, through which one was forced to wind, a great ideal popular assembly, through which one was forced to press. All these noble figures could, by opening and closing the curtains, be placed in the most advantageous light, and besides this, they were movable on their pedestals, and could be turned about at pleasure. After I had for a time sustained the first impression of this irresistible mass, I turned to those figures which attracted me the most, and who can deny that the Apollo Belvedere, with his well-proportioned colossal stature, his slender build, his free movement, his conquering glance, carried off the victory over our feelings in preference to all the others? I then turned to Lao Kun, whom I here saw for the first time in connection with his sons. I brought to mind as well as possible the discussions and contests which had been held concerning him, and tried to get a point of view of my own, but I was now drawn this way, now that. The dying gladiator long held me fast, but the group of Castor and Pollux, that precious though problematical relic, I had especially to thank for my happiest moments. I did not know how possible it was at once to account to oneself for a sight affording enjoyment. I forced myself to reflect, and little as I succeeded in attaining any sort of clearness, I felt that every individual figure from this great assembled mass was comprehensible, that every object was natural and significant in itself. Nevertheless, my chief attention was directed to Lao Kun, and I decided for myself the famous question, why he did not shriek, by declaring to myself that he could not shriek. All the actions and movements of the three figures proceeded, according to my view, from the first conception of the group. The whole position, as forcible as artistical, of the chief body was composed with reference to two impulses, the struggle against the snakes and the flight from the momentary bite. To soften this pain, the abdomen must be drawn in, and shrieking rendered impossible. Thus I also decided that the younger son was not bitten, and in other respects sought to elicit the artistical merits of this group. I wrote a letter on the subject to Ursa, who, however, did not show any special esteem for my interpretation, but only replied to my goodwill with general terms of encouragement. I was, however, fortunate enough to retain that thought, and to allow it to repose in me for several years, until it was at last annexed to the whole body of my experiences and convictions, in which sense I afterwards gave it in editing my Propylia. After a zealous contemplation of so many sublime plastic works, I was not to want a foretaste of antique architecture. I found the cast of a capital of the Rotunda, and do not deny that at the sight of those acanthus leaves, as huge as they were elegant, my faith in the northern architecture began somewhat to waver. 
This early sight, although so great and so effective throughout my whole life, was nevertheless attended with but small results in the time immediately following. How willingly would I have begun a book, instead of ending one, with describing it, for no sooner was the door of the noble saloon closed behind me than I wished to recover myself again, nay, I rather sought to remove those forms as cumbersome from my memory, and it was only by a long circuitous route that I was brought back into this sphere. However, the quiet fruitfulness is quite inestimable of those impressions, which are received with enjoyment and without dissecting judgment. Youth is capable of this highest happiness, if it will not be critical, but allows the excellent and the good to act upon it without investigation and division. End of section 8section nine book twelve part one of the autobiography of goethe volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of goethe volume two from my life poetry and truth by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by john oxenford 1812 to 1877 book 12 part 1 the wanderer had now at last reached home more healthy and cheerful than on the first occasion but still in his whole being there appeared something overstrained which did not fully indicate mental health at the very first i put my mother into the position that between my father's sincere spirit of order in my own various eccentricities she was forced to occupy herself with bringing passing events into a certain medium at Mainz, a harp-playing boy had so well pleased me that as the fair was close at hand i invited him to frankfurt and promised to give him lodging and to encourage him in this occurrence appeared once more that peculiarity which has cost me so much in my lifetime namely that i liked to see younger people gather round me and attach themselves to me by which indeed i am at last encumbered with their fate one unpleasant experience after another could not reclaim me from this innate impulse which even at present and in spite of the clearest conviction threatens from time to time to lead me astray my mother clearer than myself plainly foresaw how strange it would appear to my father if a musical fair vagabond went from such a respectable house to taverns and drinking houses to earn his bread hence she provided him with board and lodging in the neighborhood i recommended him to my friends and thus the lad did not fare badly after several years i saw him again when he had grown taller and more clumsy without having advanced much in his art the good lady well contented with this first attempt at squaring and hushing up did not think that this art would immediately become completely necessary to her my father leading the contented life amid his old tastes and occupations was comfortable like one who in spite of all hindrances and delays carries out his plans i had now gained my degree and the first step to the further graduating course of citizen life was taken my disputation had obtained his applause a further examination of it and many a preparation for a future edition gave him occupation during my residence in alsace i had written many little poems essays notes on travel and several loose sheets he found amusement in bringing these under heads in arranging them and in devising their completion and was delighted with the expectation that my hitherto insuperable dislike to see any of these things printed would soon cease my sister had collected around her a circle of intelligent and amiable women without being domineering she dominated over all as her good understanding could overlook much and her good will could often accommodate matters moreover she was in the position of playing the confidant rather than the rival 
of my older friends and companions i found in horn the unalterably true friend and cheerful associate i also became intimate with reese who did not fail to practice and try my acuteness by opposing with the persevering contradiction doubt and negation to a dogmatic enthusiasm into which i too readily fell others by degrees entered into this circle whom i shall afterwards mention but among the persons who rendered my new residence in my native city pleasant and profitable the brother schlosser certainly stood at the head the elder Hieronymus, a profound and elegant jurist enjoyed universal confidence as counsellor his favourite abode was amongst his books and papers in rooms where the greatest order prevailed there i have never found him otherwise than cheerful and sympathising in a larger society also he shows himself agreeable and entertaining for his mind by extensive reading was adorned with all the beauty of antiquity he did not on occasion disdain to increase the social pleasures by agreeable latin poems and i still possess several sportive distiches which he wrote under some portraits drawn by me of strange and generally known frankfurt caricatures often i consulted with him as to the course of life and business i was now commencing and if an hundredfold inclinations and passions had not torn me from this path he would have been my surest guide nearer to me in point of age was his brother george who had again returned from treptow from the service of the duke eugenie of Württemberg while he had advanced in knowledge of the world and in practical talent he had not remained behindhand in a survey of german and foreign literature he liked as before to write in all languages but did not further excite me in this respect as i devoted myself exclusively to german and only cultivated other languages so far as to enable me in some measure to read the best authors in the original his honesty showed itself the same as ever nay his acquaintance with the world may have occasioned him to adhere with more severity and even obstinacy to his well-meaning views through these two friends i very soon became acquainted with merck to whom i had not been unfavorably announced by herder from strasbourg this strange man who had the greatest influence on my life was a native of darmstadt of his early education i can say but little after finishing his studies he conducted a young man to switzerland where he remained for some time and came back married when i made his acquaintance he was military paymaster at darmstadt born with mind and understanding he had acquired much elegant knowledge especially in modern literature and had paid attention to all times and places in the history of the world and of man he had the talent of judging with certainty and acuteness he was prized as a thorough decisive man of business and a ready accountant with ease he gained an entrance everywhere as a very pleasant companion for those to whom he had not rendered himself formidable by sarcasms his figure was long and lean a sharp prominent nose was remarkable light blue perhaps gray eyes gave something tiger-like to his glance which wandered attentively here and there lavater's physiognomy has preserved his profile for us in his character there was a wonderful contradiction by nature a good noble upright man he had embittered himself against the world and allowed this morbid whim to sway him to such a degree that he felt an irresistible inclination to be wilfully a rogue or even a villain sensible quiet kind at one moment it might strike him in the next just as a snail puts out its horns to do something which might hurt wound or even injure another yet as one readily associates with something dangerous when one believes oneself safe from it i felt so much the greater inclination to live with him and to enjoy his good qualities since a confident feeling allowed me to suspect that he would not turn his bad side towards me while now by this morally restless mind by this necessity of treating men in a malignant and spiteful way 
he on one side destroyed social life another disquiet which also he very carefully fostered within himself opposed his internal comfort namely he felt a certain dilettantish impulse to production in which he indulged the more readily as he expressed himself easily and happily in prose and verse and might well venture to play a part among the beau esprits of the time i myself still possess poetical epistles full of uncommon boldness force and swift like gall which are highly remarkable from their original views of persons and things but are at the same time written with such wounding power that i could not publish them even at present but must either destroy them or preserve them for posterity as striking documents of the secret discord in our literature however the fact that in all his labors he went to work negatively and destructively was unpleasant to himself and he often declared that he envied me that innocent love of setting forth a subject which arose from the pleasure i took both in the original and the imitation for the rest his literary dilettantism would have been rather useful than injurious to him if he had not felt an irresistible impulse to enter also into the technical and mercantile department for when he once began to curse his faculties and was beside himself that he could not with sufficient genius satisfy his claims to a practical talent he gave up now plastic art now poetry and thought of mercantile and manufacturing undertakings which were to bring in money while they afforded him amusement in darmstadt there was besides a society of very cultivated men privy councillor von hess minister of the landgrave professor peterson rector Venk, and others were the naturalized persons whose worth attracted by turns many neighbors from other parts and many travelers through the city the wife of the privy councillor and her sister demoiselle flachland were ladies of uncommon merit and talent the latter who was betrothed to herder being doubly interesting from her own qualities and her attachment to so excellent a man how much i was animated and advanced by this circle is not to be expressed they readily heard me read aloud my completed or begun works they encouraged me when i openly and circumstantially told what i was then planning and blamed me when on every new occasion i laid aside what i had already commenced faust had already advanced goetz von berlichingen was gradually building itself up in my mind the study of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries occupied me and the minister had left in me a very serious impression which could well stand as a background to such poetical inventions what i had thought and imagined with respect to that style of architecture i wrote in a connected form the first point on which i insisted was that it should be called german not gothic that it should be considered not foreign but native the second point was that it could not be compared with the architecture of the greeks and romans because it sprang from quite another principle if these living under a more favorable sky allowed their roof to rest upon columns a wall broken through arose of its own accord we however who must always protect ourselves against the weather and everywhere surround ourselves with walls have to revere the genius who discovered the means of endowing massive walls with variety of apparently breaking them through and of thus occupying the eye in a worthy and pleasing manner on the broad surface the same principle applied to the steeples which are not like cupolas to form a heaven within but to strive towards heaven without and to announce to the countries far around the existence of the sanctuary which lies at their base the interior of these venerable piles i only ventured to touch by poetical contemplation and a pious tone if i had been pleased to write down these views the value of which i will not deny clearly and distinctly in an intelligible style the paper on german architecture 
D. M. Erwini, a Steinbach, would then, when I published it, have produced more effect, and would sooner have drawn the attention of the native friends of art. But, misled by the example of Herder and Hamann, I obscured these very simple thoughts and observations by a dusty cloud of words and phrases, and both for myself and others darkened the light which had arisen within me. However, the paper was well received, and reprinted in Herder's work on German manner and art. If now, partly from inclination, partly with poetical and other views, I very readily occupied myself with the antiquities of my country, and sought to render them present to my mind, I was from time to time distracted from this subject by biblical studies and religious sympathies, since Luther's life and deeds, which shined forth so magnificently in the sixteenth century, always necessarily brought me back to the holy scriptures, and to the observation of religious feelings and opinions. To look upon the Bible as a work of compilation, which had gradually arisen and had been elaborated at different times, was flattering to my little self-conceit, since this view was then by no means predominant, much less was it received in the circle in which I lived. With respect to the chief sense, I adhered to Luther's expression. In matters of detail, I went to Schmidt's literal translation, and sought to use my little Hebrew as well as possible. That there are contradictions in the Bible, no one will now deny. These they sought to reconcile by laying down the plainest passage as a foundation and endeavoring to assimilate to that those that were contradictory and less clear. I, on the contrary, wished to find out by examination what passage best expressed the sense of the matter. To this I adhered and rejected the rest as interpolated for a fundamental opinion had already confirmed itself in me without my being able to say whether it had been imparted to me or had been excited in me or had arisen from my own reflection it was this that in anything which is handed down to us especially in writing the real point is the ground the interior the sense the tendency of the work that here lies the original the divine, the effective, the intact, the indestructible, and that no time, no external operation or condition can in any degree affect this internal primeval nature, at least no more than the sickness of the body affects a well-cultivated soul. Thus, according to my view, the language, the dialect, the peculiarity, the style, and finally, the writing were to be regarded as the body of every work of mine. That this body, although nearly enough akin to the internal, was yet exposed to deterioration and corruption, as indeed altogether no tradition can be given quite pure according to its nature, nor indeed, if one were given pure, could it be perfectly intelligible at every following period the former on account of the insufficiency of the organs through which the tradition is made the latter on account of the difference of time and place but especially the diversity of human capacities and modes of thought for which reason and interpreters themselves never agree hence it is everybody's affair to seek out for what is internal and peculiar in a book which particularly interests us and at the same time, above all things, to weigh in what relation it stands to our own inner nature, and how far, by that vitality, our own is excited and rendered fruitful. On the contrary, everything external, that is, ineffective with respect to ourselves, or is subject to a doubt, is to be consigned over to criticism which, even if it should be able to dislocate and dismember the whole, would never succeed in depriving us of the only ground to which we hold fast, nor even in perplexing us for a moment with respect to our once-formed confidence. This conviction, sprung from faith and right, 
which in all cases that we recognize as the most important is applicable and strengthening lies at the foundation of the moral as well as the literary edifice of my life and is to be regarded as a well-invested and richly productive capital although in particular cases we may be seduced into making an erroneous application by this notion the bible first became really accessible to me i had as is the case in the religious instruction of protestants run through it several times nay had made myself acquainted with it by way of leaps from beginning to end and back again the blunt naturalness of the old testament and the tender naivete of the new had attracted me in particular instances as a whole indeed it never properly appealed to me but the diverse characters of the different books no more perplexed me i knew how to represent to myself their significance faithfully and in proper order and had too much feeling for the book to be ever able to do without it by this very side of feeling i was protected against all scoffing because i saw its dishonesty at once i not only detested it but could even fall in a rage about it and i still perfectly remember that in my childish fanatical zeal i should have completely throttled voltaire on account of his saw if i had only got hold of him on the other hand every kind of honest investigation pleased me greatly the revelations as to the locality and costume of the east which diffused more and more light I received with joy and continued to exercise all my acuteness on such valuable traditions it is known that at an earlier period i sought to initiate myself into the situation of the world as described to us by the first book of moses as i now thought to proceed stepwise and in proper order i seized after a long interruption on the second book but what a difference just as the fullness of childhood had vanished from my life so did i find the second book separated from the first by a monstrous chasm the utter forgetfulness of a bygone time is already expressed in the few important words now there arose a new king over egypt which knew not joseph but the people also innumerable as the stars of heaven had almost forgotten the ancestor to whom under the starry heaven jehovah had made the very promise which was now fulfilled i worked through the five books with unspeakable trouble and insufficient means and powers and in doing this fell upon the strangest notions i thought i had discovered that it was not our ten commandments which stood upon the tables that the israelites did not wander through the desert for forty years but only for a short time and thus i fancied that i could give entirely new revelations as to the character of moses even the new testament was not safe from my inquiries with my passion for dissection i did not spare it but with love and affection i chimed in with that wholesome word Quote, the evangelists may contradict each other provided only the gospel does not contradict itself End quote. in this region also i thought i should make all sorts of discoveries that gift of tongues imparted at pentecost with luster and clearness i interpreted for myself in a somewhat abstruse manner not adapted to procure many adherents into one of the chief lutheran doctrines which had been still more sharpened by the hern hunters namely that of regarding the sinful principle as predominant in man i endeavored to accommodate myself but without remarkable success nevertheless i had made the terminology of this doctrine tolerably my own and made use of it in a letter which in the character of country pastor i was pleased to send to a brother in office however the chief theme in the paper was that watchword of the time called toleration which prevailed among the better order of brains and minds 
such things which were produced by degrees i had printed at my own cost in the following year to try myself with the public made presents of them or sent them to eichenberg's shop in order to get rid of them as fast as possible without deriving any profit myself here and there a review mentions them now favorably now unfavorably but they soon passed away my father kept them carefully in his archives otherwise i should not have possessed a copy of them i shall add these as well as some things of the kind which i have found to the new edition of my works since i had really been seduced into the sibylline style of such papers as well as into the edition of them by Hamann, this seems to me a proper place to make mention of this worthy and influential man who was then a great mystery to us as he has already remained to his native country his socratic memorabilia was more especially liked by those persons who could not adapt themselves to the dazzling spirit of the time it was suspected that he was a profound well-grounded man who accurately acquainted with the public world and with literature allowed of something mysterious and unfathomable and expressed himself on this subject in a manner quite his own by those who then ruled the literature of the day he was indeed considered an abstruse mystic but an aspiring youth suffered themselves to be attracted by him even the quote, quiet in the hands end quote, as they were called half in jest half in earnest those pious souls who without professing themselves members of any society formed an invisible church turned their attention to him while to my friend frulein von klettenberg and no less to her friend moser the magus from the north was a welcome apparition people put themselves the more in connection with him when they had learned that he was tormented by narrow domestic circumstances but nevertheless understood how to maintain this beautiful and lofty mode of thought with the great influence of president von moser it would have been easy to provide a tolerable and convenient existence for such a frugal man the matter was set on foot nay so good an understanding and mutual approval was attained that Hamann undertook the long journey from konigsberg to darmstadt but as the president happened to be absent that odd man no one knows on what account returned at once though a friendly correspondence was kept up i still possess two letters from the konigsberger to his patron which bear testimony to the wondrous greatness and sincerity of their author but so good an understanding was not to last long these pious men had thought the other one pious in their own fashion they had treated him with reverence as the magus of the north and thought that he would continue to exhibit himself with a reverend demeanor but already in the clouds an afterpiece of socratic memorabilia he had given some offence and when he now published the crusades of a philologist on the title page of which was to be seen not only the goat profile of a horned pan but also on one of the first pages a large cock cut in wood and setting time to some young cockerels who stood before him with notes in their claws made an exceedingly ridiculous appearance by which certain church music of which the author did not approve was to be made a laughing stock there arose among well-minded and sensitive people a dissatisfaction which was exhibited to the author who not being edified by it shunned a closer connection our attention to this man was however always kept alive by herder who remaining in correspondence with us and his bride communicated to us at once all that proceeded from that extraordinary man to these belonged his critiques and notices inserted in the konigsberg zeitung all of which bore a very singular character i possess an almost complete collection of his works 
and a very important essay on Herder's prize paper concerning the origin of language, in which, in the most peculiar manner, he throws flashes of light upon this specimen of Herder. I do not give up the hope of superintending myself, or at least furthering an edition of Hamann's work, and then when these documents are again before the public, it will be time to speak more closely of the author, his nature and character. In the meantime, however, I will here adduce something concerning him, especially as eminent men are still living who felt a great regard for him, and whose assent or correction will be very welcome to me. The principle to which all Hamann's expressions may be referred is this. Quote, all that man undertakes to perform, whether by deed or word, or otherwise, must proceed from all his powers united. Everything isolated is worthless. End quote. A noble maxim, but hard to follow. To life and art it may indeed be applied, and in every communication by words, that is not exactly poetic, there is, on the contrary, a grand difficulty for word must sever itself isolate itself to say or signify anything man while he speaks must for the moment become one-sided there is no communication no instruction without severing now since Hamann once for all opposed this separation and because he felt imagined and thought in unity chose to speak in unity likewise and to require the same of others he came into opposition with his own style and with all that others produced to produce the impossible he therefore grasps at every element the deepest and most mystical contemplations in which nature and mind meet each other illuminating flashes of the understanding which beam forth from such a contact significant images which float in these regions forcible aphorisms from sacred and profane writers with whatever else of a humorous kind could be added all this forms the wondrous aggregate of his style and his communications if now one cannot associate oneself with him in his depths cannot wander with him on his heights cannot master the forms which float before him, cannot, from an infinitely extended literature, exactly find out the sense of a passage which is only hinted at, we find that the more we study him, the more dim and dark it becomes. And this darkness always increases with years, because his allusions were directed to certain definite peculiarities which prevail for the moment in life and in literature in my collection there are some of his printed sheets where he has cited with his own hand in the margin passages to which his hints refer if one opens them there is again a sort of equivocal double light which appears to us highly agreeable only one must completely renounce what is ordinarily called understanding such leaves merit to be called sibylline for this reason that one cannot consider them in and for themselves but must await for an opportunity to seek refuge with their oracles every time that one opens them one fancies one has found something new because the sense which abides in every passage touches and excites us in a curious manner personally i never saw him nor did I hold any immediate communication with him by means of letters. It seems to me that he was extremely clear in the relations of life and friendship, and that he had a correct feeling for the positions of persons among each other, and in reference to himself. All the letters which I saw by him were excellent, and much plainer than his works, because here the reference to time, circumstances, and personal affairs was more clearly prominent i thought however that i could discern this much generally that he feeling the superiority of his mental gifts in the most naive manner 
always considered himself somewhat wiser and more shrewd than his correspondents whom he treated rather ironically than heartily if this held good only to single cases it applied to the majority as far as my own observation went and was the cause that i never felt a desire to approach him on the other hand a kindly literary communication between herder and us was maintained with great vivacity though it was a pity that he could not keep himself quiet but herder never left off teasing and scolding and much was not required to irritate mert who also contrived to excite me to impatience because now herder among all authors and men seemed to respect swift the most he was among us called the dean and this gave occasion to all sorts of perplexities and annoyances nevertheless we were highly pleased when we learned that he was to have an appointment at bukeberg which would bring him a double honor for his new position had the highest fame as a clear-headed and brave though eccentric man thomas abt had been known and celebrated in this service his country still mourned his death and was pleased with the monument which his patron had erected for him now herder in the place of the untimely deceased was to fulfil all those hopes which his predecessor had so worthily excited the epoch in which this happened gave a double brilliancy and value to such an appointment for several german princes already followed the example of the count of lippi inasmuch as they took into their service not merely learned men and men of business properly so called but also persons of mind and promise thus it was said klopstock had been invited by the margrave charles of baden not for real business but that by his presence he might impart a grace and be useful to the higher society as now the regard felt for this excellent prince who paid attention to all that was useful and beautiful increased in consequence so also was the veneration for klopstock not a little heightened everything that emanated from him was held dear and valuable and we carefully wrote down his odes and elegies as we could get them we were therefore highly delighted when the great Langrave caroline of hesse darmstadt made a collection of them and we obtained possession of one of the few copies which enabled us to complete our own manuscript collection hence those first readings have long been most in favour with us nay we have often refreshed and delighted ourselves with poems which the author afterwards rejected so true it is that the life which presses forth out of a fine soul works with the greater freedom the less it appears to be drawn by criticism into the department of art klopstock by his character and conduct had managed to attain regard and dignity both for himself and for other men of talent now they were also if possible to be indebted to him for the security and improvement of their domestic condition for the book trade in the previous period had more to do with important scientific books belonging to the different faculties with stock works for which a moderate remuneration was paid but the production of poetical works was looked upon as something sacred and in this case the acceptance or increase of any remuneration would have been regarded almost as simony authors and publishers stood in the strangest reciprocal position both appeared accordingly as it was taken as patrons and clients the authors who irrespectively of their talent were generally respected and revered by the public as highly moral men had a mental rank and felt themselves rewarded by the success of their labors the publishers were well satisfied with the second place and enjoyed a considerable profit but now opulence again set the rich bookseller above the poor poet and thus everything stood in the most beautiful equilibrium 
magnanimity and gratitude were not unfrequent on either side Breitkopf and gottsched lived all their lives as inmates of the same house stinginess and meanness especially that of piracy were not yet in vogue nevertheless a general commotion had arisen among the german authors they compared their own very moderate if not poor condition with the wealth of the eminent booksellers they considered how great was the fame of a galere of a rabbinaire and in what narrow domestic circumstances an universally esteemed german poet must struggle on if he did not render life easy by some other calling even the mediocre and lesser minds felt a strong desire to see their situation improved to make themselves free of the publishers now klopstock came forward and offered his republic of letters Galerte republic for subscription although the latter cantos of the messiah partly on account of their subject partly on account of the treatment could not produce the same effect as the earlier ones which themselves pure and innocent came into a pure and innocent time the same respect was always maintained for the poet who by the publication of his odes had drawn to himself the hearts minds and feelings of many persons many well-thinking men among whom were several of great influence offered to secure payment beforehand this was fixed at a louis de or the object being it was said not so much to pay for the book as on this occasion to reward the author for his services to his country now every one pressed forward even youths and young girls who had not much to expend opened their saving boxes men and women the higher and the middle classes contributed to this holy offering and perhaps a thousand subscribers all paying in advance were collected expectation was raised to the highest pitch and confidence was as great as possible after this the work on its appearance was compelled to experience the strangest result in the world it was indeed of important value but by no means universally interesting klopstock's thoughts on poetry and literature were set forth in the form of an old german druidical republic his maxims on the true and false were expressed in pithy laconic aphorisms in which however much that was instructive was sacrificed to the singularity of form for authors and literateurs the book was and is invaluable but it was only in this circle that it could be useful and effective he who had thought himself followed the thinker he who knew how to seek and prize what was genuine found himself instructed by the profound honest man but the amateur the general reader was not enlightened to him the book remained sealed and yet it had been placed in all hands and while every one expected a perfectly servable work most of them obtained one from which they could not get the smallest taste the astonishment was general but the esteem for the man was so great that no grumbling scarcely a murmur arose the young and beautiful part of the world got over their loss and now freely gave away the copies they had so dearly purchased i received several from kind female friends but none of them have remained with me this undertaking which was successful to the author but a failure to the public had the ill consequence that there was now no further thought about subscriptions and prepayments nevertheless the wish had been too greatly diffused for the attempt not to be renewed the dessau publishing house now offered to do this on a large scale learned men and publishers were here by a close compact to enjoy both in a certain proportion the hoped-for advantage the necessity 
so long painfully felt again awakened a great confidence but this could not last long after a brief endeavor the parties separated with a loss on both sides End of section 9section ten book twelve part two of the autobiography of goethe volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Karina marcos the autobiography of goethe volume two from my life poetry and truth by johann wolfgang von goethe Translated by John Oxenford, 1812-1877 to Book 12, Part 2 However, a speedy communication among the friends of literature was already introduced. The Musenalmanach, footnote, annual publications devoted to poetry only, trans, end footnote, united all the young poets with each other, the journals united the poet with other authors. My own pleasure in production was boundless. To what I had produced I remained indifferent, only when, in social circles, I made it present to myself and others, my affection for it was renewed. Moreover, many persons took an interest in both my larger and smaller works, because I urgently pressed everyone who felt in any degree inclined and adapted to production to produce something independently, after his own fashion, and was, in turn, challenged by all to new poetising and writing. These mutual impulses, which were carried even to an extreme, gave every one a happy influence in his own fashion, and from this whirling and working, this living and letting live, this taking and giving, which was carried on by so many youths, from their own free hearts, without any theatrical guiding star, according to the innate character of each, and without any special design, arose that famed, extolled, and decried epoch in literature, when a mass of young genial men, with all that audacity and assumption which is peculiar to their own period of youth, produced by the application of their powers much that was good, and by the abuse of these much ill-feeling and mischief, and it is, indeed, the action and reaction which proceeded from this source that formed the chief theme of this volume. In what can young people take the highest interest? How are they to excite interest among those of their own age, if they are not animated by love, and if affairs of the heart, whatever kind they may be, are not living within them? I had in secret to complain of a love I had lost. This may be mild and tolerant, and more agreeable to society than in those brilliant times when nothing reminded me of a want or a fault, and I went storming along completely without restraint. Frederica's answer to a written adieu rent my heart. It was the same hand, the same tone of thought, the same feeling which had formed itself for me and by me. I now, for the first time, felt the loss which she suffered, and saw no means to supply it, or even to alleviate it. She was completely present to me. I always felt that she was wanting to me, and, what was worst of all, I could not forgive myself for my own misfortune. Gretchen had been taken away from me, Annette had left me, now for the first time I was guilty. I had wounded the most beautiful heart to its very depths, and the period of a gloomy repentance, with the absence of a refreshing love to which I had grown accustomed, was most agonising, nay, insupportable. But man will live, and hence I took an honest interest in others. I sought to disentangle their embarrassments, and to unite what was about to part, that they might not have the same lot as myself. They were hence accustomed to call me the confidant, and on account of wandering about the district, the wanderer. In producing that calm for my mind, which I felt under the open skies, in the valleys, on the heights, in the fields and in the woods, the situation of Frankfurt was serviceable as it lay in the middle between Darmstadt and Hamburg, two pleasant places which were on good terms with each other through the relationship of both courts. I accustomed myself to live on the road, 
and, like a messenger, to wander about between the mountains and the flat country. Often I went alone, or in company, through my native city, as if it did not at all concern me, dined at one of the great inns in the high street, and after dinner went further on my way. More than ever was I directed to the open world and to free nature. On my way I sang to myself strange hymns and dither rumbies, of which one was entitled The Wanderer's Storm Song. Wanderer's Sturmlied still remains. This half-nonsense I sang aloud, in an impassioned manner, when I have found myself in a terrific storm, which I was obliged to meet. My heart was untouched and unoccupied. I conscientiously avoided all closer connection with ladies, and thus it remained concealed from me, that, inattentive and unconscious as I was, an amiable spirit was secretly hovering round me. It was not until many years afterwards, nay, until after her death, that I learned of her secret heavenly love, in a manner that necessarily overwhelmed me. But I was innocent, and could purely and honestly pity an innocent being, nay, I could do this the more, as the discovery occurred at an epoch when, completely without passion, I had the happiness of living for myself, and my own intellectual inclinations. At the time when I was pained by my grief at Frederica's situation, I again, after my old fashion, sought aid from poetry. I again continued the poetical confession which I had commenced, that by this self-tormenting penance I might be worthy of an internal absolution. The two Marias in Gotts von Berlinkingen and Clarigo, and the two bad characters who play the part of their lovers, may have been the result of such penitent reflections. But as in youth one soon overcomes mental wounds and diseases, because a healthy system of organic life can rise up for a sick one, and allow it time to grow healthy again, corporeal exercises on many a favourable opportunity came forward with very advantageous effect, and I was excited in many ways to man myself afresh, and to seek new pleasures of life and enjoyments. Riding gradually took the place of those sauntering, melancholy, toilsome and at the same time tedious and aimless rambles on foot. One reached one's end more quickly, merrily and commodiously. The young people again introduced fencing, but in particular, on the setting in of winter, a new world was revealed to us, since I at once determined to skate, an exercise which I had never attempted, and in a short time, by practice, reflection, and perseverance, brought it as far as was necessary to enjoy with others a gay, animated course on the ice, without wishing to distinguish myself. For this new joyous activity we were also indebted to Klopstock, to his enthusiasm for this happy species of motion, which private accounts confirmed, while his odes gave an undeniable evidence of it. I still exactly remember that on a cheerful frosty morning I sprang out of bed and uttered aloud these passages. Already, glad with feeling of health, far down along the shore, I have whitened the covering crystal. How does the winter's advancing day softly illumine the lake? The night has cast the glittering frost like stars upon it. My hesitating and wavering resolution was fixed at once and I flew straight to the place where so old a beginner might with some degree of propriety make his first trial. And indeed, this manifestation of our strength well deserved to be commended by Klopstock, for it is an exercise which brings us into contact with the freshest childhood, summons the youth to the full enjoyment of his suppleness, and is fitted to keep off a stagnant old age. We were immoderately addicted to this pleasure, to pass thus a splendid Sunday on the ice did not satisfy us. We continued our movement late into the night. For as other exertions fatigue the body, so does this give it a constantly new power. The full moon rising from the clouds over the wide nocturnal meadows, which were frozen into fields of ice. The night breeze, which rustled towards us on our course. The solemn thunder of the ice, which sunk as the water decreased the strange echo of our own movements, rendered the scenes of Ossian just present to our minds. Now this friend, now that, uttered an ode of Klopstock's, in a declamatory recitative, 
and if we found ourselves together at dawn, the unfeigned praise of the author of our joys broke forth. And should he not be immortal, who found for us health and joys which the horse, though bold in his course, never gave, and which even the ball is without? Such gratitude is earned by a man who knows how to honour and worthily to extend an earthly act by spiritual incitement. And thus, as children of talent, whose mental gifts have, at an early period, been cultivated to an extraordinary degree, return, if they can, to the simplest sports of youth, did we, too, often forget our calling to more serious things. Nevertheless, this very motion, so often carried on in solitude, this agreeable soaring in undetermined space, again excited many of my internal wants, which had, for a time, lain dormant, and I have been indebted to such hours for a more speedy elaboration of older plans. The darker ages of German history had always occupied my desire for knowledge and my imagination. The thought of dramatising Goetz von Berlichingen, with all the circumstances of his time, was one which I much liked and valued. I industriously read the chief authors, to Dat's work, De Pace Publica, I devoted all my attention. I had sedulously studied it through, and rendered those singular details as visible to me as possible. These endeavours, which were directed to moral and poetical ends, I could also use in another direction, and I was now to visit Wetzlar. I had sufficient historical preparation, for the imperial chamber had arisen in consequence of the public tranquillity, and its history could serve as an important clue through the confused events of Germany. Indeed, the constitution of the courts and armies gives the most accurate insight into the constitution of every empire. Even the finances, the influence of which are considered so important, come much less under consideration. For if the whole is deficient, it is only necessary to take from the individual what he has laboriously scraped together, and thus the state is always sufficiently rich. What occurred to me at Wetzlar is of no great importance, but it may inspire a greater interest, if the reader will not disdain a cursory history of the imperial chamber, in order to render present to his mind the unfavourable moment at which I arrived there. The lords of the earth are such, principally because they can assemble around them, in war, the bravest and most resolute, and in peace the wisest and most just. Even to the state of a German emperor belonged a court of this kind, which always accompanied him in his expeditions through the empire. But neither this precaution, nor the Swabian law, which prevailed in the south of Germany, nor the Saxon law, which prevailed in the north, neither the judges appointed to maintain them, nor the decisions of the peers of the contending parties, neither the umpires recognised by agreement, nor friendly compacts instituted by the clergy. Nothing, in short, could quiet that excited chivalric spirit of feuds which had been roused, fostered, and made a custom among the Germans, by internal discord, by foreign campaigns, by the Crusades especially, and even by judicial usages. To the Emperor, as well as to the powerful estates, these squabbles were extremely annoying, while through them the less powerful became troublesome to each other, and if they combined, to the great also. All outward strength was paralysed, while internal order was destroyed, and besides this, a great part of the country was still encumbered with the Wehmgericht, of the horrors of which a notion may be formed, if we think that it degenerated into a secret police, which, at last, even fell into the hands of private persons. Many attempts to steer against these evils had been made in vain, until, at last, the estates urgently proposed a court formed from among themselves. This proposal, well meant as it might have been, nevertheless indicated an extension of the privileges of the estates, and a limitation of the imperial power. Under Frederick III, the matter is delayed. His son Maximilian, being pressed from without, complies. He appoints the chief judge, the estates send the assistants. There were to be four and twenty of them, but at first twelve are thought sufficient. An universal fault, of which men are guilty in their undertakings, 
was the first and perpetual fundamental defect of the imperial chamber. Insufficient means were applied to a great end. The number of the assessors was too small. How was the difficult and extensive problem to be solved by them? But who could urge an efficient arrangement? The emperor could not favour an institution which seemed to work more against him than for him. Far more reason had he to complete the formation of his own court, his own council. If, on the other hand, we regard the interest of the estates, all that they could properly have to do with was the stoppage of bloodshed. Whether the wound was healed did not so much concern them, and now there was to be, besides, a new expense. It may not have been quite plainly seen that by this institution every prince increased his retinue, for a decided end indeed, but who readily gives money for what is necessary? Every one would be satisfied if he could have what is useful for God's sake. At first the assistants were to live on fees, then followed a moderate grant from the estates. Both were scanty. But to meet the great and striking exigency, willing, clever and industrious men were found, and the court was established. Whether it was perceived that the question here was concerning only the alleviation and not the cure of the evil, or whether, as in similar cases, the flattering hope was entertained that much was to be done with little, is not to be decided. It is enough that the court served rather as a pretext to punish the originators of mischief, than completely to prevent wrong. But it has scarcely met, than a power grows out of itself. It feels the eminence on which it is placed. It recognises its own great political importance. It now endeavours, by a striking activity, to acquire for itself a more decided respect. They briskly got through what can and must be rapidly dispatched, what can be decided at the moment, or what can otherwise be easily judged. And thus, throughout the empire, they appear effective and dignified. On the other hand, matters of weightier import, the lawsuits, properly so called, remained behindhand, and this was no misfortune. The only concern of the state is that possession shall be certain and secure. Whether it is also legal is of less consequence. Hence, from the monstrous and ever-swelling number of delayed suits, no mischief arose to the empire. Against people who employed force, provision was already made, and with such matters could be settled, but those, on the other hand, who legally disputed about possession, lived, enjoyed, or starved as they could. They died, were ruined, or made it up. But all this was the good or evil of individual families. The empire was gradually tranquillised. For the imperial chamber was endowed with a legal club law against the disobedient. Had it been able to publish the ban, this would have been more effective. But now, what with the sometimes increased, sometimes diminished number of assessors, what with the many interruptions, what with the removal of the court from one place to another, these arrears, these records necessarily increased to an infinite extent. Now, in the distress of war, a part of the archives was sent for safety from Spire to Aschaffenburg, a part to Worms, the third fell into the hands of the French, who thought they had gained the state archives, but would afterwards have been glad to get rid of such a chaos of paper, if any one would but have furnished the carriages. During the negotiations for the peace of Westphalia, the chosen men, who were assembled, plainly saw what sort of a lever was required to move from its place a load like that of Sisyphus. Fifty assessors were now to be appointed, but the number was never made up. The half of it was again made to suffice, because the expense appeared too great. But if the parties interested had all seen their advantage in the matter, the whole might well have been afforded. To pay five and twenty assessors about one hundred thousand florins, Golden were required, and how easily could double that amount have been raised in Germany? The proposition to endow the imperial chamber which confiscated church property could not pass, for how could the two religious parties agree to such a sacrifice? The Catholics were not willing to lose any more, and the Protestants wished to employ what they had gained, each for his own private ends. 
The division of the empire into two religious parties had here, in several respects, the worst influence. The interest which the estates took in this their court diminished more and more. The more powerful wished to free themselves from the confederation, licenses exempting their possessor from being prosecuted before any higher tribunal were sought with more and more eagerness. The greater kept back with their payments, while the lesser, who, moreover, believed themselves wronged in the estimates, delayed as long as they could. How difficult was it, therefore, to raise the supplies necessary for payment? Hence arose a new occupation, a new loss of time for the chamber. Previously the so-called annual visitations had taken care of this matter. Princes in person, or their counsellors, went only for months or weeks to the place of the court, examined the state of the treasury, investigated the arrears, and undertook to get them in. At the same time, if anything was about to create an impediment in the course of law or the court, or any abuse to creep in, they were authorised to provide a remedy. The faults of the institution they were to discover and remove, but it was not till afterwards that the investigation and punishment of the personal crimes of its members became a part of their duty. But because parties engaged in litigation always like to extend their hopes a moment longer, and on this account always seek and appeal to higher authorities, so did these visitators become a court of revision, from which, at first in determined manifest cases, persons hoped to find restitution, but at last in all cases delay and perpetuation of the controversy, to which the appeal to the imperial diet and the endeavour of the two religious parties, if not to outweigh each other, at any rate to preserve an equilibrium, contributed their part. But if one considers what this court might have been without such obstacles, without such disturbing and destructive conditions, one cannot imagine it remarkable and important enough. Had it been supplied at the beginning with a sufficient number of persons, had a sufficient support been secured to them, the monstrous influence which this body might have attained, considering the aptness of the Germans, would have been immeasurable. The honourable title of Amphictions, which was only bestowed on them oratorically, they would actually have deserved. Nay, they might have elevated themselves into an intermediate power, while revered by the head and the members. But far removed from such great effects, the court, excepting for a short time under Charles V, and before the Thirty Years' War, dragged itself miserably along. One often cannot understand how men could be found for such a thankless and melancholy employment. But what a man does every day he puts up with, if he has any talent for it, even if he does not exactly see that anything will come of it. The German especially is of this persevering turn of mind, and thus for three hundred years the worthiest men have employed themselves on these labours and objects. A characteristic gallery of such figures would even now excite interest and inspire courage. For it is just in such anarchical times that the able man takes the strongest position, and he who desires what is good finds himself right in his place. Thus, for instance, the Directorium of Furstenberg was still held in blessed memory, and with the death of this excellent man begins the epoch of many pernicious abuses. But all these defects, whether later or earlier, arose from one only original source, the small number of persons. It was decreed that the assistants were to act in a fixed order, and according to a determined series. Every one could know when the turn would come to him, and which of the cases belonging to him it would affect. He could work up to this point, he could prepare himself. But now the innumerable arrears had heaped themselves up, and they were forced to resolve to select the more important cases, and to deal with them out of order. But with a pressure of important affairs, the decision as to which matter has the more weight is difficult, and selection leaves room for favour. Now another critical case occurred. The referent tormented both himself and the court with a difficult involved affair, and at last no one was found willing to take up the judgment. The parties had come to an agreement, had separated, had died, had changed their minds. 
hence they resolved to take in hand only the cases of which they were reminded. They wished to be convinced of the continued obstinacy of the parties, and hence was given an introduction to the greatest defects, for he who commends his affairs must commend them to somebody, and to whom can one commend them better than to him who has them already in his hands? To keep this one regularly secret was impossible, for how could he remain concealed with so many subordinates, all acquainted with the matter? If acceleration is requested, favour may well be requested likewise, for the very fact that people urge their cause shows that they consider it just. This will perhaps not be done in a direct manner, certainly it will be first done through subordinates. These must be gained over, and thus an introduction is given to all sorts of intrigues and briberies. The Emperor Joseph, following his own impulse, and in imitation of Frederick, first directed his attention to arms and the administration of justice. He cast his eyes upon the imperial chamber, traditional wrongs, introduced abuses had not remained unknown to him. Even here something was to be stirred up, shaken, and done. Without inquiring whether it was his imperial right, without foreseeing the possibility of a happy result, he proposed a revival of the visitation, and hastened its opening. For one hundred and sixty years no regular visitation had taken place. A monstrous chaos of papers lay swelled up and increased every year, since the seventeen assessors were not even able to dispatch the current business. Twenty thousand processes were heaped up, sixty could be settled every year, and double that number was brought forward. Besides, it was not a small number of revisions that awaited the visitators. They were estimated at fifty thousand. Many other abuses, in addition to this, hindered the course of justice. But the most critical matter of all was the personal delinquency of some assessors, which appeared in the background. When I was about to go to Wetzlar, the visitation had been already for some years in operation. The parties accused had been suspended from office, the investigation had been carried a long way, and because the masters and commissioners of German political law could not let pass this opportunity of exhibiting their sagacity and devoting it to the common weal, several profound, well-designed works appeared, from which every one who possessed only some preparatory knowledge could derive solid instruction. When on this occasion they went back into the constitution of the empire, and the books written upon it, it was striking to me how the monstrous condition of this thoroughly diseased body, which was kept alive by a miracle alone, was the very thing that most suited the learned. For the venerable German industry, which was more directed to the collection and development of details than to results, found here an inexhaustible impulse to new employment and whether the empire was opposed to the emperor, the lesser to the greater estates, or the Catholics to the Protestants, there was necessarily always, according to the diversity of interest, a diversity of opinion, and always an occasion for new contests and controversies. Since I had rendered all these older and newer circumstances as present to my mind as possible, it was impossible for me to promise myself much pleasure from my abode at Wetzlar. The prospect of finding in a city, which was indeed well situated, but small and ill-built, a double world, first the domestic, old traditional world, then a foreign new one, authorised to scrutinise the other with severity, a judging and a judged tribunal, many an inhabitant in fear and anxiety, lest he might also be drawn into the impending investigation, persons of consideration, long held in respect, convicted of the most scandalous misdeeds, and marked out for disgraceful punishment. All this together made the most dismal picture, and could not lure me to go deeper into a business which, involved in itself, seemed so much perplexed by wrong. That, excepting the German civil and public law, I should find nothing remarkable in the scientific way, that I should be without all poetical communication, I thought I could foresee, when, after some delay, the desire of altering my situation more than impulse to knowledge led me to this spot. 
but how surprised I was when, instead of a crabbed society, a third academical life sprang towards me. At a large table d'hôte, I found a number of young lively people, nearly all subordinates to the commission. They gave me a friendly reception, and the very first day it remained no secret to me that they had cheered their noon meetings by a romantic fiction. With much wit and cheerfulness, they represented a table of knights. At the top sat the Grand Master, by his side the Chancellor, then the most important officers of the state. Now followed the knights, according to their seniority. Strangers, on the other hand, who visited, were forced to be content with the lowest places, and to these the conversation was almost unintelligible, because the language of the society, in addition to the chivalric expressions, was enriched with many allusions. To everyone a name with an epithet was assigned. Me they called Gotts von Berlichingen the Honest. The former I earned by the attention to the gallant German patriarch, the latter by my upright affection and devotion for the eminent men with whom I became acquainted. To the Count von Kielmansegg I was much indebted during this residence. He was the most serious of all, highly clever, and to be relied on. There was von Goe, a man hard to be deciphered and described, a blunt, kind, quietly reserved Hanoverian figure. He was not wanting in talent of various kinds. It was con conjectured concerning him that he was a natural son. He loved, besides, a certain mysterious deportment, and concealed his most peculiar wishes and plans under various eccentricities, as indeed he was, properly speaking, the very soul of the odd confederation of knights, without having striven to attain the post of Grand Master. On the contrary, when, just at this time, the head of the knight had departed, he caused another to be elected, and through him exercised his influence. Thus he managed so to direct several little trifles that they appeared of importance, and could be carried out in mythical forms. But with all this no serious purpose could be remarked in him. He was only concerned to get rid of the tedium which he and his colleagues, during their protracted occupation, necessarily felt, and to fill up the empty space, if only with cobwebs. For the rest, this mythical caricature was carried on with great external seriousness, and no one found it ridiculous if a certain mill was treated as a castle, and the miller as lord of the fortress. If the Four Sons of Hymon was declared a canonical book, and on the occasion of ceremonics, extracts from it were read with veneration. The dubbing of knights took place with traditional symbols, borrowed from several orders of knighthood. A chief motive for jest was the fact that what was manifest was treated as a secret. The affair was carried on publicly, and yet nothing was to be said about it. The list of the whole body of knights was printed with as much importance as a calendar of the imperial diet, and if families ventured to scoff at this, and to declare the whole matter absurd and ridiculous, they were punished by an intrigue being carried on until a solemn husband or near relation was induced to join the company and to be dubbed a knight, for then there was a splendid burst of malicious joy at the annoyance of the connections. Into this chivalric state of existence another strange order had insinuated itself, which was to be philosophical and mystical, and had no name of its own. The first degree was called the transition, the second the transition's transition, the third the transition's transition to the transition, and the fourth the transition's transition to the transition's transition. To interpret the high sense of this series of degrees was now the duty of the initiated, and this was done according to the standard of a little printed book, in which these strange words were explained, or rather amplified, in a manner still more strange. Occupation with these things was the most desirable pastime. The folly of Berich and the perversity of Lenz seemed here to have united themselves, I only repeat that not a trace of purpose was to be found behind these veils. Although I very readily took part in such fooleries, had first brought into order the extracts from the Four Sons of Hymon, 
made proposals how they should be read on feasts and solemn occasions, and even understood how to deliver them myself with great emphasis. I had nevertheless grown weary of such things before, and therefore as I missed my Frankfurt and Darmstadt circles, I was highly pleased to have found Gotha, who attached himself to me with honest affection, and to whom I showed in return a hearty good will. His turn of mind was delicate, clear and cheerful, his talents were practised and well regulated, he aimed at French elegance, and was pleased with that part of English literature which is occupied with moral and agreeable subjects. We passed together many pleasant hours, in which we communicated to each other our knowledge, plans and inclinations. He excited me to many little works, especially as, being in connection with the people of Göttingen, he desired some of my poems for Bois Almanach. I thus came into contact with those who, young and full of talent, held themselves together, and afterwards affected so much and in such various ways. The two counts of Stolberg, Berger, Voss, Hulte, and others were assembled in faith and spirit around Klopstock, whose influence extended in every direction. In such a poetical circle, which more and more extended itself, was developed at the same time with such manifold poetical merits, another turn of mind, to which I can give no exactly proper name. It might be called the need of independence, which always arises in time of peace, and exactly when, properly speaking, one is not dependent. In war we bear the rude force as well as we can, we feel ourselves physically and economically, but not morally wounded. The constraint shames no one, and it is no disgraceful service to serve the time. We accustom ourselves to suffer from foes and friends, we have wishes, but no particular views. In peace, on the contrary, man's love of freedom becomes more and more prominent, and the more free one is, the more free one wishes to be. We will not tolerate anything over us, we will not be restrained, no one shall be restrained, and this tender, nay, morbid feeling appears in noble souls under the form of justice. This spirit and feeling then showed itself everywhere, and just because few were oppressed, it was wished to free even these from temporary oppression, and thus a certain moral feud, a mixture of individuals with the government, which, with laudable beginnings, led to inevitably unfortunate results. Voltaire, by the protection which he had bestowed on the family of Callas, had excited great attention and made himself respected. In Germany, the attempt of Lavater against the Landvogt, sheriff of the province, had been almost more striking and important. The aesthetical feeling, united with a youthful courage, strove forward, and as shortly before persons had studied to obtain offices, they now began to act as overlookers of those in office, and the time was near when the dramatist and novelist loved best to seek their villains among ministers and official persons. Hence arose a world, half real, half imaginary, of action and reaction, in which we afterwards lived to see the most violent informations and instigations which the writers of periodical publications and journals allowed themselves under the garb of justice, and went to work the more irresistibly, as they made the public believe that it was itself the true tribunal, a foolish notion, as no public has an executive power, and in dismembered Germany public opinion neither benefited nor injured anyone. Among us young people there was indeed nothing to be traced, which could have been culpable, but a certain similar notion, composed of poetry, morality, and a noble striving, and which was harmless but yet fruitless, had taken possession of us. By his Hermann's Schacht Footnote The fight of Hermann, the Arminius, of Tacitus, against the Romans. Trans. End footnote and the dedication of it to Joseph the Second, Klopstock had produced a wonderful excitement. The Germans, who freed themselves from Roman oppression, were nobly and powerfully represented, and this picture was well suited to awaken the self-feeling of a nation. 
but because in peace patriotism really consists only in this, that everyone sweep his own door, minds his own business, and learns his own lesson that it may go well with his house, so did the feeling of fatherland, excited by Klopstock, find no object on which it could exercise itself. Frederick had saved the honour of one part of the Germans against an united world, and every member of the nation, by applause and reverence of this great prince, was allowed to share in his victory. But what was to come of this excited, warlike spirit of defiance? At first it was merely a poetical form, and the songs of the bards, afterwards so often blamed and even found ridiculous, were accumulated through this impulse, this incitement. There were no external enemies to fight, so people made tyrants for themselves, and for this purpose princes and their servants were obliged to bestow their figures, first only in general outline, but gradually with particulars. Here it was that poetry attached itself with vehemence to that interference with the administration of justice, which is blamed above, and it is remarkable to see poems of that time written in a spirit by which everything of a higher order, whether monarchical or aristocratic, is abolished. For my own part, I continued to make poetry the expression of my own whims and feelings. Little poems like The Wanderer belong to this time. They were inserted in the Gottingen Musenalmanach. But from whatever of the above-mentioned mania had worked itself into me, I shortly endeavoured to free myself in Gotts von Berlinkingen, since I described how in disordered times this brave, well-thinking man resolves to take the place of the law and the executive power, but is in despair when, to the supreme authority, which he recognises and reveres, he appears in an equivocal light and even rebellious. By Klopstock's odes, it was not so much the northern mythology as the nomenclature of the divinities that had been introduced into German poetry, and although I gladly made use of everything else that was offered me, I could not bring myself to use this for the following causes. I had long become acquainted with the fables of the Edda, from the preface to Mallet's Danish history, and had at once made myself master of them. They belong to those tales which, when asked by a company, I most willingly related. Herda put Resenius into my hands, and made me better acquainted with the heroic sagas. But all these things, worthy as I held them, I could not bring within the circle of my own poetic faculty. Nobly as they excited my imagination, they nevertheless entirely withdrew themselves from the sensuous perception while the mythology of the Greeks, changed by the greatest artists in the world into visible, easily imagined forms, still existed before our own eyes in abundance. Gods in general I did not allow often to appear, because at all events they had their own abode out of nature, which I understood how to imitate. What now could have induced to substitute Verdun for Jupiter, and Thor for Mars, and instead of the southern, accurately described figures, to introduce forms of mist, nay, mere verbal sounds, into my poems. On the one side, they were related to the equally formless heroes of Ossian, only they were ruder and more gigantic. On the other, I brought them into contact with the cheerful tale, for the humoristic vein which runs through the whole northern mythos was to me highly pleasing and remarkable. It appeared to me the only one which dressed with itself throughout. Wondrous giants, magicians, and monsters opposed to an odd dynasty of gods, and only occupied in leading astray and deriding the highest persons during their government, while they threatened them, besides with disgraceful and inevitable destruction. I felt a similar if not an equal interest for the Indian fables, which I at first learned to know from Dapper's travels, and likewise added with great pleasure to my store of tales. In subsequent repetitions I succeeded especially with the altar of Ram, and notwithstanding the great number of persons in this tale, the ape Hanuman remained the favourite of my public. But even these unformed and overformed monsters could not satisfy me in a true poetic sense, 
they lay too far from the truth, towards which my mind unceasingly strove. End of section 10「Section 11, Book 12, Part 3 of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2, From My Life, Poetry and Truth, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford. 1812 to 1877 book 12 part 3 but against all these goblins so repulsive to art my sense for the beautiful was to be protected by the noblest power always fortunate is that epoch in a literature when the great works of the past again rise up as if thawed and come into notice because they then produce a perfectly fresh effect even the homeric light rose again quite new to us and indeed quite in the spirit of the time which highly favoured such an appearance for the constant reference to nature had at last the effect that we learned to regard even the works of the ancients from this side what several travellers had done for explanation of the holy scriptures others had done for homer by guise the matter was introduced wood gave it an impulse a gottingen review of the original work which was at first very rare made us acquainted with the design and taught us how far it had been carried out we now no longer saw in those poems a strained and inflated heroism but the reflected truth of a primeval present and sought to bring this as closely to us as possible at the same time we could not give our assent when it was maintained that in order rightly to understand the homeric natures one must make oneself acquainted with the wild races and their manners as described by the travellers in new worlds for it cannot be denied that both europeans and asiatics are represented in the homeric poems as at a higher grade of culture perhaps higher than the time of the trojan war could have enjoyed but that maxim was nevertheless in harmony with the prevailing confession of nature and so far we let it pass with all these occupations which were related to the knowledge of mankind in the higher sense as well as most nearly and dearly to poetry i was nevertheless forced every day to experience that i was residing in wetzlar the conversation on the situation of the business of the quote, visitation end quote. visitation capitalized and its ever-increasing obstacles the discovery of new offences was heard every hour here was the holy roman empire once more assembled not for mere outward forms but for an occupation which penetrated to the very depths but even here that half-empty banqueting hall on the coronation day occurred to me where the bidden guests remained without because they were too proud here indeed they had come but even worse symptoms were to be seen the want of coherence in the whole the mutual opposition of the parts were continually apparent and it remained no secret that princes had confidentially communicated to each other this notion that they must see whether on this occasion something could not be gained from the supreme authority what a bad impression the petty detail of all the anecdotes of neglects and delays of injustices and corruptions must make upon a young man who desired what was good and with this view cultivated his mind every honest person will feel under such circumstances where was a reverence for the law and the judge to arise even if the greatest confidence had been placed in the effects of the visitation if it could have been believed that it would fully accomplish its high purpose there was still no remedy to be found here for a joyous inwardly striving youth the formalities of the proceeding all tended towards delay if any one desired to do anything 
and to be of any importance he was obliged to serve the party in the wrong way always the accused and to be skilled in the fencing art of twisting and evading since amid this distraction i could not succeed in any ascetic labors i again and again lost myself in ascetic speculations as indeed all theorizing indicates a defect or stagnation of productive power before with Merck, now with Gotter, i endeavored to find out the maxims according to which one might go to work in production but neither with me nor with them would it succeed Merck was a skeptic and eclectic Gotter adhered to such examples as pleased him the most the sulzer theory was published more for the amateur than the artist in this sphere moral effects are required above all things and here at once arises a dissension between the class that produces and that which uses for the good work of art can and will indeed have moral consequences but to require moral ends of the artist is to destroy his profession what the ancients had said on these important subjects i had read industriously for some years by skips at least if not in regular order aristotle cicero quintilian longinus none were unconsidered but this did not help me in the least for all these men presupposed an experience which i lacked they led me into a world infinitely rich in works of art they unfolded the merits of excellent poets and orators of most of whom the names alone are left us and convinced me but too well that a great abundance of objects must lie before us ere we can think upon them that one must first accomplish something oneself nay fail in something to learn to know one's own capacities and those of others my acquaintance with so much that was good in those old times was only according to school and book and by no means vital since even with the most celebrated orators it was striking that they had altogether formed themselves in life and that one could never speak of the peculiarities of their character as artists without at the same time mentioning the personal peculiarities of their disposition with the poets this seemed less to be the case and thus the result of all my thoughts and endeavors was the old resolution to investigate inner and outer nature and to allow her to rule herself in loving imitation for these operations which rested in me neither day nor night lay before me two great nay monstrous materials the wealth of which i had only to prize in order to produce something of importance there was the older epochs into which falls the life of Goetz von berlincher and the modern one the unhappy bloom of which is depicted in werther of the historical preparation to that first work i had already spoken the ethical occasion of the second shall now be introduced the resolution to preserve my internal nature according to its peculiarities and to let external nature influence me according to its qualities impelled me to the strange element in which werther is designed and written i sought to free myself internally from all that was foreign to me to regard the external with love and to allow all beings from man downwards as low as they were comprehensible to act upon me each after its own kind thus arose a wonderful affinity with the single objects of nature and a healthy concord a harmony with the whole so that every change whether of place and region or of times of the day and year or whatever else could happen affected me in the deepest manner the glance of the painter associated itself to that of the poet the beautiful rural landscape animated by the pleasant river increased my love of solitude and favored my silent observations as they extended on all sides but since i had left the family circle in sessenheim and again my family circle at frankfurt and darmstadt a vacuum had remained in my bosom which i was not able to fill up i therefore found myself in a situation where the inclinations if they appear in any degree veiled 
gradually steal upon us and can render abortive all our good resolutions and now when the author has attained this step of his undertaking he for the first time feels light-hearted in his labor since from henceforward this book first becomes what it properly ought to be it has not been announced as an independent work it is much more designed to fill up the gaps of the author's life to complete much that is fragmentary and to preserve the memory of lost and forgotten ventures but what is already done neither should nor can be repeated and the poet would now vainly call upon those darkened powers of the soul vainly ask of them to render present again those charming circumstances which rendered the abode in lantho so agreeable to him fortunately the genius had already provided for that and had impelled him in the vigorous period of youth to hold fast describe and with sufficient boldness and at the favorable hour publicly to exhibit that which had immediately gone by that the little book werther is here meant requires no further indication but something is to be gradually revealed both of the persons introduced in it and the views which it exhibits among the young men who attached to the embassy had to prepare themselves for their future career of office was one whom we were accustomed to call only the quote, bridegroom end quote, bridegroom capitalized he distinguished himself by a calm agreeable deportment clearness of views definiteness both in speaking and in acting his cheerful activity his persevering industry so much recommended him to his superiors that an appointment at an early period was promised him being justified by this he ventured to betroth himself to a lady who fully corresponded to his tone of mind and his wishes after the death of her mother she had shown herself completely active as the head of a numerous young family and had alone sustained her father in his widowhood so that a future husband might hope the same for himself and his posterity and expect a decided domestic felicity every one confessed without having these selfish ends immediately in view that she was a desirable lady she belonged to those who if they cannot inspire ardent passion are nevertheless formed to create a general feeling of pleasure a figure lightly built and neatly formed a pure healthy temperament with a glad activity of life resulting from it an unembarrassed management of the necessities of the day all these were given her together i always felt happy in the contemplation of such qualities and i readily associated myself with those who possessed them and if i did not always find opportunity to render them real service i rather shared with them than with others the enjoyment of those innocent pleasures which youth can always find at home and seize without any great cost or effort moreover since it is now settled that ladies decorate themselves only for each other and are unwearied among each other to heighten the effect of their adornments those were always the most agreeable with me who with simple purity give their friend their bridegroom the silent assurance that all is really done for him alone and that a whole life could be so carried on without much circumstance and outlay such persons are not too much occupied with themselves they have time to consider the external world and patience enough to direct themselves according to it and to adapt themselves to it they become shrewd and sensible without exertion and require but few books for their cultivation such was the bride footnote persons betrothed are in german called bride and bridegroom translator End footnote. the bridegroom with his thoroughly upright and confiding turn of mind soon made many whom he esteemed acquainted with her and as he had to pass the greater part of his day in a zealous attention to business was pleased when his betrothed after the domestic toils were ended amused herself otherwise and took social recreation in walks and rural parties with friends of both sexes charlotte for so we shall call her was unpretending in two senses 
first by her nature, which was rather directed to a general kindly feeling than to peculiar inclinations, and then she had set her mind upon a man who, being worthy of her, declared himself ready to attach his fate to hers for life. The most cheerful atmosphere seemed to surround her. Nay, if it be a pleasing sight to see parents bestow an uninterrupted care upon their children, there is something still more beautiful when brothers and sisters do the same for each other. In the former case, we think we can perceive more of natural impulse and social tradition. In the latter, more of choice and of a free exercise of feeling. The newcomer, perfectly free from all ties and careless in the presence of a girl who, already engaged to another, could not interpret the most obliging services as acts of courtship, and could take the more pleasure in them accordingly, quietly went his way, but was soon so drawn in and riveted that he no longer knew himself. Indolent and dreamy, because nothing present satisfied him, he found what he had lacked in a female friend who while she lived for the whole year seemed only to live for the moment she liked him much as her companion he soon could not bear her absence as she formed for him the connecting link with the everyday world and during extensive household occupations they were inseparable companions in the fields and in the meadows in the vegetable garden and in the garden if business permitted the bridegroom was also of the party. They had all three accustomed themselves to each other without intention, and did not know how they had become so mutually indispensable. During the splendid summer, they lived through a real German idol, to which the fertile land gave the form and a pure affection, the poetry. Wandering through ripe cornfields, they took delight in the dewy morning, the song of the lark, the cry of the quail where pleasant tones sultry hours followed monstrous storms came on they grew more and more attached to each other and by this continuous love many a little domestic annoyance was easily extinguished and thus one ordinary day followed another and all seemed to be holidays the whole calendar should have been printed red he will understand me who recollects what was predicted by the happily unhappy friend of the quote, new Heloise, end quote. Quote, and sitting at the feet of his beloved, he will break hemp, and he will wish to break hemp today, tomorrow, and the day after, nay, for his whole life, end quote. I can say but little though just as much as may be necessary respecting a young man whose name was afterwards but too often mentioned. This was Jerusalem, the son of the freely and tenderly thinking theologian. He also had an appointment with an embassy. His form was pleasing, of a middle height, and well built. His face was rather round than long. His features were soft and calm and he had the other appurtenances of a handsome blond youth with blue eyes rather attractive than speaking his dress was at introduced in lower germany in imitation of the english a blue frock waistcoat and breeches of yellow leather and boots with brown tops the author never visited him nor saw him at his own residence but often met him among his friends the expressions of this young man were moderate but kindly. He took interest in production of the most different kinds, and especially loved those designs and sketches in which the tranquil character of solitary spots is caught. On such occasions he showed Gessner's etchings, and encouraged the amateurs to study them. In all that mummery and knighthood he took no part, but lived for himself and his own sentiments. It was said he had a decided passion for the wife of one of his friends. In public, they were never seen together. In general, very little could be said of him except that he occupied himself with English literature. As the son of an opulent man, he had no occasion either painfully to devote himself to business or to make present applications for an early appointment. 
those etchings of Gessner increased the pleasure and intentions of rural objects, and a little poem, which we passionately received in our circle, allowed us from henceforward to think of nothing else. Goldsmith's deserted village necessarily delighted everyone at the grade of cultivation in that sphere of thought, not as living and active, but as a departed, vanished existence was described. All that one so readily looked upon, that one loved, prized, and sought passionately in the present to take part in it with the cheerfulness of youth. High days and holidays in the country, church consecrations and fairs, the solemn assemblage of the elders under the village linden tree, supplanted in its turn by the lively delight of youth in dancing, while the more educated classes showed their sympathy. How seemly did these pleasures appear, moderated as they were by an excellent country pastor, who understood how to smooth down and remove all that went too far, that gave occasion to quarrel and dispute. Here again we found an honest Wakefield in his well-known circle, yet no longer in his living bodily form, but as a shadow recalled by the soft mournful tones of the elegiac poet. The very thought of this picture is one of the happiest possible, when once the design is formed to evoke once more an innocent past with a graceful melancholy. And in this kindly endeavor, how well has the Englishman succeeded in every sense of the word. I shared the enthusiasm for this charming poem with Gauter, who was more felicitous than myself with the translation undertaken by us both for I had too painfully tried to imitate in our language the delicate significance of the original, and thus had well agreed with single passages, but not with the whole. If now, as they say, the greatest happiness rests on a sense of longing, parenthesis, sein and if the genuine longing can only be directed to something unattainable, everything has fallen together, to render the youth whom we now accompany on his wanderings the happiest of mortals. An affection for one betrothed to another, the effort to acquire the masterpieces of foreign literature for our own, the endeavor to imitate natural objects, not only with words, but also with style and pencil, without any proper technical knowledge, each of these particulars would singly have sufficed to melt the heart and oppress the bosom. But that the sweetly suffering youth might be torn out of this state, and that new circumstances might be prepared for new disquiet, the following events occurred. Hofner, professor of law, was at Geisen. He was acknowledged and highly esteemed by Merck and Schlosser as clever in his office and as a thinking and excellent man. I had long ago desired his acquaintance, and now, when these two friends thought to pay him a visit to negotiate about some literary matters, it was agreed that I should likewise go to Geisen on this opportunity. Because, however, as generally happens with the willfulness of glad and peaceful times, we could not easily do anything in the direct way, but, like genuine children, sought to get a jest even out of what was necessary. I was now, as an unknown person, to appear in a strange form, and once more satisfy my desire to appear disguised. One cheerful morning before sunrise, I went from Wetzlar along the lawn, up the charming valley, such ramblings again constituted my greatest felicity. I invented, connected, elaborated, and was quietly happy and cheerful with myself. I set right what the ever-contradictory world had clumsily and confusedly forced upon me. Arriving at the end of my journey, I looked out for Hopner's residence and knocked at his study. When he had cried out, Come in! I modestly appeared before him, as a student who was going home from the universities, and wished on his way to become acquainted with the most worthy men. For his questions, as to my more intimate circumstances, I was prepared. I made up a plausible, prosaic tale, with which he seemed satisfied, and as I gave myself out for a jurist, I did not come off badly. 
for i well knew his merits in this department and also that he was occupied with natural law conversation however sometimes came to a stand and it seemed as if he were looking for a stambu or for me to take my leave footnote a stambuk is a sort of album for autographs and short contributions translator and footnote nevertheless i managed to delay my departure as i expected with certainty the arrival of schlosser whose punctuality was well known to me he came in reality and after a side glance took little notice of me hopfner however drew me into conversation and showed himself throughout as a humane and kindly man i at last took my leave and hastened to the inn where i exchanged a few hurried words with Merck and awaited further proceedings the friends had resolved to ask hopfner to dinner and also that philip heinrich schmidt who had played a part though a very subordinate one in german literature for him the affair was really designed and he was to be punished in a mirthful manner when the guests had assembled in the dining room i asked through the waiter whether the gentlemen would allow me to dine with them schlosser whom a certain earnestness well became opposed this proposition because they did not wish their conversation interrupted by a third party but on the pressing demand of the waiter and the advocacy of hoffner who assured the other that i was a very tolerable person i was admitted and at the commencement of the meal behaved as if modest and abashed schlosser and merck put no restraint upon themselves and went on about many subjects as freely as if no stranger were present i now showed myself somewhat bolder and did not allow myself to be disturbed when schlosser threw out at me much that was in earnest and merck something sarcastic but i directed against schmidt all my darts which fell sharply and surely on the uncovered places which i knew well i had been moderate over my pint of table wine but the gentleman ordered better wine to be brought and did not fail to give me some after many affairs of the day had been talked over conversation went into general matters and the question was discussed which will be repeated as long as there are authors in the world the question namely whether literature was rising or declining progressing or retrograding this question about which old and young those commencing and those retiring seldom agree was discussed with cheerfulness though without any exact design of coming decidedly to terms about it at last i took up the discourse and said quote, the different literatures as it seems to me have seasons which alternating with each other as in nature bring forth certain phenomena and assert themselves in due order hence i do not believe that any epoch of a literature can be praised or blamed on the whole especially it displeases me when certain talents which are brought out by their time are praised and vaunted so highly while others are censured and depreciated the throat of the nightingale is excited by the spring but at the same time also that of the cuckoo the butterflies which are so agreeable to the eye and the gnats which are so painful to the feelings are called into being by the same heat of the sun if this were duly considered we should not hear the same complaints renewed every ten years and the vain trouble which is taken to root out this or that offensive thing would not so often be wasted End quote the party looked at me wondering whence i had got so much wisdom and tolerance i however continued calmly to compare literary phenomena with natural productions and i know not how came to the mollusca of which i contrived to set forth all sorts of strange things i said that there were creatures to whom a sort of body nay a certain figure could not be denied but that since they had no bones one never knew how to set about rightly with them and they were nothing better than living slime nevertheless the sea must have such inhabitants 
since i carried the simile beyond its due limits to designate schmidt who was present and that class of characterless literateurs i was reminded that a simile carried too far at last becomes nothing well then i will return to the earth i replied and speak of the ivy as these creatures have no bones so this has no trunk but whatever it attaches itself it likes to play the chief part it belongs to old walls in which there is nothing more to destroy but from new buildings it is properly removed it sucks up the goodness of the trees and is most insupportable to me when it clambers up a post and assures me that it is a living trunk because it has covered it with leaves End quote. notwithstanding i was again reproached with the obscurity and inapplicability of my similes i became more and more warm against all parasitical creatures and as far as my knowledge of nature then extended managed the affair pretty well i at last sang a vivat to all independent men a periot to those who forced themselves upon them seized hoffner's hand after dinner shook it violently declared him to be the best man in the world and finally embraced both him and the others right heartily my excellent new friend thought he was really dreaming until schlosser and merck at last solved the riddle and the discovered joke diffused a general hilarity which was shared by schmidt himself who was appeased by an acknowledgment of his real merits and the interest we took in his tastes this ingenious introduction could not do otherwise than animate and favor the literary congress which was indeed chiefly kept in view Merck, active now in ascetics, now in literature, now in commerce, had stimulated the well-thinking, well-informed Schlosser, whose knowledge extended to so many branches, to edit the Frankfurt Galerte on Siege, parenthesis, learned advertiser, for that year. They had associated to themselves Hoffner and other university men at Geisen, a meritorious schoolman, Rector Wenck, in darmstadt and many other good men every one of them possessed enough historical and theoretical knowledge in his department and the feeling of the times allowed these men to work in one spirit the human and cosmopolitan is encouraged really good men justly celebrated are protected against obstruction of every kind their defense is undertaken against enemies and especially against scholars who use what has been taught them to the detriment of their instructors nearly the most interesting articles are the critiques on other periodical literature the berlin library bibliothek the german mercury where the cleverness in so many departments the judgment as well as the fairness of the papers is rightly admired as for myself they say well enough that i was deficient in everything that belongs to a critic properly so called my historic knowledge was unconnected the histories of the world science and literature had only attracted me by epochs the objects themselves only partially and in masses my capacity for giving life to things and rendering them present to me out of their real connection put me in the position that i could be perfectly at home in a certain century or in a department of science without being in any degree instructed as to what preceded or what followed thus a certain theoretical practical sense had been awakened in me by which i could give account of things rather as they should be than as they were without any proper philosophical connection but by way of leaps to this was added a very easy power of apprehension and a friendly reception of the opinion of others if they did not stand in direct opposition to my own convictions that literary union was also favored by an animated correspondence and by frequent personal communications which was possible from the vicinity of the places he who had first read a book was to give an account of it often another reviewer of the same book was found the affair was talked over connected with kindred subjects 
and if at last a certain result had been obtained one of them took the office of editing thus many reviews are as clever as they are spirited as pleasant as they are satisfactory i often had the task of introducing the matter my friends also permitted me to jest in their works and to appear independently with objects to which i felt myself equal and in which i especially took interest in vain should i endeavor either by description or reflection to recall the proper spirit and sense of those days if the two years of the above-mentioned periodical did not furnish me with the most decisive documents extracts from passages in which i again recognize myself may appear in future in their proper place together with similar essays during this lively interchange of knowledge opinions and convictions i very soon became better acquainted with hofner and became very fond of him as soon as we were alone i spoke with him about subjects connected with his department which was to be my department also and found a very naturally connected explanation and instruction i was not then as yet plainly conscious that i could learn something from books and conversations but not from continuous professional lectures a book allowed me to pause at a passage and even to look back which is impossible with oral delivery and a teacher often at the beginning of the lecture some thought in which i indulged laid hold of me and thus i lost what followed and altogether got out of the connection thus it had happened to me with respect to the lectures on jurisprudence and on this account i could take many opportunities of talking with hoffner who entered very readily into my doubts and scruples and filled up many gaps so that the wish arose in me to remain with him at geisen and derive instruction from him without removing myself too far from wetzlar inclinations against this wish of mine my two friends had labored first unconsciously but afterwards consciously for both were in a hurry not only to leave the place themselves but had also an interest to remove me from the spot schlosser disclosed to me that he had formed first a friendly then a closer connection with my sister and that he was looking about for an early appointment that he might be united to her this explanation surprised me to some degree although i ought to have found it out long ago in my sister's letters but we easily pass over that which may hurt the good opinion which we entertain of ourselves and i now remarked for the first time that i was really jealous of my sister a feeling which i concealed from myself the less as since my return from strasburg our connection had been much more intimate how much time had we not expended in communicating each little affair of the heart love matters and other matters which had occurred in the interval in the field of imagination too there had been revealed to me a new world into which i sought to conduct her also my own little productions and a far extended world poetry was gradually to be made known to her thus i made for her impromptu translations of those passages of homer in which she could take the greatest interest clark's literal translation i read into german as well as i could my version generally found its way into metrical turns and terminations and the liveliness with which i had apprehended the images the force with which i expressed them removed all the obstacles of a cramped order of words what i gave with mind she followed with mind also we passed many hours of the day in this fashion while if her company met the wolf fenris and the ape hanuman were unanimously called for and how often have i not been obliged to repeat circumstantially how thor and his comrades were deluded by the magical giants hence from these fictions such a pleasant impression had remained with me that they belonged to the most valuable things which my imagination can recall into the connection with the darmstadt people i had drawn my sister also and now my wanderings and occasional absence necessarily bound us closer together as i discoursed with her by letter respecting everything that occurred to me communicated with her every little poem even if only a note of admiration and let her first see all the letters which i received and all the answers which i wrote all these lively impulses had been stopped 
since my departure from Frankfurt. My residence at Wetzlar was not fertile enough for such a correspondence, and moreover, my attachment to Charlotte may have infringed upon my attentions to my sister. Enough, she felt herself alone, perhaps neglected, and therefore the more readily gave a hearing to the honest wooing of an honorable man, who, serious and reserved, estimable and worthy of confidence, had passionately bestowed upon her his affections, which he was otherwise very niggardly. I was now forced to resign myself and grant my friend his happiness, though I did not fail in secret to say confidently to myself that if the brother had not been absent, it would not have gone so well with the friend my friend and probable brother-in-law was now very anxious that i should return home because by my mediation a freer intercourse was possible of which the feelings of this man so unexpectedly attached by a tender passion seemed to stand extremely in need therefore on his speedy departure he elicited from me the promise that i would immediately follow him of Merck, whose time was free, I hoped that he would delay his sojourn in Geisen, that I might be able to pass some hours of the day with my friend Hoffner, while my friend employed his time on the Frankfurt Galerte an Zeige, but he was not to be moved. And as my brother-in-law was driven from the university by love, he was driven by hate. For as there are innate antipathies, just as certain men cannot endure cats, while this or that is repugnant to the soul of others, so was Merck a deadly enemy of all the academic citizens, the students, who indeed at that time at Geitzen took delight in the greatest rudeness. For me they were well enough. I could have used them as masks for one of my carnival plays, but with him the sight of them by day and their noise by night destroyed every sort of good humor he had spent the best days of his youth in french switzerland and had afterward enjoyed the pleasant intercourse of people of the court world and business and of cultivated literateurs several military persons in whom a desire for mental culture had been awakened sought his society and thus he had passed his life in a very cultivated circle that the rudeness of the students vexed him was therefore not to be wondered at but his aversion to them was really more passionate than became a sound man although he often made me laugh by his witty descriptions of their monstrous appearance and behavior hoffner's invitations and my persuasions were of no avail i was obliged to depart with him as soon as possible for wetzlar I could scarcely wait any time till I had introduced him to Charlotte, but his presence in his circle did me no good, for as Mephistopheles let him go where he will, hardly brings a blessing with him, so did he, by his indifference towards that beloved person, cause me no joy, even if he did not make me waver. This I might have foreseen, if i had recollected that it was exactly those slender delicate persons who diffuse a lively cheerfulness around them without making further pretensions who did not remarkably please him he very quickly preferred the juno form of one of her friends and since he lacked time to form a close connection he bitterly blamed me for not exerting myself to gain this magnificent figure especially as she was free and without any tie he thought that i did not understand his own advantage and that he here very unwillingly perceived my especial taste for wasting my time if it is dangerous to make a friend acquainted with the perfections of one's beloved because he also may find her charming and desirable no less is the reverse danger that he may perplex us by his descent this indeed was not the case here for I had too deeply impressed upon myself the picture of her amiability for it to be so easily obliterated. But his presence and his persuasions nevertheless hastened my resolution to leave the place. He represented to me a journey on the Rhine, which he was going to take with his wife and son, 
in the most glowing colors and excited in me the desire to see at last with my eyes those objects of which i had often heard with envy now when he had departed i separated myself from charlotte with a purer conscience indeed than from frederica but still not without pain this connection also had by habit and indulgence grown more passionate than was right on my side while on the other hand she and her bridegroom kept themselves with cheerfulness in a measure which could not be more beautiful and amiable and the security which resulted just from this caused me to forget every danger i could not however conceal from myself that this adventure must come to a speedy end for the union of the young man with the amiable girl depended on a promotion which was immediately to be expected and as man if he is in any degree resolute even dares to make a virtue of necessity so did i embrace the determination voluntarily to depart before i was driven away by anything insupportable End of section 11section twelve book thirteen part one of the autobiography of goethe volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of goethe volume two from my life poetry and truth by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by john oxenford eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven book thirteen part one it was agreed with merck that in the fine season we should meet at koblenz at frau von larouche's i sent to frankfurt my baggage and whatever i might want on my way down the lawn by an opportunity which offered and now wandered down that beautiful river so lovely in its windings so various in its shores free as to my resolution but oppressed as to my feelings in a condition when the presence of silently living nature is so beneficial to us my eye accustomed to discern those beauties of a landscape that suited the painter and were above him rioted in the contemplation of near and distant objects of bushy rocks of sunny heights of damp valleys of enthroned castles and of the blue range of mountains inviting us from the distance i wandered on the right bank of the river which at some depth and distance below me and partly concealed by a rich bush of willows glided along in the sunlight then again arose in me the old wish worthily to imitate such objects by chance i had a handsome pocket-knife in my left hand and at the moment from the depth of my soul arose as it were an absolute command according to which without delay i was to fling this knife into the river if i saw it fall my wish to become an artist would be fulfilled but if the sinking of the knife was concealed by the overhanging bush of willows i was to abandon the wish and the endeavour this whim had no sooner arisen in me than it was executed for without regarding the usefulness of the knife which comprised many instruments in itself i cast it with the left hand as i held it violently towards the river but here i had to experience that deceptive ambiguity of oracles of which in antiquity such bitter complaints were made the sinking of the knife into the water was concealed from me by the extreme twigs of the willows but the water which rose from the fall sprang up like a strong fountain and was perfectly visible i did not interpret this phenomenon in my favour and the doubt which it excited in me was afterwards the cause that i pursued these exercises more interruptedly and more negligently and gave occasion to the import of the oracle to fulfil itself for the moment at least the external world was spoiled for me 
i abandoned myself to my imaginations and feelings and left the well-situated castles and districts of weilberg limburg dietz and nassau one by one behind me generally walking alone but often for a short time associating myself with another after thus pleasantly wandering for some days i arrived at ems where i several times enjoyed the soft bath and then went down the river in a boat then the old rhine opened itself to me the beautiful situation of oberlostein delighted me but noble and majestic above all appeared to me the castle of ehrenbreitstein which stood perfectly armed in its power and strength in most lovely contrast lay at its feet the well-built little palace called thal where i could easily find my way to the residence of privy councillor von la Rouche. announced by merck i was very kindly received by this noble family and soon considered as a member of it my literary and sentimental tendencies bound me to the mother a cheerful feeling for the world bound me to the father and my youth bound me to the daughters the house quite at the end of the valley and little elevated above the river had a free prospect down the stream the rooms were high and spacious and the walls like a gallery were hung with pictures placed close together every window on every side formed a frame to a natural picture which came out very vividly by the light of a mild sun i thought i had never seen such cheerful mornings and such splendid evenings i was not long the only guest in the house as a member of the congress which was held here partly with an artistic view partly as a matter of feeling luke sterling who came up from dusseldorf was likewise appointed this man possessed a fine knowledge of modern literature had on different travels but especially during a residence in switzerland made many acquaintances and he was pleasant and insinuating had gained much favor he carried with him several boxes which contained the confidential correspondence with many friends for there was altogether such a general openness among people that one could not speak or write to a single individual without considering it directed to many one explored one's own heart and that of others and with the indifference of the government towards such a communication the great rapidity of the taxish post the security of the seal and the reasonableness of the postage this moral and literary intercourse soon spread itself around footnote the post managed by the princes of thurn and taxis in different parts of germany an ancestor of this home first directed the post system in tyrol in 1450 and alexander ferdinand von thurn received in 1744 the office of imperial postmaster general as a fief of the empire translator and footnote such correspondences especially with important persons were carefully collected and extracts from them were often read at friendly meetings thus as political discourses had little interest one became pretty well acquainted with the extent of the moral world luxoring's boxes contained many treasures in this sense the letters of one julie blondelli were very much esteemed she was famed as a lady of sense and merit and a friend of rousseau whoever had stood in any relation to this extraordinary man took part in the glory which emanated from him and in his name a silent community had been disseminated far and wide i liked to be present at these readings as i was thus transported to the unknown world and learned to know the real truth of many an event that had just passed all indeed was not valuable and herr von la roche a cheerful man of the world and of business who although a catholic had already in his writings made free with the monks and the priesthood thought that he here saw a fraternity where many a worthless individual supported himself by a connection with persons of importance by which in the end he but not they were admired generally this excellent man withdrew from the company when the boxes were opened even if he listened to some letters now and then a waggish remark was to be expected among other things he once said 
that by this correspondence he was still more convinced of what he had always believed namely that ladies might spare their sealing wax as they need only fasten their letters with pins and might be assured that they would reach their address unopened in the same way he was accustomed to jest with everything that lay out of the sphere of life and activity and in this followed the disposition of his lord and master count stadion minister to the elector of mainz who certainly was not fitted to counterbalance the worldliness and coldness of the boy by a reverence for everything like mysterious foreboding an anecdote respecting the great practical sense of the count may here find a place when he took a liking to the orphan laroche and chose him for a pupil he at once required from the boy the services of a secretary he gave him letters to answer dispatches to prepare which he was then obliged to copy fair oftener to write in cipher to seal and to direct this lasted for many years when the boy had grown up into a youth and really did that which he had hitherto only supposed he was doing the count took him to a large writing-table in which all his letters and packets lay unbroken having been preserved as exercises of the former time another exercise which the count required of his pupil will not find such universal applause le Rouge had been obliged to practise himself in imitating as accurately as possible the handwriting of his lord and master that he might thus relieve him from the trouble of writing himself not only in business but also in love affairs the young man had to take the place of his preceptor the count was passionately attached to a lady of rank and talent if he stopped in her society till late at night his secretary was in the meantime sitting at home and hammering out the most ardent love letters the count chose one of these and sent it that very night to his beloved who was thus necessarily convinced of the inextinguishable fire of her passionate adorer such early experiences were scarcely fitted to give the youth the most exalted notion of written communications about love an irreconcilable hatred of the priesthood had established itself in this man who served two spiritual electors and had probably sprung from the contemplation of the rude tasteless mind-destroying foolery which the monks in germany were accustomed to carry on in many parts and thus hindered and destroyed every sort of cultivation his letters on monasticism caused great attention they were received with great applause by all protestants and many catholics if Herr von la Rouche opposed everything that can be called sensibility and even decidedly avoided the very appearance of it he nevertheless did not conceal a tender paternal affection for his eldest daughter who indeed was nothing else but amiable she was rather short than tall of stature and delicately built her figure was free and graceful her eyes very black while nothing could be conceived purer and more blooming than her complexion she also loved her father and inclined to his sentiments being an active man of business most of his time was consumed in works belonging to his calling and as the guests who stopped at his house were really attracted by his wife and not by him society afforded him but little pleasure at the table he was cheerful and entertaining and at least endeavored to keep his board free from the spice of sensibility whoever knows the views and modes of thought of frau von la Rouche, and by a long life and many writings she has become honorably known to every german may perhaps suspect that a domestic incongruity must have arisen here nothing of the kind she was the most wonderful woman and i know no other to compare to her slenderly and delicately built rather tall than short she had even to her more advanced years managed to preserve a certain elegance both of form and of conduct which pleasantly fluctuated between the conduct of a noble lady and that of one of the citizen class her dress had been the same for several years a neat little cap with wings very well became her small head and delicate face and her brown or gray clothing gave repose and dignity to her presence she spoke well and always knew how to give importance to what she said by an expression of feeling 
her conduct was perfectly the same towards everybody but with all this the greatest peculiarity of her character is not yet expressed it is difficult to designate it she seemed to take interest in everything but really nothing acted upon her she was gentle towards every man and could endure everything without suffering the jests of her husband the tenderness of her friends the sweetness of her children to all this she replied in the same manner and thus she always remained herself without being affected in the world by good and evil or in literature by excellence and weakness to this disposition she owes that independence which she maintains even to an advanced age through many sad nay sorrowful events but not to be unjust I must state that her sons, then children of dazzling beauty, often elicited from her an expression different from that which served her for daily use. Thus I lived for a time in a wonderfully pleasant society until Merck came with his family. Here arose at once new affinities, for while the two ladies approached each other, Merck had come into closer contact with Herr von LaRouche, as a connoisseur of the world and of business as a well-informed and travelled man the boy associated himself with the boys and the daughters of whom the eldest soon particularly attracted me fell to my share it is a very pleasant sensation when a new passion begins to stir in us before the old one is quite extinct thus when the sun is setting one often likes to see the moon rise on the opposite side and one takes delight in the double luster of the two heavenly luminaries there was now no lack of rich entertainment neither in or out of the house we wandered about the spot and ascended aaron breitstein on this side of the river and the Carthaus on the other the city the moselle bridge the ferry which took us over the rhine all gave us the most varied delight the new castle was not yet built we were taken to the place where it was to stand and allowed to see the preparatory sketches nevertheless amid these cheerful circumstances was internally developed that element of unsociableness which both in cultivated and uncultivated circles ordinarily shows its malign effects Merck, at once cold and restless and not long listened to that correspondence before he uttered aloud many waggish notions concerning the things which were the subjects of discourse as well as the persons and their circumstances while he revealed to me in secret the oddest things which really were concealed under them political secrets were never touched on nor indeed anything that could have had a definite connection he only made me attentive to persons who without remarkable talents contrived by certain tact to obtain personal influence and by an acquaintance with many try to make something out of themselves and from this time forwards i had opportunity to observe several men of the sort since such persons usually change their place and as travellers come now here now there they have the advantage of novelty which should neither be envied nor spoiled for this is a mere customary matter which every traveller has often experienced to his benefit and every resident to his detriment be that as it may it is enough that from that time forward we cherished an uneasy nay envious attention to people of the sort who went about on their own account cast anchor in every city and sought to gain an influence at least in some families i have represented a tender and soft specimen of this cooperation in pater bray another of more aptness and bluntness in a carnival play to be hereafter published which bears the title satros or the deified wood devil this i have done if not with fairness at least with good humour however the strange elements of our little society still work quite tolerably upon one another we were partly united by our own manner and style of breeding and partly restrained by the peculiar conduct of our hostess who being but lightly touched by that which passed around her always resigned herself to certain ideal notions and while she understood how to utter them in a friendly and benevolent way contrived to soften everything sharp that might arise in the company 
and to smooth down all that was uneven. Merck had sounded a retreat at the right time, so that the party separated on the best of terms. I went with him and his in a yacht, which was returning up the Rhine towards Mainz, and although this vessel went very slowly by itself, we nevertheless besought the captain not to hurry himself. Thus we enjoyed at leisure the infinitely various objects, which in the most splendid weather seemed to increase in beauty every hour, and both in greatness and agreeableness, even to change anew. And I only wish that while I utter the names Rheinfels and St. Gore, Bacharach, Bingen, Elfeld, and Biberich, every one of my readers may be able to recall these spots to memory. We had sketched industriously, and had thus at least gained a deeper impression of the thousandfold changes of those splendid shores. At the same time, by being so much longer together, by a familiar communication on so many sorts of things, our connection became so much the more intimate that Merck gained a great influence over me, and I, as a good companion, became indispensable to him for a comfortable existence. My eye, sharpened by nature, again turned to the contemplation of art, for which the beautiful Frankfurt collections afforded me the best opportunity, both in paintings and engravings, and I have been much indebted to the kindness of M. M. Etling and Ehrenreich, but especially to the excellent Nathangal. To see nature in art became with me a passion, which, in its highest moments, must have appeared to others, passionate amateurs as they might be, almost like madness. And how could such an inclination be better fostered than by a constant observation of the excellent works of the Netherlanders? that I might make myself practically acquainted with these things, Nothingal gave me a cabinet where I found everything that was requisite for oil painting, and painted after nature some simple subjects of still life, upon one of which a tortoise shell knife handle inlaid with silver so astonished my master, who had first visited me an hour before, that he maintained one of his subordinate artists must have been with me during the time. Had I patiently gone on practicing myself on such objects, catching their light and the peculiarities of their surface, I might have formed a sort of practical skill, and made a way of something higher. I was, however, prevented by the fault of all dilettantes, that of beginning with what is most difficult, and ever wishing to perform the impossible, and I soon involved myself in greater undertakings, in which I stuck fast, but because they were beyond my technical capabilities, and because I could not always maintain pure and operative that loving attention and patient industry by which even the beginner accomplishes something. At the same time, I was once more carried to a higher sphere by finding an opportunity of purchasing some fine plaster casts of antique heads. The Italians who visit the fairs often brought with them good specimens of the kind, and sold them cheap after they had taken molds of them. In this manner I set up for myself a little museum, as I gradually brought together the heads of the Laocoon, his sons, and Niobe's daughters. I also bought miniature copies of the most important works of antiquity from the estate of a deceased friend of art and thus sought once more to revive as much as possible the great impression which I had received at Mannheim. While I now sought to cultivate, foster, and maintain all the talent, taste, or other inclination that might live in me, I applied a good part of the day according to my father's wish in the duties of an advocate, for the practice of which I chanced to find the best opportunity. After the death of my grandfather, my uncle Texter had come into the council and consigned to me the little offices to which I was equal, while the brothers Schlosser did the same. I made myself acquainted with the documents. My father also read them with much pleasure, as by means of his son he again saw himself in an activity of which he had long been deprived. We talked the matters over, and with great facility I then made the necessary statements. We had at hand an excellent copyist on whom one could rely for all legal formalities, 
and this occupation was the more agreeable to me as it brought me closer to my father who being perfectly satisfied with my conduct in this respect readily looked with an eye of indulgence on all my other pursuits in the ardent expectation that i should now soon gather in a harvest of fame as an author because now in every epoch all things are connected together since the ruling views and opinions are ramified in the most various manner so in the science of law these maxims were gradually pursued according to which religion and morals were treated among the attorneys as the younger people and then among the judges as the elder a spirit of humanity was diffused and all vied with each other in being as humane as possible even in legal affairs prisons were improved crimes excused punishments lightened legitimations rendered easy separations and mesalliances encouraged and one of our eminent lawyers gained for himself the highest fame when he contrived by hard fighting to gain for the son of an executioner an entrance into the college of surgeons in vain did guilds and corporations oppose one dam after another was broken through the toleration of the religious parties towards each other was not merely taught but practised and the civil constitution was threatened with a still greater influence when an effort was made to recommend to that good-humoured age with understanding acuteness and power toleration toward the jews those new subjects for legal treatment which lay without the law and tradition and only laid claim to a fair examination to a kindly sympathy required at the same time a more natural and animated style here for us the youngest was opened a cheerful field in which we bustled about with delight and i still recollect that an imperial councillor's agent in a case of the sort sent me a very polite letter of commendation the french pledoys served us for patterns and for stimulation we were thus on the way to becoming better orators than jurists a fact to which george schlosser once called my attention blaming me while doing so i told him that i had read to my clients a controversial paper written with much energy in their favour at which they had shown the greatest satisfaction upon this he replied to me in this case you have shown yourself more an author than an advocate we must never ask how such a writing may please the client but how it may please the judge End of section 12